Hi and welcome back to my channel. The delivery guy just came and dropped off author copies of a new book that I've got coming out and I'm really excited. I'm going to show you here before it's seen anywhere else. It's not live yet. This is a reindeer adult coloring book, which I am super duper excited myself to get a copy and start coloring. I enjoy calming down with a set of really good um, crayons. I'm not crayons. I love crayons too. Crayons are great, but I like really love colored pencils. Lots of them, like packages of 125 or more. And um, I'm very excited to send these out to some reviewers. If you're not on my review list, send me an email. Um, you may or may not get this one, but we have that reindeer one, which goes along with our book for today, which is the reindeer wrangler romance book number one, which, which is called one tough Christmas cookie. And I'm super excited about that. I'm also going to work on another snowed in book. I'm hoping to have it done in time for Christmas this year. Um, the only reason that I wouldn't is if you know, life happened, which seems to happen a lot around here. So anyway, I also have a snowflake, a giant snowflake coloring book, which has all different styles of snowflakes. I'm so in love with these snowflakes. I mean, they're pretty enough that once you get them done, you can cut them out and hang them up and you have like the most beautiful decorations ever. Also along on that lines, I did one on Christmas wreaths, um, different themed wreaths which is so much fun. So, and I just think that this video is probably not doing, oh, look, this is the one I colored. I already colored that one. So since I already got the, I had this one delivered last week. I don't know why they came in separate packages. Sometimes weird packaging things happen. Okay. Reindeer Wrangler Romance. So I have to give credit where credit is due. And the credit for the idea for this story goes to my husband, who is a, um, cowboy himself. And as I was wrapping up the Marrying Miss Kringle series, love it, that I didn't want to say goodbye to this world. I didn't want to say goodbye to the characters. I knew I didn't have a lot of romances for them until the kids grew up. And I wanted to give the kids a hot minute to grow up. <laughs> so um, I decided to do an offshoot, but I was like, I, I'm like, what else am I going to do? I There's it just seems like there wasn't anything else that I could come up with. And I'm usually not at a lack of ideas. I'm usually the kind of person, like, for example, I have a full other 13 book series that's all outlined and just sitting there waiting for me to get time to write it. And then I have a full other five book series that is just sitting there waiting for me to write it. So I'm not usually one that has a hard time coming up with ideas, but because I wanted to include something super Christmassy like Christmas magic. Um, I was like, oh, where do I go? So I was talking to my husband about it one day as we were coming home from a Christmas party, actually. And um, he's like, why don't you do reindeer? Like the reindeer, why don't you come up with something about the reindeer? And um, I looked at him and his Wrangler jeans and I thought, ah, oh, reindeer Wranglers. <laughs> So he gets credit for the idea for this book because it was reindeer for him all the all the way. And where marrying Miss Kringle was five sisters, I decided to do five brothers on the ranch. It has been super duper fun to write these reindeer wranglers because they are tough guys with big hearts. I mean, you take these guys and give them a reindeer and they are just softies. I mean, they have to be tough because they're an a reindeer is a large animal and you have to be strong and and um, somewhat firm with them, but also they just have this big giant Christmas heart. And so, anywho, One Tough Christmas Cookie is the first book in this series. And um, the main character, the main Wrangler character is named Caleb. Caleb is the oldest of the five boys, including the oldest of a set of twins. So he is one older brother on top of another older brother. So he has a lot of older brotherness. <laughs> and um, Faith is the name of our female main character. Faith is also the daughter of the Reindeer Wrangler Ranch veterinarian. So there are few people who actually know the reindeer can fly. And the veterinarian is one of them, but he never told his own family. And as Faith grew up and, and his there was a divorce between him and his wife, 
and she went with her mom and just this distance came between them and um she gets a call that her dad is in the hospital and she has to go kind of take care of him because it was bad it was about a heart attack and so she reluctantly goes she loves her dad but there's a space there that's kind of hard to overcome and that will work into the book and there's some you'll get to see all of that um family dynamic play out so <laughs> this is like the longest intro i've ever done <laughs> for a book <laughs> sorry if i'm keeping you from the reindeer but um you have to know before you go into this book that the reindeer are characters they each have personalities they are individuals and um they even have conversations with some of the reindeer, not like you would think. It's mostly like a body language and then the wrangler interpret the body language, um, which is a challenge at times to write, but it's also not. Like they are super fun. So anyway, I'm gonna let you get into this book and meet Faith and Caleb and all of the other reindeer wrangler and the reindeer on the ranch. And I hope this just sparks your Christmas spirit and that you have a great time on the ranch. And I'll see you on the flip side. One Tough Christmas Cookie A Reindeer Wrangler Ranch Christmas Romance Book Written by Lucy McConnell Chapter 1 Faith Saintsbury fished a Santa hat-shaped dog biscuit out of the jar and handed it to her patient. She told the owner, if you put the cream on it every morning and night, her rash should clear up within a couple of days. She peeled off her plastic gloves and dropped them through the garbage hole in the counter. Little Miss Muffin's nails scraped against the door, peeling off the paint, as she tried to escape the exam room. I'm so sorry. Mavis, the dog's owner, scooped her up into her arms and hugged her close. Faith tried not to cringe as Mavis buried her face in the fur and covered the animal in kisses, since she just explained that the rash that made little Miss Muffin whine and scratch was caused by a communicable fungus. Gross. No problem. Faith opened the door for both of them. As you can see, that happens a lot. She smiled as she pointed to the bottom half of the door, which was covered in scratch marks. Every January, she and her partner, Jonathan, had an office makeover weekend and touched things up. But it was the 5th of December, and their hard work a year before had long since been scratched away. Jonathan had other ideas for the office, big ones that meant money and time. She just didn't have it in her to tackle his projects, and she had put him off until after the holidays. Lately, things around the Friendly Pets Veterinary Clinic were strained. Faith did her best to ignore the chill in the air that had nothing to do with winter and everything to do with a grumpy partner pouting because he didn't get his way. Thank goodness she'd never dated him. Working with a sulking male was hard enough. Being married to one would be downright miserable. We love seeing Miss Muffin. She smiled at the pup and waved to the owner as Mavis stopped at the desk to pay for the cream. Dr. Saintsbury called Jen, the receptionist. Faith paused in shutting the door and leaned out. Yes? Jen's panicked voice had her on alert. They were classified as a pet hospital with emergency services, which meant she tended some horrifically damaged animals. Adrenaline coursed through her veins, turning on all the parts of her brain that handled crises and shutting off the parts that dealt with billing and other mundane office tasks. She'd be happy if she never had to chart again. Jen pointed at the desk phone. There's a call for you, it's urgent. I'll take it in the back. She shut the door and jogged to the counter on the other side of the exam rooms. Picking up the receiver, she hit the blinking number two button. This is Dr. Saintsbury, how can I help? Dr. Saintsbury, this is Dr. Calvin from Sleigh Bell County Emergency. 
Faith felt blindly for the barstool somewhere behind her. Her legs fell out from under her with the mention of the town where she'd been born and where she had few happy memories. Why yes. Your father has had a massive heart attack. He's stable at the moment, but... It was everything that wasn't said after the but that had her gripping the front of her scrubs in her free hand. She wasn't that close to her dad, at all. Didn't plan to send him a Christmas card. Not that she sent anyone a Christmas cards. Scrooge had it right, as far as she was concerned. Why are you calling me? Well, Dr. Calvin seemed taken aback by her question. Because he asked me to. And quite frankly, ma'am, he might not make it through tomorrow. You're his only family. Like she needed that reminder. She leaned over, the air knocked right out of her. The thing was, even though they weren't close, he was her dad. Which meant that she should be there if he died. A hundred times that he should have been there for her, and wasn't, splashed through her head like roadside slush on the highway, cold and dirty. She could hang up the phone and go back to work and no one would fault her, not even God. She had every right to be angry and vindictive. Okay, maybe not vindictive, but at the very least furious. Was this some kind of deathbed repentance for the old man? Had facing the grave scared him into wanting to be a parent? Worst of all, the little girl inside of her who longed for daddy to play tea party wanted to run to him. She wanted to throw her arms around his neck and sing the silly Santa songs he used to sing her to sleep with, before the divorce. She was a successful veterinarian in a thriving office. She didn't need her daddy's approval nor his love at this stage in her life. The fact that this phone call proved otherwise made her edgy. It's Christmas, said the doctor, his tone laced with disapproval. That's got nothing to do with it. She put her hand over her mouth. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have snapped at you. Reality clicked in. There might only be a few hours of her life where she still had a father. This was no time to drag out the old complaint list. If she wanted to live a regret-free life, it meant being there for dad. I'm on my way. It's a few hours by car. That's fine. Ask for me when you get here. If I'm not in surgery, I'll meet you to explain everything. Thank you. She said, goodbye, and hung up the phone, staring at it. Her dad was dying. The knowledge was so strange, like putting on a brand new bra. You knew it should fit, but figuring out how to adjust it was a nightmare. There was no adjusting this moment, though. She just had to take the next day as it came, which was hard, cold, and unfair. If we reset the leg, she should be fine. Jonathan handed an iPad to Betty, one of the vet techs, and folded his arms. What's got you thinking so deep, he asked Faith with a little bite. He'd gotten into a contemptible tone lately. Faith rubbed her forehead, tired of being spoken to like she was one cat treat short. My dad, her voice cracked on the title. Had a heart attack. Jeez. Jonathan put a hand to her shoulder to steady her as she weaved on the stool. Is he going to be okay? He managed to ask that without making it sound like she was an idiot. She couldn't get her eyes to focus as she stared at the V in his dark blue scrubs. Jonathan was a great guy when he wasn't acting like the king of the castle, but he wasn't her guy. They'd figured out their brother-slash-sister relationship in vet school, and Faith adored his wife. But there were times when she wished she had someone to lean on when she lost a patient or the walls echoed her loneliness. I don't think so. Jonathan gave her a shake, just
just hard enough that she came out of the shock and focused on his face. Can you drive? he asked. Right. She was supposed to go to the hospital. There were things to do. She needed to pack. Her house was twenty minutes the other way. She'd just have to go without clothing. That was what she needed to do, get on the road. She stood up, causing Jonathan's arms to fall away, and opened the cupboard where she'd stored her purse that morning. I'll be fine. Do you want Sarah to go with you? Thanks for offering your wife, she said sarcastically. But I'll be all right. Besides, facing her father was something she wanted to do on her own. Spectators would cause her to clam up and hold things inside. If this really was the end of the road for him, she had a lot to say, and a lot of questions. She only hoped she got there in time to ask them. Chapter 2 Snowflake, get down here. Caleb stared up at the reindeer walking across the roof of the barn. This was the third time she'd gotten out of her stall in the last week. He'd have to padlock the thing to keep her inside. Raising flying reindeer for Santa was a dream job, until you learned that some reindeer loved to make trouble. He held out a bucket of oats and shook it, making the oats rustle. Snowflake's ears perked up, and she took two leaps before flipping in midair and landing in front of him. Caleb chuckled. Show off. She shook her antlers like a beautiful woman in a shampoo commercial shaking out her hair before lowering her head to inspect the oats. Caleb slipped the harness over her nose and then around her neck. Come on. He picked up the bucket. You can finish these inside. Snowflake looked longingly at the reindeer herd in the west pasture. I can't leave you out there. He whispered to her, reindeer aren't supposed to fly. She scowled, making him laugh. His family had the only permit in the United States to raise, breed, and care for the endangered reindeer species. All 731 of the animals lived on their ranch in North Dakota. 731 reindeer, and only six of them could fly. As the official supplier of reindeer to the North Pole for generations, the Nicola's family felt a sacred obligation to the animals and their well-being. Keeping the flyers indoors was as much for their protection as it was to protect Santa. In order for the flyers to get their exercise and train to pull the big sleigh one day, they were taken to the indoor arena for reindeer games. Snowflake had already had her workout, but she enjoyed being free. The sound of sleigh bells came from overhead. Caleb broke into a grin. That noise meant one thing, a Kringle, or two, had come to visit Reindeer Wrangler Ranch. Visits from the famous, though reclusive Christmas family in December were rare. Five days into December usually meant that the Kringles were tinsel deep in Christmas preparations. Something was either very right or catastrophically wrong. He picked up his pace, dumping the oats in Snowflake's pen and sliding the lock on her stall door. He made it out of the barn just in time to see single reindeer with two riders tumble into a snowbank. Dunder, he cried, recognizing the old guy by his broad shoulders and heavy antlers. His landing was off balance and out of sync. In other words, entirely unlike the Dunder who'd become a legend on the ranch before taking his place in Santa's harness. As he drew closer Caleb saw Stella Kringle wrapped around a guy he'd never seen before. Not shocked in the least, this was Stella, after all, he studied Dunder. Oh no. The reindeer breathed heavily, his side rising and falling fast as he lay there, his legs stretched out and his head down. Dunder was an amazing specimen of a reindeer and strong as an ox. If he lay down after a flight, it was bad news. Caleb walked over and tapped the guy flirting with Stella on the shoulder. 
If you two are done making out in my snowbank, I'd like to take a look at your reindeer. He'd need help and had a lot of questions. Stella froze as if she'd been caught by the man in red himself. Caleb. H. Hey. Funny things happened inside of him right then. A half a cup of jealousy sloshed about. He and Stella had dated when he was in high school. A long time ago, to be sure, but there was always a part of him that wondered if they were meant to be together. By the way she gazed adoringly at her companion, he didn't stand a chance of ever winning a sleigh ride to the North Pole. Pity. The second emotion that popped up was relief. Stella was a handful on her good days. The idea of being married to her was exhausting. More power to this guy if he could keep up with her. More than anxious to take care of Dunder, he grabbed the back of the guy's coat and hauled him to his feet. The guy brushed himself off and gave Caleb the once-over. Caleb did the same. They were about the same height and build. The stranger had a couple days beard and an easygoing feel about him. Except that he seemed confused and guarded in the unfamiliar situation. That was understandable. Riding a flying reindeer wasn't an everyday occurrence, for some people. Stella threw a hug his direction, and Caleb picked her up, drawing in her lemon and chocolate scent. Kringles were magical, and being near one of Santa's daughters could put Scrooge in a good mood. It's good to see you again, she said. You too, Sugar Bee. Caleb wrapped her up snug as a gift on Christmas Eve. Some of his best childhood memories and pranks involved this woman and her four magical sisters. Being part of the Christmas legend of Santa Claus had brought so much goodness into his life. The Kringles were the best kind of people, and he was grateful to call them all friends. Of course, knowing Santa's family wasn't something he could brag about at the local diner on a Saturday morning as the old-timers traded stories. You wanted to look at Dunder, the stranger ground out as he glared at the two of them hugging away. Touchy, touchy. The man's obvious discomfort wouldn't go over well with Caleb's brothers. They'd latch on to his insecurities and tease until he threw a punch or stormed off. Stella blinked and came to herself. Shoving off Caleb's broad shoulders, she hurried over to the hurt reindeer. We can't figure out what's wrong. He barely made it here. I saw the landing. Caleb took off his leather work gloves and palpitated Dunder's belly. Where did you learn to fly like that? He tossed a cocky smile over his shoulder at Stella. They rarely rode the reindeer, because carrying a passenger threw off their aerodynamics. That wasn't to say it couldn't be done, as Stella had proven today. But the animals were better suited to pull sleighs than give joyrides. Although if Stella was flying the sleigh, then the ride could be compared to a roller coaster. Stella hugged herself in that way women did when they were pleased. You know where. He'd been the one to teach her, back when she was a skinny little thing with an attitude. Yeah, but that was a long time ago. She flipped her hair. Some of us still got it. Sure you do. Caleb continued his exam, enjoying the way he got under her boyfriend's skin so easily. He tipped his head toward the guy. He looked as terrified as a prairie dog in a hayfield on seven outing day. She keep you on your toes, he asked. He nodded curtly. More like throws me on my behind. Caleb tipped his head back and laughed. This guy was all right. That's Stella. He winked at Stella, and she made a kissing noise back at him. A sleigh landed with a flurry of jingle bells and snow flying, grabbing Caleb's attention. Robin, the oldest Kringle daughter, bounded out of the sleigh, followed by two dark-haired little girls who captured the stranger's hands. They couldn't be his daughters, 
and yet there was a whole lot of daddy worship in their eyes. Good on him. Can he help him? asked the smaller of the two. Caleb jumped in to answer, intent on easing the worry on her sweet face. It was Christmas, she should be making snow angels and eating Christmas cookies not worrying over a sick reindeer. And Dunder was as sick as he'd ever seen a reindeer. His own worry grew by the second, and he did his best to tamp it down in front of the kids. You bet I can. I'm the best reindeer wrangler around. He likes to think so, called his brother as he strode out from the house. Caleb rolled his eyes. Trust his twin to steal the glory. Still, he was glad for the help. Dunder's breathing hadn't slowed. They needed to get his heart rate down and see if he could drink, or at the very least eat some fresh snow. Jack. Stella ran and threw her arms around Caleb's carbon copy. Jack twirled her around just like he had, both of them laughing. What have you brought us this time, princess? He set her down, and Stella swatted at him. Princess. I thought I told you never to call me that. As you wish. Stop. Stella hit him again, laughing. Caleb pulled Dunder's eyelid up and was met with an angry red glare. Okay, big fella, I know you don't like me poking at you, but I'm here to help. He put his hand near Dunder's nose. Come on, you remember me. Dunder huffed as if saying, of course I remember you, idiot. Caleb rubbed between his eyes. You're still grumpy, huh? I thought living at the North Pole would have sweetened you up. Dunder moaned in protest. Good. Caleb moved to scratch under his jaw, and Dunder relaxed. Robin approached, and Caleb leaned back on his heels, taking her in. She still had that oldest sister vibe going, but her hair was cut different, more modern, and she wore clothes that hugged her curves. He'd bet her little sister Frost had gotten hold of her for a makeover. Knowing Robin was all business, he jumped in with his laundry list of questions. What's he been eating lately? How many hours is he flying a day? What's his sleep habits like? Robin rubbed her lips together. I'm going to call the stables and see if we can get Selora on the line. She'll know more about his eating habits than I do. Caleb lifted his felt hat and rubbed his hair. K. Santa's head stable elf would have all the info he needed. I just don't know what to do for him except make him comfortable. If we could find out if there was a trigger, something he ate that didn't agree with his stomach, I could help him better. Robin nodded as she dialed the North Pole. The rest of Caleb's family arrived. The sound of a sleigh drew a crowd around this ranch. They had visitors, but not many who knew about the reindeer. It was great to be able to just be chill and talk about flying mammals as if it were all normal. Caleb leaned his head on Dunder's chest and listened to his lungs. They sounded clear to him. He lifted a couple fingers to the strangers Robin had brought in her sleigh when Stella said his name in introduction. Besides Robin and the two girls, Robin's husband and her brother-in-law had come along for the trip. Mom was all over the two little girls. Caleb couldn't blame her, they were as sweet as gumdrops. Which was why he made a motion for his mom to get them out of here. They needed to move Dunder into the barn and out of the cold. Which was funny, considering Dunder's home was the North Pole, but he kept blinking at the glaring sun. Mom took the girls inside, telling everyone else to stay and help. She'd fill the kids with cookies and Santa stories and get her grandma fix for a while. Can you get a blanket big enough to hold a reindeer out of that thing? Caleb nodded to the magical purse hanging over Robin's shoulder. Every Kringle girl had one, and they were pretty handy. Sure. 
she reached inside and pulled out a thick red and black plaid blanket. He grabbed one end and they laid it on the snow next to Dunder, bunching it up so when they rolled him over, he would be all the way on the fabric. Yeah, the reindeer was going to love that one. What do you think? asked Robin quietly as a mini snowball fight broke out between Stella and her boyfriend. Caleb would be upset that they were horsing around while he was doing all the work, except Stella was always the one who lightened up the situation. Not because she didn't understand how serious it was, but because she loved those involved and hated to see people sad. Jack took one look at what Caleb and Robin were doing and broke into a jog toward the barn. Robin looked over at him, her eyebrows lifted. He went to get the sled, Caleb informed her. Twin mind meld, I almost forgot. She dug out some snow by Dunder's shoulder and shoved the blanket under there. Caleb wished he had the Kringle anti-cold gene, because his hands were numb. Jack emerged from the barn, pulling the transport sleigh. It had silver runners and a flat top sanded smooth and painted bright red. They didn't have to use it often, but when an animal was down, it was a huge help. He and Jack had tried to use it for sledding once, and they'd about lost their lives. It was too much sled for the two of them at fifteen. Heck, it was probably too much for them today. At the sled's arrival, everyone gathered round to help. Turning a reindeer over wasn't an easy task, but they managed it with only a low growl from Dunder. It was almost like he'd given up on being angry, which was the worst sign for a curmudgeon like him. Caleb stepped back and let Jack take charge of getting the sleigh moving. He grabbed his phone out of the inside of his coat and called Doc, the vet. His call went to voicemail. He hung up and tried again. Doc was usually on top of things, especially out here. He was the only one in Sleigh Bell Country who had seen a reindeer fly and not thought he was crazy. That had been over thirty years ago, and he'd never missed a chance to come to the ranch since. Caleb left a message. He didn't have to think hard about his next step. If anyone was going to help Dunder, it would be the vet. He had skills, medicines, and machines for diagnosis. What can I do? Chris, Stella's boyfriend, asked, seeming at a loss as to how to make things better. Caleb shook his head. I can't get a hold of Dr. Sainsbury. He kicked a pile of snow. I'm going into town to find him. Keep calling, Jack called over his shoulder. He may have gotten your message and be on the way. Service can be spotty. Like I don't know that, Caleb grumbled as he stormed toward the house. A word kept coming to mind, acidosis. The illness was terminal for reindeer. Even getting the vet here wouldn't stop it. But he couldn't wait around to see if things got better. He had to act. He stormed through the house to grab his truck keys. Mom was at the table, coloring with the girls. She was having as much fun as they were bringing princesses and elves to life with crayons. Cookie crumbs abounded, and a plate of homemade Oreos sat in the middle of the table. He snatched one, in case he didn't have time for lunch. I'm going to look for document. We're going to keep on coloring and make some dinner in a bit. Mom's smile was big and wide and set in place like it had been cut with a cookie cutter. She was worried about Dunder but didn't want the girls to know. If he gets here before I find him, call me. Caleb shut the door quickly, not wanting to cast a cool breeze or feeling over the cozy gathering. One of these days, his own kids would color at that table with their grandma. He couldn't think about the future right now, though. Dunder was counting on him, and he wasn't going to let the reindeer down. He'd scour the county for Doc and not come home without him. Chapter 3 Some people had issues with hospitals, 
but Faith wasn't one of them. The smell of antiseptic and that weird green bean tinge from the food trays was par for the course. Frankly, it smelled like her the elementary school cafeteria where Mrs. Brinhall had taught her and a handful of other low-income sixth graders how to serve up a lot of food, fast. Working in the lunchroom wasn't a popular thing to do, but she'd gotten all the leftover peanut butter bars she could eat. Did they even serve those anymore? It would be a darn shame if they didn't. She'd bet the hospital had something like that on the menu. The receptionist's desk was chest-high and covered in aged pink formica that screamed for a makeover. Cream walls were covered with children's artwork in gold frames, popular in the 1980s. Small-town hospitals were way down on the list for cosmetic upgrades. Hopefully, the medical equipment was newer than the decorations. The man working the phones had a Mr. Rogers vibe going. His high forehead was covered in wrinkles and disappointment, as if everyone who asked a question was an idiot. Faith wasn't one to be deterred by a bad mood, she worked with pit bulls, after all. This guy couldn't be that bad. Tucking a stray piece of hair behind her ear, she leaned her hands against the edge of the counter and said, Hi, I was told to ask for Dr. Calvin when I got here. He's expecting me. With a huff and an eye roll, Grumpy Rogers picked up the phone and pressed a couple buttons. Cheryl, there's a lady at the front desk asking for Dr. Calvin. He covered the receiver and looked over his glasses at her. Name? Faith Saintsbury. He dropped her gaze and glanced down at the table, repeating her name for the nurse in a slow, deliberate way. The nurse probably wanted to strangle him on an hourly basis. How did this guy get to be the face of the hospital? Either the town was too small to find a replacement, or someone in HR had lost a poker game. He hummed in response to whatever Cheryl said a couple times and then hung up. You can go back to the nurse's station. They're prepping the patient for surgery now, so you need to hurry. He snapped his fingers and pointed down the right hallway. She found herself breaking into a jog at his command before realizing that he wasn't in charge of her. Slowing to a fast walk, she made it to the nurse's station, where Cheryl, according to her name tag, motioned toward an open door. He's in there, honey. Her voice was deep and smooth and just the kind of tone you wanted when coming out of surgery or coming up to breathe after bad news. Her salt and pepper hair was pulled back into a low bun, and her brown eyes, peering over half-moon glasses, were full of sympathy. Thanks, Faith threw over her shoulder before coming up short in the doorway. The man she called, Dad, didn't look at all like himself. How long had it been since she'd seen him? It had been ages, according to the lines on his face and the gray tint to his skin. Gray, like the color of a headstone. She shook herself as a David Marley warning shivered over her skin. Hurrying into the room, she tried to figure out where she could stand that she would be out of the way of the nurses who were changing out his four bag and unhooking monitors. Everything was happening so fast, it felt like the room spun around here. Any second, they'd will the whole bed away and her chance at closure would disappear. Seeing a break in activity, she rushed forward. Dad! She leaned over the flatbed, noting the white sheet that lay across his still body like a shroud. She needed to rein in her morbid thoughts. He wasn't dead, not yet, anyway. But the knowledge that this could be the last time she laid eyes on the man who taught her how to set a broken wing whooshed through her entire body. Was it possible for a person's spirit to leave while their heart still beat? Her eyes darted to the monitor that beeped sporadically. She suddenly wished she'd watched the documentary on near-death experiences when it had popped up on her Netflix feed last week. Can you hear me? 
She placed her hand on his arm, shocked at how cold he felt. Especially since she hadn't worn gloves and her hands were cold. His eyes fluttered open at the sound of her voice, as if she'd called him back from a deep sleep, maybe the deepest. His work-worn hand groped for something to hold on to. Her hands weren't much better than his, covered in calluses, the nails trimmed short. Veterinary practice didn't lend itself to manicures and feminine wiles. Faith, he graveled out. His voice had always been deep, but her name sounded like it was dragged behind his old green pickup on a dirt road. Yeah, Dad? She leaned in, hopeful and expectant that his last words would be healing, comforting, and an apology for the years he'd neglected his family. She could forgive him if he finally saw the light, if he finally noticed the prized woman she'd become despite not having his influence in her life. This was the moment that all the pain could be washed from their history and she would be able to look back and only see the good. Protect the reindeer, he said, moistening his parched and cracked lips. What? She moved closer still, sure she had misheard. Are you kidding me right now? The man was pounding on death's door, and he asked her protect the very animals she'd resented her whole life. If it had come down to going to Faith's preschool Christmas show or a vet check on a reindeer, he'd pick the reindeer. When her mom had handed him the ultimatum, us or the reindeer, he'd chosen the reindeer. And now, after Faith rushed to his bedside, leaving her own thriving vet practice in a lurch and her partner to cover for her during Christmas, with only the clothing on her back and the credit card in her purse, his thoughts were of the reindeer. It's important. Promise me. He wheezed as if every word cost him greatly. What he didn't understand, what he never understood, was what those darn hooved beasts had cost her. A nurse with bright red hair put her hand on Faith's shoulder and spoke calmly. We're going to take him in now, sweetie. Say what you need to say. Faith glanced up to meet her warm chocolate eyes and nodded. So many words filled her mind. Angry ones that had bite and venom. Words that would sting him for every wrong he'd ever done her and every loss she'd ever felt because of his obsession with the stupid reindeer. She took in the old man lying naked under a thin sheet, his hand shaking in hers. Tubes went from his arms and nose into who knew what machine or bag of fluids. His life hung in the balance, and she couldn't let their possible last moments together be tainted with the past. Did that make her a sucker? Mom would think so. Mom would tell her to leave him there. Let him ask the reindeer for help, see if they were there for him in his dying moments. But she wasn't her mother. I promise, Dad. She kissed his forehead and then stood and folded her arms as the staff kicked the release on the wheels and rolled him out of the room. Tears, hot and stingy, blurred her vision. She went into that place where the mind and the body numbed to protect her, and she folded her arms over her chest to hold herself together. Breathing was not an option. Time stood still, or rushed forward. She had no idea. It was like this moment in her journey was being dog-eared and underlined and she had to pay attention. A tall, broad form in a cowboy hat filled the doorway. She stared at it for a moment, willing her eyes and her brain to focus. Perhaps she'd conjured up this blurry vision, or maybe it was an angel who'd arrived thirty seconds too late to escort her dad to the pearly gates. If dad had a guardian angel, he would be a cowboy. Rubbing the heels of her hands into her eyes, she blinked away the moisture and swiped at her cheeks trying to pull herself together. Her vision cleared, and she stared dumbfounded at the manly specimen before her. This was no angel, this was a man. The kind of man they used for truck commercials, rugged and handsome with a swagger to boot. 
She suddenly needed a tall drink of water and speech lessons. You Doc Sainsbury's kid, he asked, whipping his black felt hat off and holding it over his heart like some actor in an old western. Only there was no Hollywood in his weathered winter boots and worn jeans. This guy was the real deal, a straight-shooting rancher in a soft flannel shirt and a tan Carhartt coat with a pair of leatherwork gloves peeking out of his back pocket. He had the attitude of a rancher too, calling her a kid. He couldn't be much older than her, and she was twenty-seven with her own practice and a nice condo, thank you very much. Indignation fueled her ability to speak again, and she asked, Who are you? I'm Caleb Nicholas, miss. We've got an emergency on the ranch. A reindeer's down. Can you come take a look at him? He threw his thumb over his shoulder and glanced behind him as if his ranch were just there. A reindeer? Couldn't they at least let her father die in peace? Or live? Hopefully live. The way he struggled to breathe had shot an arrow right through her hope. She'd never understood why her father cared so much about one type of animal and this specific herd in particular. They were on the endangered species list, but the Nicola's family was granted the special charter to protect the herd, not Dad. Caleb, did you say? she asked as if she hadn't paid attention to his name. Yes, ma'am. His drawl was kind of cute. His white blonde hair and beard were a shock compared to his chiseled features and navy blue eyes. Like a Viking and an angel had a baby. Too bad he was part of the reindeer ranch. For the amounts of attraction blowing through her body, they could have had something. But she wasn't going to date a man as crazy as her father. Mom had drilled into her that she should never come second in her husband's life and these reindeer people were fanatics. Despite the promise she'd made to her father, she said, my dad is going in for emergency surgery. I can't leave. She couldn't. No matter what dad's priorities were, hers would always be family first. If he made it through, he could yell at her for not running off to take care of a sick reindeer. Which was a moment she suddenly found herself looking forward to. Caleb ran his hand through his blonde hair, making it stand up on end. She'd never seen an adult with hair that light, and she wondered if it ran in the family. Genetics were her undergrad specialty. I understand, he hedged. If it was my dad, I wouldn't want to leave either. It's just, Dunder's older. He's not FL, he cut off quickly and shook his head. He's lost strength. We can't afford to lose him. Her heartstrings played a sad melody at the thought of an animal suffering, even if it was a reindeer. But she needed to be close in case Dr. Calvin came out with an update or questions or, gulp for permission to pull the plug. Dr. Calvin, she'd just realized, hadn't made it to the room to talk to her like he'd said he would. Probably because he was scrubbing up for surgery so he could fix Dad's heart. What if Dad came out of surgery and she wasn't here? He'd feel alone and lost, confused and maybe even scared. I'm sorry. Really? but I have to stay. He dropped his chin to his impressive chest and took a breath. He'd go now. Which was for the best. At some point in the next couple hours, she was going to get tired and then emotional, and then she'd fall to pieces over what was and what could have been and what might never be. She didn't need an audience to the crazy show. When Caleb lifted his gaze, his eyes blazed blue, like the hottest part of a flame. Their intensity sucked the oxygen right out of the room, and she gasped. Pushing his hat on his head, he strode over to the chair under the window, sat down, and kicked his long legs out in front of him. What are you doing? she asked in a panic. 
Like I said, we need Dunder. Which means we need a vet. I'm not leaving here. If you won't come, I'll wait for document. She sputtered. Of all the stubborn and ridiculous statements. He's having heart surgery. She threw her arm toward the door. He won't be going outside for weeks. He laced his fingers together over his stomach and settled in. Then I guess I'm going to have to settle for you. She walked over and poked him in the chest. He smelled of dried grass and cologne, like he'd just finished feeding the animals and still smelled clean. Mmm, up close, there was a hint of honey in his beard. She clenched her teeth. Let's get one thing straight. No one's ever settled for me. I'm darn good at what I do, and there's not a vet in the state that can match me for large animal diagnoses. Not even her dad. While he'd been knee-deep in reindeer poop, she'd broadened her practice and had quite the referral list. Caleb grabbed her hand to keep her from poking him again. She gasped as an electrical jolt went through her system. Touching him wasn't the smartest idea. I'm not leaving without you, he growled. She yanked her hand free. Get comfortable, then. Because I'm not leaving until I know Dad's out of the woods. Fine. He pulled his hat down over his eyes and went still. As if anyone could fall asleep that fast. Fine. She huffed, folded her arms, and landed in the seat next to him. A second later, she grabbed the armrests and scooted, putting a good twelve inches between them. Better. She glanced over to make sure he couldn't see her from under his hat and then fell against the seat, letting it hold her up because her strength was gone. She hadn't thought this night could get any worse, but having to share the room with a grumpy, though easy on the eyes cowboy tipped the scales. With a sigh, she pulled out her phone and scrolled through the books on her Kindle app. Nothing grabbed her attention enough to keep her from thinking about the past. What she did remember of her life before the divorce was sparse but good. It wasn't like her parents had argued a lot. It was more like things had been always quiet and sometimes lonely. She used to sit on the couch and stare out the front window, hoping to see Dad's headlights before Mom would sigh heavily and scoop her into her arms to tuck her in bed. Dad told bedtime stories about magical reindeer, Santa, and elves while Mom would kiss her forehead and then lock herself in her room. One night Faith heard her crying. She never got out of bed again. Restless and needing answers, she finally put her phone down and kicked Caleb's boots. What's so special about these reindeer, anyway? He used one finger to push his hat up. Considering her, he asked, Doc ever tell you about them? All the bleeping time. She huffed. I probably know more about them than you do. Dad had been over the moon when she'd gone into veterinary school, probably thinking she would join him in Slaybell country. He'd even paid the hefty tuition for her and kept her out of student loan debt. She didn't mind taking his money, though she suspected it was his way of easing his own guilt for not being the father she needed. He'd called once a month while she'd been in school to talk about the herd and ask her opinion on their care. He'd always wanted to know what they taught her, the latest findings and studies, bringing the conversation back to the reindeer before their time was up. If he was upset that she didn't join his practice, he'd never said so. Another point in his favor. The possible end-of-life situation started a tally sheet in her head. Caleb narrowed his eyes. If he told you the important stuff, then you wouldn't have to ask that question. Whatever. She shoved to her feet, looking for distance. That breakdown was coming on, and she needed to not be here when it happened. 
I'm going to get something to help me stay awake. Bye. She left before he could follow her to the cafeteria. After stopping at the nurse's station to make sure they had her cell number if they needed to call, she headed for the elevator. She pulled up the digital files dad kept on the reindeer herd. He'd given her access years ago and never cut her off. It could be that he'd just forgotten or that he was holding out hope. She wouldn't know unless he made it through surgery. She walked as she scanned, searching for a file named Dunder. There were thousands of files, each with a name. For duplicate names, the year of birth was listed as well. Rudolph was popular, as were Dancer and Prancer. Geez, these guys loved their Santa references. There. Dunder. Means, thunder. Okay. She scanned the breeding info, this guy was a top bull, and his birth date. Her eyes bugged out. He was old. Especially for a reindeer. Though this particular breed lived longer than others. She did a quick search and found that he was a father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. To lose a patriarch of the herd was bad news in so many ways. Animals often mourned the passing of one of their own. Guilt tugged at her heartstrings. She wasn't the type to turn away an animal in need, even a reindeer. She dragged herself back to the room and kicked Caleb's boots again. He grunted as if she'd woken him up. What? Is he eating? she demanded. He looked up at her, a small crease between his eyebrows. What? She barely held back her frustration. Her emotions ran right under the surface after seeing her dad and then having a lifetime of issues thrown in her face. Dunder. Is he eating? She ground out. Caleb frowned. No. Drinking? Her tone was derogatory at best and completely ticked off in any other circumstances. Yeah, why? She drew a breath, grateful that she could offer some hope and had bought time before she had to rush out to the ranch. Animals fast when they're in pain, but if they drink, it's a good sign that they aren't terminal. The crease disappeared, and his chest relaxed. She really needed to stop noticing his chest. He nodded. I'll send word back to my family. He pulled out his phone. If he was drinking, her brain ran through a list of possible issues, ticking off some and holding on to others until she could examine the animal. Even if Dunder was drinking, he could be in grave danger. She tucked her arms around herself. If she didn't treat him soon, the non-fatal could become fatal. And she'd promised Dad she would look out for the herd. Blast it all, why did he have to ask her that right before Caleb showed up? I'll go with you as soon as Dad's out of surgery. I don't know how long it's going to take. He nodded again. I'd be much obliged. She held up a finger. One visit, you got that? I'm not like Dad, I'm busy, and I have a thriving practice in Grafton. She wouldn't give the ranch, or Caleb's warm eyes, a chance to suck her in. I understand. With that, he lowered his hat and went back typing. She shrugged. Cowboys. The most infuriating breed of man she'd ever met. Just as she reached the doorway Caleb called out, Doc bragged about you, a lot. That's how I knew you were a vet. He. He paused and seemed to gather his thoughts. He loves you. She looked over her shoulder. That's news to me. Caleb smirked. He didn't mention how pretty you were, though. Her cheeks heated and she turned forward, 
talking to the hallway instead of allowing him to see the effect he had on her. Liking this cowboy wasn't an option, which meant that flirting back wasn't either. I haven't seen him in years. Why are you here now? His voice was warm and deep, like the best cup of hot chocolate on a cold day. Besides the obvious? She shrugged, trying to come up with a reason for driving three-plus hours in the dark during December. It's Christmas, she replied. Dad loves the season. Her reason fell flat in her ears. What did Christmas have to do with anything? Christmas is magic, Caleb added. There's no such thing as Christmas magic, she said before walking away. Childhood fantasies and wishes were better left alone. She'd done without them for most of her life, and she didn't need them now. Besides, she was only here to make sure Dad survived. If he did, then she'd head back to Grafton. If he didn't, she turned and ducked into a bathroom, ready for the tears to fall. She barely had time to lock the door before her cheeks flooded. How could she love a man who'd let her go and hate him at the same time? Family was complicated. She swallowed against the huge lump in her throat only to have another one build right behind it. Some Christmas. If she could skip the whole thing, she would. Chapter 4 Caleb waited until Faith was in the elevator before pushing his hat up and calling home. She was as prickly as a pear and as scroogey as, well, Scrooge. Her apartment or house or whatever probably didn't have a single ornament, garland, or wreath. He gave a sudden shiver at the thought. Still, she was upset by what had happened to her dad, shaken deeper than she let on. Her hands trembled, and she swallowed often enough that he could see the internal fight to hold it all together. She didn't have to, not for his sake. He wished he could give her some privacy, but Dunder was counting on him to bring back help. Besides, she shouldn't be alone right now. Doc didn't have a lot of family. He'd been an only child, and his parents were long gone on to their eternal glory. Caleb's family had taken him in a long time ago, probably when he'd gotten divorced. The short conversation with Faith yielded puzzle pieces, if he could get her to talk some more, he might be able to put the whole thing together. Dad answered on the first ring. Merry Christmas. Caleb usually responded with a Merry Christmas of his own, even in August, since it was their family's standard phone greeting. But he didn't know how long Faith would be gone, and he needed to talk freely. How's Dunder? The kids got him moved into the barn. He's resting in a stall. Stella won't leave his side. His lips ticked up into a half-smile. That girl, woman now, was a trickster but had one of the biggest hearts this side of the Mississippi. I hope she's stubborn enough to keep Dunder alive until I can get back with help. Did you find Doc? Caleb set his hat on his knee and ran his free hand through his hair. Yeah, I found him in the hospital. Dad, he's in surgery. He tried to deliver the news as softly as possible. Dad and Doc were longtime friends, compatriots in this Christmas quest they'd taken up like knights. Working the reindeer herd, protecting it, was a lifetime calling, one Caleb and his brothers had eagerly accepted when they each turned twenty-one, except for his youngest brother, Drake, who was only nineteen. Drake was on the fence about sticking around, but that was normal for a guy his age. Caleb had had the same stirrings to get out of their small town and make something of himself without the family legacy shadowing his every accomplishment. It wasn't until he'd gotten off the ranch and seen what was out there that he understood how much faith, hope, and goodwill were needed in the world. He couldn't take a higher calling than to be a reindeer wrangler. The silence hung heavy between him and Dad. 
Caleb could picture his father in the home office, running his hand down his face in an effort to retain control over his emotions. He wasn't a feelings kind of guy, but he was a loyal friend. What's the survival rate? Caleb coughed uncomfortably. I've been trying not to think about that, I figure asking for a miracle is always a good idea in these cases. No matter what the odds were on WebMD, which he'd refused to read, surgery was hard on the body, and Doc wasn't one to take care of himself. If food didn't come from the Nicholas's kitchen, it came in a greasy bag from a drive through What more could they have done for him? Caleb prayed the question wouldn't haunt him forever and that they'd get the chance to see Doc again, real soon. Good idea. We'll all do the same out here. Dad drew in a breath. What about Dunder? Doc's daughter is here, the one he's always bragging is such a smarty pants. Caleb grinned, wishing Faith was here to heart that. She'd probably kick his boots. He shouldn't like it so much, but as far as he was concerned, her sass was her best quality. She said she'd come out as soon as Doc was in the clear. Sounds good. I told her I'd stay and wait for her. Oh. The interest in Dad's tone implied he thought there was something more to Caleb's offer. Yeah, I don't want her to skip town. I get the feeling she doesn't like reindeer. That's strange. Right? He warmed up to the topic. I mean, I can understand people not liking snakes and spiders and such, but reindeer? Besides, she's a vet. Shouldn't she like all animals? She must have her reasons. Caleb ran his thumb down his scruffy jaw, thinking. Whatever. I don't care. Except now he couldn't stop caring. The mystery was too much for him to let go of, darn it. Dad chuckled. Your mom's got dinner on. Keep me posted. I will. Caleb hung up and brushed the lint off his hat. Faith returned, carrying a foam cup full of awful-smelling cheap cocoa. She cradled the styrofoam as if it held comfort. Maybe it did, though something that smelled that lowly was more of an imitation. Ah, you woke up. She took the seat next to him. He studied her out of the corner of his eye while maintaining the pretense that he was cleaning his hat. Her eyes were rimmed in pink. His heart clenched at the thought of her crying alone. He longed to wrap an arm around her and tuck her to his side and let her have at the tears. He wouldn't even care if she ruined his shirt, it wasn't anything special. He stretched theatrically and yawned. Gotta sleep when you can. And eat. Now that his stomach smelled food, even the junky hot chocolate, it wanted nourishment. Mom had been working on a beef stew with homemade rolls when he'd torn through the kitchen. His stomach rumbled. He wasn't doing himself any favors thinking about all the good he was missing out on. I'm sorry about Doc, he ventured. I should have said that first thing. She nodded a thank you. Doc's a good guy. We enjoy having him around. Thanks for saying that. She turned slightly and pulled out her phone. Not sure why Caleb tried to further the conversation. So how come I haven't seen you around before? I'm sure I would have remembered your pretty face. Her pale cheeks took on a rosy glow. The way her eyebrows pulled together, he wasn't sure if she was flattered or ticked off at his compliment. Can we not do this right now? Do what? Talk. Or did she think he was trying to flirt? Either way, he was dismissed, and he wasn't dumb enough to stick his hand in the badger hole twice. Yep. He shoved to his feet, swiping his hat off his knee in the process and shoving it down on his head. I'm going to get some grub. She snorted at his use of the word grub. Feeling like a hick from Nowhereville, 
he strode out the door. She wasn't going anywhere until her dad was out of surgery, and that meant they had hours of waiting, together. Heaven help him, no woman made him feel as awkward as she had with one ladylike snort. He was usually pretty good with women, a charmer, even. Which only confused him more. The whole time he ate a leathery slab of roast beef and mashed potatoes in the cafeteria, he worked over ways he could break down Faith's walls. None of his usual flirting tactics would work on her. She needed more than a compliment and a smile, she needed Christmas. Odd that her name was Faith and it didn't appear that she had any. He wasn't out to win her heart, but maybe he could open it for Christmas to pour in. It felt like a worthy goal, and when his chest burned, he had the confirmation from on high that he should proceed. Proceed with caution, but nevertheless proceed. Chapter 5 After a long night of drifting in and out of sleep and the welcome news that Dad had made it through surgery and was in recovery Faith told Caleb she was ready to go to the ranch. Don't you want to see him? Caleb asked, his forehead wrinkled with confusion. The man was an enigma. He had a boyish quality to his smile, and yet his jaw was covered in a manly, well-kept beard streaked with honey-colored strands. She rubbed her eyes. So many memories came up throughout the night that she couldn't be sure what she dreamed and what had been lucid thought. It was almost like she had two fathers. The first one loved Christmas and reindeer and animals and her. The second one was a selfish loner who did what he wanted no matter the consequences to the people around him. She wasn't sure who was waking up from surgery this morning, which dad would she find? Not right now, she responded, putting off the answer to her question. She gave the nurse a note to give to dad when he was fully awake that said she went out to check on a reindeer. At least he'd be happy about that. It wasn't long before Faith found herself in a beautiful new red Ford pickup truck with seat warmers that grew her exhaustion like germs in a petri dish. She leaned her head against the cold window and watched the tops of six-foot fence posts strung with barbed wire fly by. The road was covered in a sheet of compact snow, and the plows had pushed enough off the road to cover the fences. The fields were empty blankets of white sometimes broken up by snowmobile treads. Her car wouldn't have made it far on the slippery roads, but Caleb's truck seemed to do just fine. He had bags of feed in the back for weight and flipped on the four-wheel drive, which meant they traveled at about 30 miles per hour. She was warm and oddly comfortable despite the cowboy sharing the cab and the fact that she was about to visit the one place on God's earth she'd sworn she'd never go. She must have dozed off, because she jolted awake as the truck bounced into a long driveway. Eager to appease her long-standing curiosity, she leaned forward in her seat. The field next to her was full of reindeer. The females had beautiful sets of antlers, the males had already shed theirs during November. They drove for a full five minutes with nothing but reindeer to admire until the road opened up into a parking area. Straight ahead was a stunning two-story country home done in light gray with red shutters and a white wraparound porch. A green wreath hung on the door, and holiday garlands wove around the support beams. Large trees stood sentry in the front yard, their shade probably welcomed in the summer. She'd bet a month's salary the Nicolases had lights strung everywhere and the home was stunning at night. She rubbed her arms, instinctively knowing that this was a home so unlike the one she'd grown up in. This was the kind of place where decorating a Christmas tree wasn't a chore and the scent of homemade apple cider warming on the stove enveloped you when you walked through the front door. Turning away, because the house and the accompanying yearnings it created were too much to bear she focused on the barn. Red, because what other color would a Christmas-loving family pick, and bigger than the apartment building she'd lived in at college, it was trimmed in white. 
Along the side was a large sign that read Reindeer Wrangler Ranch, complete with holly clusters in the corners. A huge indoor arena finished in gray and white like the house stood next to the barn. The whole place screamed of money and privilege. Shoot! Caleb scrambled for his phone and pressed a few buttons. Announcement, we have a visitor on the ranch. Repeat, we have a visitor. Everyone is grounded. 10-4. Copy that. The workout doors are shut. Are we good in here? Caleb's lips disappeared in his beard as he pressed them together. He glanced at her before responding. I think so. I'll give you warning if we come that way. Thanks. That was the strangest thing she'd ever heard. What was that? she demanded. Caleb shrugged. Usual procedure. For what? An air raid. Everyone's grounded? She leaned forward in her seat and glanced up at the sky, then at what she'd thought was an indoor arena. Maybe it was an airplane hangar. Some farmers in this area used planes to fertilize their crops. Her breath caught at the thought of flying with Caleb. She'd ridden in a helicopter and a small plane before, both times, she'd felt like she was given a glimpse of how God must see the world in all its beauty. Perspective had been gained, because the things that were so big in her life suddenly seemed small. And the feeling that time extended on and on had overcome her, letting her know that deadlines and appointment schedules, though necessary, shouldn't rule her life. Could Caleb take her flying and give her those feelings? Would he? She could use a moment out of time to get her bearings over the situation with her father. Are you a pilot? Caleb threw the truck in park and climbed out without answering her question. Rude. Her hopes deflated, and she brushed them away like old tissues. She fumbled with the door handle as he made his way around the front of the truck. No way was she going to let him open her door and pretend to be a gentleman when he'd ignored her. A man in a tan felt cowboy hat and a black winter work coat strode out of the barn. He lifted a hand in greeting. His high cheekbones and trimmed beard resembled Caleb so much that they had to be brothers. Although this guy had medium brown hair and his beard was tinged with red. Interesting. Where's Stella? Caleb called to him, looking around the open area as if this woman should be in plain sight. Faith's interest perked up. Stella? She thought he'd said he had all brothers. Maybe Stella was someone who helped with the reindeer. Or a girlfriend. The familiarity in Caleb's voice when he spoke her name made Faith hope Stella was the one who had to clean stalls. She shoved the tiny green-eyed monster away, it wasn't big enough to put up a fight and disappeared quickly. Caleb's brother continued with his report, she took off this morning. Took off how? Caleb pushed up his hat and scratched his hair. She took Snowflake. The man's eyes darted to Faith as they met up. She went to open her mouth to introduce herself when Caleb dropped a son of a nutcracker. He ripped off his hat and slapped it against his thigh before heading toward the barn with long strides. Faith hurried to keep up, sucked into the drama playing out in front of her. Perhaps all wasn't well on the reindeer wrangler ranch. The little brother kept up with them, casting an apologetic look to Faith. Who authorized that? Caleb demanded. I did. An older, distinguished version of the two men strode out of the barn. He had on a cream felt hat and a denim coat lined with matching fleece. These wranglers sure loved their cowboy hats. Her own head was cold since she didn't even have a beanie or anything. 
She studied the man she'd once believed turned her father against his family. He was a classic handsome, like George Clooney with a touch of Santa Claus, wider in the shoulders and with bowed legs. What she could see of his hair was gray sprinkled with darker gray. His eyes were kind, and he had this aura of patience about him that made her think he was trustworthy. She rubbed her arms. She hadn't had enough sleep last night to challenge her whole set of beliefs about these people and her family today. Exhaustion dogged her every footstep. The sooner she saw this all-important reindeer, the better. Caleb shook his head. Why would you let her take an untried and quite frankly a half-crazy reindeer to F.L.? Ahem. Mr. Nicholas cut off his son's tirade. When he focused all his attention on Faith, she had the feeling she was something special. He held out his elbow, expecting her to take it. Let's get this little lady inside, where her hands can thaw out. We can catch up later. Caleb seemed more upset that this Stella person had taken a reindeer than that she was gone. Wait, she'd taken a reindeer. Were the animals allowed to leave the ranch? As far as she knew, endangered species permits didn't permit selling the animals to outside individuals. Add that to the way Mr. Nicholas had jumped on Caleb, stopping him from saying anything more in front of her, and the situation was suspicious. She'd have to keep her ears and eyes open for warning signs while she was here. Reporting misconduct to the authorities would ensure the animals were properly taken care of. If she thought the outside of the barn was impressive, she was overwhelmed with the inside. The breezeway was lined with thick pads, the kind they used in horse stalls to save their knees and hips from undue pain. On the left were eight stalls, and on the right was a tack room, a washing area and hitching post, and then four stalls mirroring the ones on the other side. In the wash area was a large open brick fireplace with a built-in bench surrounding it. She would have been concerned that it would start the place on fire, but there wasn't anything flammable within fifteen feet. Not a speck of straw or sawdust. Beyond the stalls, tractors and other equipment lined up like toy soldiers waiting for their orders. The stalls were framed with thick timbers and iron rods. Some of them had lowered ceilings, while two were open to the rafters. She'd never seen stalls that went all the way to the ceiling before. It was so strange. Reindeer poked their heads out of the windows, looking her over. Animals were curious about new people. She could probably walk down the rows and take a moment to introduce herself to each of them and enjoy the feel of their velvet noses against her palm. Wait, was that a red nose? She blinked. Is that a red nose? She pointed to the reindeer in the stall on the right. I've never seen that before. Mr. Nicholas's belly bounced as he laughed. It was endearing to see him enjoy the moment of showing off his reindeer as if it were his firstborn son. It's red all right. Just like his daddy. Next you're going to tell me his dad is Rudolph and that his nose wasn't just red, it glowed. She shook her head. Mr. Nicholas and dad were two of a kind. I didn't say anything about glowing. Dunder's in here, dear. Mr. Nicholas pulled open a heavy sliding door and revealed a beautiful gray-haired reindeer with a giant set of antlers, lying on his side and breathing deeply. He's been asleep for a few hours. She felt her pockets for a pair of medical-grade plastic gloves and then moaned. I didn't bring any supplies. I've got a few in the tack room. I'll see what I can dig up. Mr. Nicholas left her there in the open doorway. In her experience, large animals saw open doors as an escape and were willing to bowl over whoever stood in their way. 
She was about to step backward and do her best to slide the door shut when a warm hand landed on her lower back and pushed her though. She glanced over her shoulder to see Caleb, his face tight with determination as he guided her inside the stall. She stumbled, and he caught her arm, riding her. Thank you, she breathed out, discombobulated by the fact that his touch was both sure and gentle. Moving closer, she studied the reindeer with curiosity. He didn't look like anything special. In fact, he seemed old and worn out. He should have lost his antlers. She reached for her phone to pull up Dunder's file. Caleb leaned against the stall wall and tucked his hands in his pockets. She wondered if he'd gotten a vibe when he'd touched her too, or if it was just her. He doesn't, ever. Not since he was two. What? She located the file and read through it. Dad thought there was a hormone deficiency of some kind but didn't worry about it because he was otherwise healthy. Hmm, a mystery for sure. Will he startle if I touch him? Caleb considered her. I'm not sure. He's an interesting guy. Guy? She rolled her eyes. Please, he's an animal. If she was going to be here, she would not put up with aggrandizing the herd's reputation. Caleb chuckled. You'll see. Whatever, she mumbled as she ran her hand over the large antler. The reindeer was lying down, and the antler came almost to her belly button and in some places was as thick as her arm. Carrying this rack is enough to wear out a reindeer his age. You should cut it off. Dunder's eyes flew open, white and wild, and he snorted, lifting a cloud of sawdust and making her choke. She waved in front of her face and coughed. Caleb laughed. I don't think he likes that idea. He can't understand me. She turned her attention to Dunder and found herself caught in his deep, black glass gaze. He seemed to be asking her for help, asking if she was a friend or foe. Going off her comment about cutting off his antlers, he might believe she was a foe. She shook off the haze that came from staring into his eyes and pinched the bridge of her nose. I really need sleep. Mr. Nicolas appeared with a bucket of supplies and handed her some blue gloves. I'm going to the playground for a minute to check on things. I'll see you in a bit. Okay, thanks, she called after him. She slipped into the gloves and then crouched in front of Dunder's face, using a flashlight to make his pupils dilate. They did, though slowly, which meant his blood sugar was probably low. Not unexpected, considering he hadn't eaten in twenty-four hours. She moved to push his lip up, and he grunted, pulling away. Hey, boy, said Mr. Nicholas. This is Doc's girl. You treat her right. Dunder's eyes flicked to her, and she could have sworn he understood, because he opened his mouth for her. What are you looking for? asked Caleb. He'd come closer when his dad had come in, and she sensed his nearness like warmth from a yule log. Sores. If he's drinking but not eating, it could mean an abscessed tooth. She finished the oral exam. Nothing. She moved to his stomach, listened to his heart and noted the fresh pile of droppings that meant his bowels worked. I'm going to need to draw blood. Thankfully, they had the supplies in the bucket. Caleb came forward and put his hand on Dunder's neck, just above where she was about to insert the needle. She pulled back. Is he going to jerk? If he was, she wanted to be out of the way of the antlers. More importantly, they'd have to bind his legs to protect themselves. How had she skipped that step? She turned to stare at the reindeer, 
shocked that she'd forgotten he wasn't domesticated and could easily harm her or Caleb. Caleb spoke softly. No, but he's scared. Her head whipped to the side, where she caught the fear in Dunder's eyes. She whipped back to look at Caleb, shocked that he was in tune with the animal. Usually, her large animal clients stepped back and let her do what needed to be done. They didn't care about the animal being afraid. Dog and cat owners? That was a different story altogether. They knew their pets, loved them as members of the family. That's very kind of you. He ducked under the brim of his hat as he confessed, I care about this old buzzard. Dunder moaned like someone would at a bad joke. Caleb winked at her and started scratching behind Dunder's ear. What? Are you embarrassed in front of the pretty lady, huh? While Caleb distracted the reindeer with his teasing and talk faith filled five vials of blood. She pulled out the needle and applied pressure with gauze. There, that wasn't so bad, was it? Dunder rolled his eyes. She slipped off her gloves. I don't know what's more disturbing, that I talked to him, or that I think he responded. Caleb grinned. This breed of reindeer is extremely intelligent. A loud clang rang through the air. They both jumped and turned to see the red-nosed reindeer shake out his head and then walk into the metal bar outlining the doorway again. She sputtered a laugh. Intelligent, huh? Caleb's rueful grin was something to behold. That's Rudy. He's smart, but he's also half-blind. He jumped to his feet and went over to the open doorway. Rudy, he said by way of warning the animal he was getting closer. How'd you get out of your stall? Rudy sniffed Caleb from belt to chin. Sorry, no carrots on me today. Rudy shook out his head in disgust. Faith rocked back on her heels, watching with interest. One reindeer with seeming telepathic abilities she could understand, but two? Caleb took Rudy's halter and turned his head to the side. This way. Hang on. She patted Dunder's neck before standing, feeling like Dunder would be insulted if she just ran off. She got closer to Rudy, expecting the same sniffing treatment. Instead, he buried his face in her stomach and rubbed his head on her. She laughed, stepping back with one foot to brace herself. What's he doing? Caleb lifted a shoulder. Saying hello. She scratched both sides of Rudy's face, just under his jaw. His back legs started pounding on the floor like a puppy's, making her laugh. Caleb's eyes widened, and he threw his arm over the back of the reindeer, leaning on him as if he were a countertop. Rudy's feet clicked against the floor. Faith paused. Wait, his feet. No. She must have mistaken the sound of his thumping foot. It had moved fast enough to blur in her vision. He didn't lift both hooves off the ground at the same time. That's good. He likes you. Caleb held out a staying hand. Let's give the scratching a rest, okay? Okay. She pulled her hands away from the warm fur and placed them on Rudy's face so she could turn his head. Using the small flashlight, she studied his eyes. He has cataracts. We know. He developed them a couple months after being born. We can remove them. Caleb glanced down at Rudy as if asking permission. You can? She nodded. I've done the surgery on horses before. It's not bad, but he'd need to come into the clinic. As clean as you guys keep this place, I don't think it's sterile enough for surgery. Um, 
Caleb hedged. Look, if it's too expensive, I understand. He will have a good life here, and there's really no need to fix his sight. There kind of is. Caleb ran a hand through his hair and blew out his cheeks. I'll have to talk it over with the crew. We don't let the reindeer leave the ranch. But Stella took one, she argued. Rudy was adorable and lipped at her clothing, tugging as if asking her to play. She suddenly wanted him to be able to see clearly and enjoy this world he'd only stumbled through before. Caleb cringed. That's different. How, she pressed. It just is. He pushed Rudy back and then took him to his stall. Faith followed, incensed. His girlfriend could take a reindeer for a super vague reason, but she wasn't allowed to help one see. This is a medical condition. Surely your permits would allow the reindeer off the ranch for elective surgeries. Something fell past her peripheral vision, and she found a piece of straw on her shoulder. She brushed it off. Caleb unhooked Rudy's harness and shut the stall door behind him. Behave for once, will you? We have a guest. He gestured to Faith while admonishing the reindeer. Something tickled Faith's hair, and she brushed pieces of hay out of it. Where is this coming from? She looked around. There wasn't a stick of straw to be seen. She went to tip her chin up and look above, maybe there was a hayloft she'd missed. Caleb clapped his hands together loudly, startling her. He glanced up and then moved quickly back to Donder's stall. There must be a draft. She held her hand up, testing for a breeze. Then she looked up at the ceiling to see if they stored hay in the rafters but she didn't see anything. Come on, beautiful, Caleb said a little louder than necessary. Her heart did a somersault at the nickname. If he continued to call her pretty and beautiful, she might start to expect it from him. He needed to get that under control. If she was going to work with him, they should have a professional relationship. One with all the right boundaries and such. She turned to him to thank him for the compliment and explain how she felt about not muddying the waters between them, only to see another reindeer. This one was a soft buck color with eyes like Liz Taylor's, outlined heavily in black and lashes for days. The way she held herself gave off the impression that she was a queen. Wow. Caleb brushed her neck. This is sparkle. She's too uppity for a harness, but as long as we tell her she's beautiful, she'll do just about anything we ask. Faith's neck warmed with embarrassment that she'd thought he was talking to her. And that he might have applied the same thought process to her. Well, it wasn't going to work. She refused to soften because he'd called her pretty. At least she wouldn't have to make things awkward between them by drawing a line in the snow. Will you take your stunning little self into your stall? Caleb asked in a tone that was so sweet it could cause cavities. Sparkle closed her eyes briefly, acknowledging his request. Then she turned her back to them and swished her tail like a woman wagged her hips as she made her way into the tall at the end of the row. Caleb shoved his hands on his hips. Women. Faith laughed. He grinned back. They're growing on you, aren't they? She sobered quickly. No, she ducked into the stall and gathered her samples, throwing the garbage into the bag hanging off the handle. I need to get to Dad's office. It's been a long day. Can I have your phone number? She fumbled with the tubes. What? Was he really asking for her number? Geez, this guy didn't know when to quit. Did she want him to have it? She was alone in town, 
and there was a lot on her plate. It would be nice to have a friend. But she couldn't afford to encourage anything with this wrangler. They lived in two different towns and had vastly different priority lists. His eyebrows jumped. I'll call you for the test results. Oh. Right. Of course. She needed to get her head in the game. Sure, they'd had an interesting visit on the ranch, but that didn't mean Caleb wanted to spend more time with her, as a friend or otherwise. She rattled off her number, and he put it into his phone. A moment later, her phone beeped. Now you have mine. You know, in case you want someone to talk to, or yell at. One side of his mouth hitched up in a crooked grin. Just give me a call. She smiled almost involuntarily. Thanks. I'm sure I can go a few days without having anyone to yell at. He lifted a shoulder as if that was debatable. She held up the tubes. If I remember right, Dad has a full lab at his office. I can run these myself instead of sending them out and should have an answer soon. We'd appreciate that. In the meantime, make sure he's drinking, but don't offer him anything to eat. Okay. Let's get you back to the hospital. He followed behind her, almost as if he was making sure she left. A few more pieces of hay fell on her head, and she paused to brush them off. What on earth? She went to look up, but Caleb shoved her out the door and into the blinding sunlight. She covered her eyes. Yikes. Sorry. I, uh, tripped. Caleb shut the door behind him with a definite thud. She stared. Something weird was going on at the Reindeer Wrangler Ranch. She wasn't quite sure what, and she wasn't sure if she wanted to find out. She had the feeling that this place could suck her in, like it had Dad. And she couldn't allow that to happen. She'd treat Dunder, and then she'd wash her hands of the reindeer and the cute wrangler that came with them. Chapter 6 Caleb enjoyed recounting his near-flying reindeer sightings in the barn with Faith over Sunday breakfast. The reindeer had been in rare form, sneaking out of their stalls and attempting to meet the newcomer. Snowflake had dropped straw on her head. And then there was Rudy. He'd thought Rudy was going to follow her around like a lovesick puppy. Mom giggled. I can't blame Rudy. He's always been curious. It's Sparkle who I think was up to mischief. Dad guffawed, putting his hand over Mom's. She's as jealous as they come and probably didn't like the competition. There aren't many ladies walking around the ranch. You're the only one she respects enough not to mess with. He winked at mom. And Doc's daughter isn't bad on the eyes, either. Forrest shoved Caleb's elbow off the table right as he was dropping a dollop of whipped cream on his waffles. I can't believe we missed her, Drake bemoaned. I can't believe Doc's daughter is that cute, quipped Caleb's twin, Jack. Mom gave him a dirty look. What? You've seen the grizzly guy, right? Jack swiped a napkin across his face to hide his smirk. His lack of shaving skills aside, Mom lifted her nose and reached for the basket of from scratch cranberry muffins. Doc is a good friend who is going through a rough time right now, and he doesn't deserve you knocking him down behind his back. Caleb exchanged a look with Jack that told him he agreed with his twin's shock but wasn't going to take on Mom. Mom shoved the basket at Caleb. Hurry up, or we'll be late for church. Caleb accepted the basket and took two. Cranberry was his favorite. I was thinking of visiting Doc after services and filling him in on what's going on with Dunder, 
maybe get a second opinion if he's up to talking much. I'll ride over with you, said Drake. We can stop for lunch at the diner if you want. That was a good idea. If Faith was at the hospital, she might relax having another person to carry some of the awkward load of conversation they'd been carrying between them. She was so uptight with him, only relaxing for a few minutes when she talked about Rudy's possible surgery. And since Drake was only nineteen Faith wouldn't give him a second look. Diving into why that mattered to him wasn't going to happen over breakfast. That was the kind of contemplation better undertaken when sitting on a tractor with nothing but miles of field to plow or snow to move. I'd be happy for the company, he replied. We're going over to Doc's place and fill the fridge. Dad took a quick sip from his glass of eggnog. Doc will need some easy meals, and his daughter could use some meat on her bones. Caleb grinned. Faith looked good to him just the way she was, he wasn't looking to change her. But that was another tractor ponder session. He jumped to his feet before he filled up his calendar with thoughts of Faith. What do you want me to tell her about Rudy? Dad leaned back and rubbed his stomach. He glanced at Mom, who nodded for him to go ahead. We talked it over last night. If she can help him see, I think we should go for it. He might be the only animal we can send to the North Pole for the next little bit. A cloud of worried thoughtfulness descended over the table. Each year, fewer and fewer flying reindeer were born. The ones in the barn weren't up to the task of helping Santa deliver toys for one reason or another. If they didn't get some new flyers soon, Christmas would be in real trouble. But, you have to stay with him the whole time, Dad added. We can't have Faith finding out about Rudy's special abilities. Caleb nodded and knocked on the table for good luck. I'll put on a tie, meet you at the truck in five minutes, Drake. He'd stayed over at Doc's with a reindeer before, but that was different, Doc wasn't a beautiful woman who'd caught his attention. It didn't matter. He'd have to keep his distance from Faith and keep his head down. It had worked at the hospital. He grinned to himself as he tied his tie, thinking of how she'd kicked his boots. She was a tough cookie, that was for sure. He passed by the back door, where he hit the button on his key fob to start the truck engine. It took a full minute for the glow plugs to warm up before it rumbled to life. When it did, he ran up the stairs to grab his hat. Doc didn't know why the reindeer weren't producing flyers. He tried crossing bloodlines and matching flying reindeer with flying reindeer, even though in the past they'd let the reindeer figure all that out. But nothing seemed to work. Maybe Faith could help them out. He paused, wondering why he'd thought that, and an old, hazy memory lifted from the back of his mind. About ten years back, Doc had been all excited that Faith was specializing in breeding and gene development in animals. He'd thought she'd be the answer to all their problems. But she hadn't shown up after graduation like Doc had predicted. Caleb frowned. He'd forgotten all about that until just now. He double-checked his shirt to make sure he hadn't spilled on it at breakfast and then ran down the stairs. Maybe he could ask Faith to look at their breeding records. If she could find a solution. No. He wouldn't dare. Not without telling her about the magic coursing through their veins. And doing that wasn't up to him. If Doc had kept it a secret from her, then he had his reasons. Caleb was really interested in finding out what they were. After Sunday services Caleb and Drake found Doc's recovery room in a different part of the hospital than where Caleb had met Faith. This area was calmer. The walls were clean, off-white, and there were pictures of local farms and landmarks blown up and framed on the walls. The smell of cleaner tinted just about every space they entered. That was probably a good thing, 
though it put an exclamation point on the fact that this wasn't a home. Home smelled like earth and cinnamon and fabric softener. Doc sat up in bed and glared at the television, where It's a Wonderful Life played. He glanced at them hovering in the doorway and then jerked his head toward the TV. It's not like that, you know. What's not? asked Drake as he moseyed in and took a seat on the other side of the bed. He was pretty much comfortable anywhere. Church, hospitals, the barn. If Caleb had had half his confidence at nineteen, he could have built an empire or climbed forbidden mountains. Drake didn't realize the gift he had, being the youngest and feeling like he belonged. As the oldest Caleb had grown up paving trails. Diane, Doc barked. No one tells you what good you've done, all you count is the opportunities missed and see all the ways you screwed up. Caleb reeled back. You died. The doctor hadn't said anything about Doc dying the night of surgery. Not according to the doctors, but I know what happened. Doc stared out the window as if recounting the experience in his mind. It ain't all angels and bells, boys. Wow. Caleb caught Drake's eye. His younger brother was as weirded out by that statement as he was. Were they supposed to ask him about what he saw? Cause from the way Doc talked Caleb wasn't sure he wanted to know what awaited them on the other side. It wasn't like Doc was a sinner of large proportions. He didn't come to church, and he had a complicated relationship with his daughter, but that didn't mean he was meant for hellfire and damnation. Heck, if Doc was in trouble with God, where'd that leave the rest of them? Caleb shuffled closer to the bed. How you feeling? Doc's whole frame lifted and fell with his sigh. Like someone punched me in the chest and then ran over me with a sleigh. I'll be all right, though, still got some work left in me. We aren't worried about getting you back to work, Drake protested. We're here as neighbors for a Sunday visit. Doc looked like he was going to snort at that, and then he paused and softened. Thanks. I'm worried about the herd, though, always am. They're my saving grace. How so? Caleb leaned one hip against the bed. Any good I've done in this life was for them. Doc's face fell. I could have done a lot more for people who should have meant more to me, but there it is. I can't give up on the reindeer now, though, so I got a lot to get done before I'm, well. Caleb patted his shin. You worry about getting better right now, and when you're healthy, we'll be glad to have you. He paused, wondering much Doc remembered from before he'd gone into surgery and if Faith had visited since then. I don't want to put stress on your newly repaired valve. Do you think you could talk some things through with us? Doc nodded, his brown eyes showing interest. I'd appreciate the distraction. He tossed the remote on the bed and folded his hands in his lap. Caleb and Drake explained about Stella bringing Dunder in and his symptoms. Doesn't sound like a stomach issues, which is a good thing. Remember when Buddy Cho licked a couple years back? Doc asked. Drake dropped his head, and Caleb closed his eyes, picturing the dark-coated animal with a two-point rack. The young reindeer, a non-flyer, had gotten into the garden and eaten a bunch of corn. No one could have stopped him, and as his stomach had swelled and he'd passed away, Doc had kept him comfortable and eased his suffering. It had been a hard day all around. Caleb had learned early on that reindeer didn't live forever, but an unforeseen passing was always a blow. So Dunder has a chance. Drake asked. I wish I could get a blood sample. Doc's hand twitched against the sheet. Faith already did, Caleb offered, hoping to ease his worries. Faith. You let Faith treat Dunder. Doc came up off the bed, his face going red. She doesn't know. 
she can't know about the flyers. Caleb leaned in and put his hands on Doc's shoulders, gently pushing him back to rest on the bed. She doesn't. Doc sagged as if all his strength had run through holes in the bottom of a bucket. She can't find out, he mumbled. Why not, asked Caleb, trying his best to keep an even, quiet voice. Because she doesn't believe. She has all these new age ideas about things, and she'll mess everything up. A need to defend faith rose up inside of him. I think she could be an asset to us. Maybe help us figure out how to get more flyers out of the next breeding season. She doesn't have the Christmas spirit to do any such thing. I think you're underestimating her, Caleb spat back. He'd seen the way Faith worked with the animals, the way they took to her. Well, except for Sparkle, but she'd have an issue with any new female in the barn, human or reindeer. I'm afraid he has me pegged. All three males whipped around to find Faith standing in the doorway, carrying a lunch sack and a pile of fresh clothes for document. Her ash-brown straight hair framed her angular face. His eyes traced her pert nose and the line of her cheekbone before he realized he was staring and averted his gaze. Wait Faith was here. Shoot. They'd been too open, and apparently too loud, in their conversations. He silently swore. How long have you been standing there? What exactly had they said about the reindeer? The argument was a blur. Doc had said flyers. Hadn't he? Or maybe that was Caleb. Drake glared at Caleb and cut his hand across his throat, telling him to shut up. Faith strode right into the tense atmosphere as if it didn't concern her at all. For what it's worth, I agree with Dad. I don't buy into Christmas and all the trappings. She set the clothing on the bottom of the bed and handed Doc the sack. Don't get too excited, it's all approved heart-healthy food. But I thought you might like something that wasn't cooked here. Doc smiled fondly at her and held the bag close. Thank you. She nodded and then got busy with the clothes, as if his gratitude made her uncomfortable. If you guys are done arguing with a man who just had heart surgery, she looked pointedly back and forth between them. I'd like to help him get washed up. The nurse should be here any minute. Drake held up a hand. For the record, miss, I was not arguing. She chuckled, and Caleb shot Drake a look that would have scared off a hungry wolf. But not his little brother. Oh no. Baby brother was immune to older brother threats. He stood up and held out his hand. I'm Drake, by the way. She shook it. It's nice to meet you. Are you? She waved her hand, circling Drake and Caleb, asking how they were related. He nodded. I'm the youngest. She took him in. You're so much darker than your brother. It's interesting to see how the genetics play in your family. Something nudged Caleb to talk to her about the issues on the ranch, but Doc cleared his throat and shook his head slightly. Fine. He'd keep his mouth shut, for now. He nudged Drake. Come on, we need to get going if you want to see your girl at the diner before her shift is over. Drake kicked the side of the bed and ducked his head. She's not my girl. But you want her to be. Caleb ducked as Drake took an easy swing at him. We'll see you later, document get better, he called as they made their way out of the room. Drake told Doc to hang in there and that Mom was going out to stock his fridge for when he got home. Good to see you, Caleb said to Faith. She gave him a half-smile and a nod in return. He'd be kicking himself for days for fighting with Document. It didn't matter what Caleb thought about Faith's holiday potential, he shouldn't have pushed. Now he'd upset the old man and his daughter. Once in the hallway Caleb looked around, 
realizing that it was dimmer out here than it was Doc's room, where Faith had unpacked his belongings. She had a way of making the world seem lighter and better just by showing up. Drake texted as they walked. Caleb's pocket buzzed, and he pulled it out to see Drake had sent a text out to the family. Caleb calls dibs on the new vet. Caleb reached for Drake, ready to pummel him. What the heck? I just thought I should make it known, you know, so Jack doesn't go after her or something. Caleb rubbed his chest. A burning knife struck right through it at the thought of his twin brother making a move on Faith. He wouldn't. No, he won't now. Drake waved his phone. You're welcome. Caleb didn't know if he should throw his brother into a snowbank or hug him. He shook his head. I don't think it will matter. She can hardly stand me, and she's not in town for long. Drake's mouth fell open. Hardly stand you. She couldn't stop looking at you. It was like no one else was in the room, and I'm the handsome brother. Caleb laughed as the automatic doors opened and the frigid temperatures smacked him in the face. You just keep thinking that. I will. And you keep telling yourself you don't want that girl, even though you are totally into her. He marched to the truck. Caleb remote started it and then unlocked it so Drake could get in. He walked slower, needing a moment with his thoughts. Trouble was, no matter how much he thought about it, he couldn't find a way for the two of them to work out anything long term. Faith had a practice to get back to, and he wasn't leaving the ranch. There was no use chasing rainbows. He'd keep his head down and get the work done. And maybe one day he'd find a lady to love. The older he got, the more settling down sounded like living the best life. He climbed behind the wheel. Too bad he and Faith were on different paths and she hated his guts. Otherwise, he'd figure out a way to add some romance to her holiday, and his. It was mistletoe season, after all. The only one waiting for him was a sick reindeer, and he had no intention of kissing Dunder. Chapter 7 Drake was a cutie. His dark hair and Nicola's family good looks probably had all the local teenage girls swooning. But he didn't hold a candle to his older brother and those blue eyes of his. Faith stared after the two of them as they made their way down the hall, chatting and playing. They were the all-American cowboy breed. Came by it naturally, as she'd witnessed when she'd met their father. Abner Nicola's was all wrinkles and leather skin with an easy smile that belied the long hours of ranch life. Along with all that was a sense of peace that came with knowing what you'd been put on this earth to do. She'd sensed some of that in Caleb as well. Dad chuckled from his hospital bed. If you keep staring, you're gonna go cross-eyed. Faith spun on her heel and smirked. They're quite the family, aren't they? Dad's whole face seemed to soften. They've been more than kind to me. Sounds like it. Their mom. She held out a hand to get a name. Anna, Dad filled in. Anna doesn't need to stock the fridge. I can get groceries. He lifted a hand and let it drop as if that took too much effort to make small gestures. The nurse said they'd had him walk a little this morning and that he was due for another lap this afternoon. His face was pale, and his normally restless spirit was calm. Anna's the type that has to be doing something for someone or she's bored out of her mind. She'll cook a few meals and put them in the freezer and bake some goodies. It'll be the best food you've ever had so don't tell her to stop. Faith grinned. How can I say no after that endorsement? She walked over and sat on the end of the bed, patting Dad's leg. How are you feeling? Like my well's gone dry. 
He had new wrinkles on his face, lines around his mouth that she didn't remember. I expect that's normal, but it doesn't make it any less bothersome. He nodded. Caleb said you went out to the ranch. She nodded, not sure how much she wanted to reveal about her resentment over the reindeer or the way they'd communicated with her. It was uncanny and more than unsettling. She finally settled on not following that path of conversation. She turned to tuck an extra pair of pajamas in the nightstand drawer. Dunder's an amazing animal, Dad said. She sighed. So much for not talking about it. He's big for a reindeer. Dad's nod was barely there. He was sinking into the pillows, wearing out quickly. He's different than most. I recommended cutting off his antlers. She smiled, thinking of how Dunder had looked like he'd wanted to bite her for saying that. Dad chuckled, and a grin spread across his tired face. I'll bet that went over well. She laughed. Not so much. I used your lab to start the blood tests. We should have some answers in the next 24 to 48 hours. The monitors beeped at a steady rate, and a nurse passed by the door. It didn't matter what was going on inside this room, life continued out there. Are you headed back to Grafton after that? Faith balked. Why would I? You have a life there. She stared at him, dumbfounded. And where will you go? Who will watch out for him? Keep his house from freezing over? Run the clinic? She'd glanced through his calendar, he had appointments scheduled. Someone would either have to call and cancel or substitute for him. You can't run a business from a hospital bed, Dad. The doc says there's a rehab facility. I can live there for a month or two until I'm back on my feet. Hot indignation rose up inside of Faith. I dropped everything to come here. And you think I'm just going to leave you to face all this alone? Did he think she was a cold-hearted witch? Not that she'd ever put much into their relationship before, but that didn't mean she wouldn't do the right thing. He perked up. I'm not asking you to stay and care for me, I got no right. The beeps grew closer together. Faith glanced at the machine. Dad. Families look out for one another. She pushed off the bed and started to pace. What if we attempted to be a normal family for once? There's no such thing as normal families, Dad groused. Faith threw her arms in the air. Oh, you'll let the Nicolases feed you but you won't ask me for help? A low growl escaped her lips. He was so stubborn. If you're so in love with the Nicolases, then why don't you join their family and I'll do whatever I darn well please. He folded his arms and huffed. Faith marched over to the bed and barely refrained from poking the old man. I didn't ask to be your daughter, but God gave me to you. Her hands balled into fists. Remind me to thank him for that one, because you've been a real peach to work with. Dad's arms slowly lowered to his sides. He took a deep, shuddering breath. I've been a horrible father. Part of me wants to run away from all that forever and pretend that I didn't fail. He dropped his chin. I don't think that's an option. God knows, and he doesn't forget. I wish I was different, for you and for him. Faith slowly sank to the bed. A part of me might always be angry at you for what you missed. But another part doesn't want you to miss anything else. He lifted his eyes to meet hers. We're a mess, baby girl. And it's my fault. Then be the one to fix it. He brushed her hand. 
I can try, but I'm not good at this stuff. That's okay. I'm good at telling people what to do. You just have to listen. I'll stay through Christmas and help with the clinic, your patients shouldn't go without care. He hummed in agreement. I hope you don't regret this. Her heart squeezed. Letting her dad back in after all these years wasn't going to be easy. Me too. She patted his hand and smiled. Committing to stay for a month. It also meant that she'd see Caleb and his family more. She wasn't sure how she felt about that, or about any of this, really. If someone had asked her two weeks ago if she wanted her life to change, she would have said no way. She had it good right where she was. Maybe that was why God decided to shake things up. It seemed like he never wanted her to be too comfortable. Maybe that was the whole point of introducing her to Caleb. He certainly took her out of her comfort zone so fast it made her stomach swoop and her heart flutter. She liked that he'd stuck up for her to her dad. What had he said, you underestimate her Christmas spirit? Something like that. A strange thing to value, but in the reindeer business, Christmas was a big deal. She wanted to ask Dad about the strange happenings at the ranch, but his eyes were half shut and his breathing steady, give him another couple minutes and he'd be fast asleep. She'd have to wait for another time. Hopefully, she'd get everything sorted before Christmas and have her life on track before January 1st. Then she could leave the reindeer and the handsome wrangler behind. Chapter 8 Caleb hopped off the back of the flatbed truck where he'd stood to count heads and watch for sick animals to join packs in the cab. He put his hands in front of the heater vents and allowed the warm air to thaw out his fingers. The afternoon herd check had gone well, thank goodness. With Dunder sick, an air of desperation to make sure the other animals were safe made him anxious. Pax didn't have to come out with him since it wasn't his turn, but he was the workaholic of the bunch, never going to sleep until every drop of daylight was used up and every task crossed off his list. He thrived on getting a job done and making sure this place ran like a machine. His phone rang. Hey, princess. He used Stella's least preferred nickname as he answered the phone. Your crazy reindeer just flew off into the wilds of Yellowstone National Park. She threw the information at him with as much of an accusation as a plea for help. He ripped off his hat and threw it on the dash, startling Pax. How'd that happen? She sighed. I think the girls had something to do with it. But if Snowflake had any sense, she would have stuck close to a food source. That's the problem with being able to fly, the whole world is a food source. Geez, Stella, she could be anywhere. He shoved his hand through his hair. Pax glanced at him and pressed on the gas. Family meeting, he muttered just loud enough for Caleb to hear. Sound the alarm, Caleb responded. Pax got on his phone and typed out a quick text while he drove through the field. If they'd been on the road, he never would have texted, but bouncing through a wide open plain with the herd behind them was different. Caleb's phone beeped, and Pax tucked his phone back into his coat's chest pocket. Listen, I got a lot going on this year. Stella said. Any chance you all could send a rescue sleigh? I get it, princess. But we're out of reindeer. Can someone from the North Pole come down? They're swamped with pre-Christmas tasks. His gut clenched. Of course they were. It was December, after all. I hate leaving you stranded. We'll have to send someone up there to find Snowflake if you need a ride. We can be there in a couple of days. Don't worry about me. I've got skills. Just take care of Snowflake. 
will do. Be safe. They said goodbye and hung up. Caleb snatched his hat off the dash and shoved it down on his head. I can't believe she lost our reindeer. Pax grunted and laughed at the same time, it came out as a strangled sound. He couldn't be happy about Snowflake loose in the wilds any more than Caleb was, but he handled it better. That's Stella. His assessment had Caleb shaking his head, bemused. That girl gets herself into a fix on a monthly basis. That's part of her charm. Pax stopped at the gate, and Caleb rushed out to open it for him and then close it after the truck drove through. He climbed back in and found Pax on the phone saying, Don't snap at me, I'm just asking. He rolled his eyes at Caleb. Caleb furrowed his brow in question, and Pax whispered, North Pole. Caleb settled back to listen in. Whatever was going on had Pax's face scrunching together. Listen, Frost. Caleb balked at his tone. Frost was the quiet Kringle, the bookworm, the one who never got cross with anyone or anything, and yet Pax was cutting into the conversation like he'd done that time he'd been accused of stealing a candy bar at the grocery store. He hadn't taken any candy, they'd searched his pockets and came up empty-handed. The clerk had been new to town and had a chip on her shoulder. She'd moved away not long after that. We didn't make Dunder sick, he came that way. Pax pinched the bridge of his nose. I just need you to let us know if any of the reindeer up there have symptoms. Thank you. He clicked off and tossed the phone on the seat. What flew up her chimney this year? Caleb shook his head. They all seemed off. Robin wasn't her normal cheery self when they brought Dunder in. I thought it was because she was worried, but maybe there's more to it. They've all nuts for the last four years, if you ask me, Pax mumbled. Caleb silently agreed with him. The Kringle women were all over the place. They'd been pretty tight-lipped about it, but Dad said that Santa Dollar had told him Christmas magic was behaving strangely and they were trying to get it to even out. Apparently, that was stressful for everyone, even mild-mannered Frost. They drove over to the house, where trucks were packed into the parking area. Looks like everyone's here, Pax noted. Great. This should be fun. Caleb shoved out of the vehicle and hunched his shoulders against the cold. Walking into the house was like walking into an oven compared to the temperature outside. He shed his coat and gloves and made his way to the family room, where everyone waited for the family meeting to begin. Mom and Dad sat in their chairs by the fireplace. Neither was a rocker, thank goodness Caleb wasn't sure he was ready for his parents to be that old. Next to Mom's recliner was a bag of knitting things and a half-finished project. Next to Dad's was a magazine rack with the latest hunting and fishing periodicals. Jack, Forrest, and Drake sat on the couch in order of lightest hair color to darkest. Faith had commented on how different he and Drake were in coloring, but the contrast didn't seem so stark if you looked at the brothers between them. Caleb, the oldest, was white blonde. Jack, his twin, was honey blonde. Then there was Forrest with sandy brown hair and beard, followed by Pax, who had medium brown with a lot of red mixed in. He didn't particularly like being called a ginger, but his beard came in all red, so there was no denying it. Dad said it was from their Viking heritage, which made them all better suited for living in the northernmost parts of North Dakota than on some tropical island. Finally, Drake was as dark of a brown as you could get. Pax came in behind him and took a seat on the smaller sofa. Caleb should have sat down, but he was too anxious to settle. A flying reindeer loose in Yellowstone Park was bad. So very bad. Great-grandpa's whole purpose in getting the herd in one place was to keep the general populace from finding out that flying reindeer were a real thing. 
If people knew, they'd want to study the animals. Which didn't sound so bad, until they started talking about caging, testing flying limits, and other such measures that would stress the reindeer's gentle nature. These weren't just animals that could fly, they were individuals with personalities and pet peeves. By keeping them on the ranch, the Nicola's family protected them. According to Google Maps, it will take just over nine hours to get to Yellowstone. Jack looked up from his phone. That's if there's no weather or traffic. Caleb and I can hook up a trailer and be on the road in 20 minutes. Hang on there. Dad motioned for Forrest to slow down. He liked to jump into things with both feet and then find a way out of the predicament if needed. Most of the time it worked out for him, which was so annoying. If Caleb ever tried that approach, he'd end up losing a limb or something. We have the Christmas Eve parade to think about. We can't let down the children. Mom nodded beside him. The Christmas Eve parade was a huge deal to the kids around here. People decorated their trucks, there was an ice princess float, and the whole thing was done at night. The grand finale was usually Dad dressed as Santa in a sleigh pulled by reindeer, the non-flying kind. Parents were able to hurry their kids home and get them in bed, because Santa was close by and no child wanted to be skipped over for being awake when the big guy came down the chimney. Dad had decided it was time to turn the reins over to the younger generation and let his sons take turns playing Santa. Caleb was first up to wear the red suit and call out, Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Tracking and capturing a flying reindeer could take weeks, even months, offered Jack. Snowflake wasn't the type to come when called. She liked to fly fast and furious, which meant she could be anywhere. I can't go, I have to check the fences this week, said Drake. Caleb and Pax exchanged a look. We can go. What about the work on the sleigh, asked Mom. They needed a new runner. It wasn't something they could pick up on Amazon, they had to craft it themselves. Pax was the resident welder of the family. I, Pax started, but he was cut off by Caleb's ringtone. He glanced down at the screen, and his heart leapt. Faith. She was calling him, it had to be about Dunder. The sick reindeer was never far from his thoughts. Knowing they were close to an answer had him moving faster than Flash. Hello, he answered before he realized that he'd put the phone to his ear. Caleb. This is Faith. He smiled because he'd seen her name, but it was cute that she still identified herself, kind of old-fashioned. He turned his back to the family but heard Dad say, Before we decide who is going, Let's see if we can figure out a route she might have taken. Anna, can you get the maps out? Focusing on the call, he said, Hey Faith. I hope you have some good news for us, we could sure use some. Uh, I'm afraid not. His gut sank to the floor. She cleared her throat. It appears Dunder has a virus. It's kicking his butt, and it's possible he's transmitted it to the rest of the herd already. Really? He's been in the barn the whole time. Yes, but the reindeer are in and out of there. At least, they were the other day. He pinched the bridge of his nose. Those darn Snoopy reindeer. If they'd just stayed in their stalls. What does this mean? Well, for one. I think we can save Dunder. Really? He lifted his head and clenched a fist. That's great. I've ordered the meds and can bring them over as soon as they arrive. Faith, I can't tell you how good that is to hear. I've, we've all been so worried about him. The family had grown quiet, and he spun around to give them a thumbs up. Dunder's gonna make it. Mom put her hand over her heart and whispered a prayer of gratitude. 
Dad patted her arm and mouthed Amen. His brothers gave each other fist bumps. But the whole herd needs to be inoculated, Faith added. Caleb shoved his hand in his pocket. They had over 700 reindeer. The spring inoculations took three days, and it was all hands on deck. When? I ordered the shots. They should be here in three days. He bit back a curse. Three days. That would give them enough time to set up the field and get things ready. There were fences to move, chutes to drag out of storage. Then there'd be takedown too. This was a week of work, minimum. Great. We'll plan on it. Just let me know when you're on your way to give Dunder the meds, and I'll meet you at the barn, okay? Don't go in there alone, he cautioned. She was likely to get a reindeer poop shower from Sparkle if she did. Sure. It's your animal. She sounded clipped and offended. Faith. He cradled the phone and lowered his voice. Thanks. It means a lot to me. You're welcome. The warmth in her answer made him want to put his arms around her, if only she were here. Forrest cleared his throat. Do you want us to leave? Caleb rolled his eyes as his brothers mocked him. I gotta go. I'll see you later. Faith said goodbye, and they hung up the phone. Caleb pulled a pillow off the sofa and chucked it at Forrest. Shut up. His brothers laughed all the harder. He sighed heavily. I know we need to find Snowflake, but it looks like the bug that got Dunder is contagious. We're going to have to inoculate the herd. They stopped laughing. He could see them figuring out what that meant for each of their schedules and to-do lists over the next couple of days. Dad stroked his beard. I can't see any way around it. We'll have to put off finding Snowflake. But she could be halfway to China by the time we start looking for her, Forrest bemoaned. Or trapped, hurt, captured, or eaten, added Pax. Predators are awfully hungry this time of year. Thank goodness she can fly, said Dad. We'll just have to pray for her and do our best here. We can't risk the whole herd to a virus for one reindeer, not even Snowflake. There were no arguments to that logic. Their family motto was one for the family and all for the reindeer. They took care of one another, and as a group, they took care of the reindeer. What about the North Pole herd? asked Mom. Dunder was with them too. Christmas magic used to keep the reindeer that lived in Santa's stables healthy. Not once had they had a sick reindeer brought back. Every couple of years they'd bring them down for Doc to give them a checkup, but the food and environment at the North Pole, along with regular exercise, kept them robust. Dunder should have fallen under that umbrella of protection so it was odd that he'd become ill. I don't see how we can ask Faith without telling her about Santa. Caleb rubbed his beard. Do your best. Dad stood up. Let's get the animals fed before it gets too dark. If you have things to do to clear your schedule for vaccine day, then get him done. Caleb put on his winter gear and headed out to the barn. He was in charge of feeding the flyers tonight. They'd alternated chores so no one got bored or felt picked on when they were younger. As they'd grown, they'd stuck to the schedule out of habit and a sense of tradition. As soon as he entered the barn, Rudy bellowed from his stall. I'm coming. Caleb grabbed a scoop of food and dropped it into Rudy's trough. You're all belly lately. Usually, that meant a growth spurt of some kind was coming on. Rudy was coming up on two, so he should be done growing, but stranger things had happened around here, in the last three days alone, than an animal having a late growth spurt. Caleb wasn't going to rule anything out. Next was Galen, 
whose eyes were always just a little too wide in his flight pattern unrecognizable. He was an easy animal to care for, not causing problems in the barn like some reindeer he could name. If only he'd been able to learn the basics of flying a sleigh. Flash pawed at the door. He was a bundle of energy and too fast of a flyer to manage. He got a double scoop of food because his metabolism was so high. When he exercised, they had to clear the other reindeers out of the indoor arena for their own safety. Caleb dished up quickly with Sparkle and headed into Dunder's stall, where he checked to make sure the automatic watering trough worked. Dunder was curled up in the corner, his chin resting on his front legs and his lids heavy with exhaustion. He'd had that look since he'd gotten back. He wasn't getting better, but he wasn't getting worse either. Caleb settled into the hay next to him with his back to the wall. Hey, champ. He reached out and rubbed Dunder's neck. Faith figured out what's going on. She'd going to bring you some meds tomorrow. Dunder breathed out slowly, as if he was saying finally. I know. Sorry it's taken so long. If Doc wasn't sick, we'd have you fixed up by now. You don't mind if I talk your antlers off for a few minutes, do ya? Caleb asked. Dunder rested his chin on Caleb's knee, the weight of it comforting. I'll take that as permission to speak. He absently rubbed behind Dunder's ear as he talked about faith. She doesn't believe in Christmas. Dunder's back leg twitched. I know. It's unthinkable, champ. I think she was hurt, and I'm not sure how to help her heal. Do I stick my nose in where it's not wanted, or do I stand back and pray for a miracle? Dunder cocked his head, asking why it mattered. Because I think she can help us here, but only if we can tell her our secret. If she doesn't believe in Christmas, then. Dunder huffed. I know, it's a conundrum. They sat there for a moment in silence, no answers appearing. Eventually, Dunder fell asleep. Caleb carefully slid out from beneath him and locked the stall door to keep the other reindeer out. He stopped at the doorway, not quite ready to give up the peace that had come while sitting with the patriarch. Lifting his face, he spoke to God. I just need a sign. Something that points me in the right direction. The only answer was the soft snoring from Flash, who sounded like he was racing in his sleep. But he knew his prayer had been heard, because even as he stepped out into the North Dakota cold, the spirit of peace went with him. Chapter 9 Faith glanced down at the pair of skinny jeans and flannel shirt she'd picked up at the Feet Emporium that morning. Between visiting Dad and caring for his patients that didn't have antlers, she was too busy to run back home and pack up some clothes. She'd worn the same scrubs for days on end, washing them each night. By the time she'd pulled into the feed store, she was ready to burn what she had on, she was so sick of seeing it. There wasn't much to choose from in the one circular rack of women's clothing, but beggars couldn't be choosers and all that. Besides, the clothes were warm and soft, so she wasn't going to complain. She bit her lip, wondering what Caleb would think of her new look. Gone was the city vet, and in her places was a country girl. She giggled. The lace-up winter boots did great things for her legs, not. Today wasn't about fashion anyway, she scolded herself. It was about making sure Dunder got healthy. She pulled up outside the barn and left the motor running to keep the heater warm. Dad's truck was old, with a horse blanket thrown across the worn seat to keep the springs from poking her in the butt. She was just pulling out her phone to send Caleb a message that she'd arrived when she saw his tall form coming from the house. She tucked the reindeer medicine inside of her coat to keep it close to her body and therefore warm, before turning off the engine and climbing out. Caleb's welcoming smile took her breath away. 
He wore that dark hat that shaded his eyes and made his jaw look like it belonged on the cover of Hottest Ranchers. Hey, she managed to force out. Good morning. He walked right into her personal space and stared down at her. She grinned up at him, shocked at how happy seeing him made her feel, especially since the two of them didn't really get along. She'd kicked him, twice, and he'd stood up for her. Her chest still warmed at the sense that he was a knight in worn denim. I, uh, she stuttered, wondering when her brain had headed into daydream territory and praying she hadn't said anything out loud. Dunder? He blinked like he'd forgotten she'd come for the reindeer. Yeah, I mean, he's in there. He pointed to the barn. Faith gave herself a solid mental shake. One of them had to rub two brain cells together and start thinking. Great. She plowed ahead. Her movement spurred Caleb into action. Wait. He bounded in front of her and turned so he blocked her path. Let me just make sure everyone is in their stalls. I don't want you stepping those pretty new boots in reindeer poop. Her face heated to a thousand and one degrees. He'd noticed. He noticed her boots and probably her jeans and mostly the fact that she was nervous being out here with him again. She tucked an invisible piece of hair behind her ear and ducked her head. Thanks. He was in and out of the barn in less than ten seconds. The coast is clear. He held the door open as she walked by, her shoulder brushing against his body just because the opening was so small and his chest was so big. Dunder lay in his stall, looking forlorn and forgotten. He huffed a hello. She smiled as she knelt next to him and took his vitals. This time, she'd come prepared with a full vet kit. Morning, handsome. He quirked an eyebrow at her. Don't give me that look. You know you're a beautiful specimen. She glanced over his head to see Caleb smirking at her as he leaned against the doorframe, his arms folded. She could have used the same line on him. What? Nothing. I'm just listening in on your conversation. She ducked her head to hide her smile. I always compliment my patients, believe it or not. What do you say? She stuck her temperature reader inside Dunder's ear. It wasn't the most accurate way to get his temp, but she only needed to know if he was burning up, which she probably could have determined by other means. This gave her a full minute more with Caleb, though, so she waited for the results. It depends on the patient. No one minds hearing they're handsome, though. She used her free hand to scratch under Dunder's chin. A chipmunk, he challenged. She paused to think about her answer. We don't get many chipmunks in our office, but I think I'd tell him his cheeks could hold many nuts. A giraffe? She giggled at the thought of working with a giraffe. Even though she looked down on us all, I was impressed with her humility. A parrot? He lifted an eyebrow in challenge. She rolled her eyes, telling him it was too easy. He's a captivating orator. He eked out a laugh and then schooled his face. A goldfish. Dunder's temp was normal. She cleaned off the orb at the end and then stored it in the bag. She's the queen of the bowl, or tank, as the case may be. She stood up, brushing off her hands. How about a wrangler, he asked. Your ego is as big as Texas, she blurted before thinking. Caleb laughed. He winked at her, and she broke down and laughed too. At least he didn't take himself too seriously. That was refreshing. 
Well, it looks like this guy could use a big dose of meds. She reached into her inside pocket and pulled out the small box with three syringes inside. He'll need one a day for the next three days. Do you think you can give them to him? Caleb was all business now as he made his way around Dunder to stand next to her. Do I need to find a vein, or can I put it in the muscle? Muscle is fine. She knelt down and placed a reassuring hand on Dunder's neck, just above where she was going to insert the needle. Dunder turned his head away as if he couldn't look. Her heart went out to him. He'd been sick for days now. Unlike some animals, he wasn't taking it out on everyone and everything around him. He soldiered on, silently suffering and hoping the humans around him found a way to relive his pain. She wanted to hug him and tell him she was doing her best. Instead, she gave him the shot and then put the needle in the disposal case in her kit. She handed the other two to Caleb. He wrapped his hand around hers and held on. Thank you. Her body lit with awareness, and she was drawn into his intense stare like a tractor beam. She worked to come up with a response that would keep things light between them, because she had the feeling that if she let it get serious, she'd be swallowed up by him. Nothing came to mind. Absolutely nothing. You're welcome. He tucked the medicine in his inside coat pocket and then grinned. Are you hungry? We have a big breakfast inside. She hesitated for only a second. A big family breakfast sounded heavenly. But she'd sworn she wasn't going to let this place into her heart, and so the less time she spent out here, the better. I'd better not. I have other things to do today. Will you thank your mom for the food she put in the fridge, though? It's kept me alive. That sounded bad. I mean, it's delicious, and it's been a lifesaver for me not to have to cook. I will. He stepped back and showed her out. On the way back to the clinic, she pondered Caleb. He was a cowboy through and through, including the confident swagger that drove her insane. But the tender way he cared for the reindeer was something else. Could there be more to him than a cocky grin? And did she dare find out? Because if she did, her life could get real messy real fast. Chapter 10 As soon as the vaccinations arrived Faith made arrangements to go out to Reindeer Wrangler Ranch. Caleb was accommodating but had given her the same warning about not going into the barn by herself. What did he think she was going to do, run off with a reindeer? It was great that he was so protective of the herd, but she wasn't a threat, and it rubbed her the wrong way that he treated her like one. Dad's old pickup had a shell on the back with a heater so she could store the boxes of vaccines back there and they wouldn't ice over. And it had four-wheel drive, which she suspected was a necessity in this neck of the woods. She packed up and headed out when it was still dark and the steering wheel cold as ice. A strange sense of anticipation danced across her skin. It had to be because she was embarking on a big project doing something she loved and not because she was excited to see Caleb and Dunder again. The reindeer responded well to the meds and was on his way to recovery. Caleb had texted her a picture of him standing over the trough the day before. She'd texted him back that Dunder could have a half-feeding. If the food stayed down and the animal stayed up, then Dunder could have the rest an hour later. He'd sent her a thumbs-up emoji. She'd held her phone close for the hour, dying to hear back from him again. Just when she'd been about to give up and take a shower, it had dinged and she'd had a video of Dunder's head in a food trough. He was steady on his feet and eating happily. She could have kissed him. The reindeer, not the wrangler. Definitely the reindeer. 
Sure. And Dunder would take off on Christmas Eve to deliver presents with Santa. Oh, brother. She had been out of the dating scene too long if she was daydreaming about kissing a cowboy. However, once the thought of kissing Caleb entered her head, she had to force it back out again. The Wrangler was off limits. She needed to get this cowboy crush under control. Spending all day with the whole Nicholas clan should take care of any lingering expectations that the family was perfect. Nothing made a person's true colors shine through like handling large animals who didn't want to be handled. She'd seen all types of bad behavior by frustrated owners, everything from excessive use of force to curse words and running scared. Part of her was sad that this would be the end of the charade. It was nice having thoughts of a gentleman to keep her company in her dad's empty house at night. She pictured Caleb lounging on the sofa or washing dishes at the sink. Not that he'd ever get the chance, but the imagining was fun and innocent. Just a stress reliever after worrying about dad's recovery. The sun peeked over the horizon and lit up the world, bouncing off the snow and momentarily blinding her. She groped for sunglasses and flipped down the visor. At least it wasn't snowing. Dad was set to go to the rehab facility tomorrow. She was dead set against it and trying to talk him out of it. That is, until the doctor pulled her aside and explained the kind of care Dad needed. She hoped they'd grow closer while she was in town, but there was no way she was up for bathroom breaks. She'd swallowed her stubborn pride and agreed Dad could go to the rehab facility for two weeks which would bring him home for Christmas. While she was grateful for that, she had mixed emotions about spending the holiday in his house. Growing up, he'd drive out to see her at mom's and they'd go to the diner on the corner for lunch, where he'd give her a few gifts and she'd hand over a card she'd made and they'd eat in silence. The older she got, the more awkward the visits became as she realized how much of her life her dad missed out on. She came upon the large gate welcoming her to the Reindeer Wrangler Ranch. It was made of thick timber and black iron. Where ranches usually hung their brand, Abner had hung a cutout of Santa's sleigh, complete with eight reindeer. She shook her head while fighting off a smile. If you're a reindeer ranch, you gotta brand yourself somehow. Why not use the Christmas icon? As she turned down the lane, her attention was drawn to the layout in the reindeer field. She let out a low whistle as she took in the setup. Temporary paneling had been brought in to make three different sections. The reindeer were crowded into the first one, where their breath puffed up around them and made the area seem magical somehow. There was a chute that led from that pen to the second area, where the shots were administered, and then a fence between the second and third area where the vaccinated animals would gather. The chutes were large enough for Brahmin rodeo bulls with an attitude. Which was a good thing, considering the antlers on some of these cows. The problem was, with all that space, the animals could throw their body weight around, endangering themselves and the people who were trying to help them. Caleb's head came up at the sound of her truck drawing near. She recognized him by the black hat he wore. She wondered if the Wranglers noticed they'd branded themselves with those felt hats in different colors or if they'd done it on purpose. Jack's was chocolate brown, and Drake's was the color of a palomino. Caleb shouted something to the crew, and two men peeled off their tasks and converged on the truck. Caleb opened her door while the guys opened the back hatch. He placed a hand on the top of the cab, trapping her inside and making her heart gallop. You ready to work like an elf? Caleb grinned. She wanted to grab onto his coat and tug him closer. Dang it all, he even smelled good, like laundry soap and fresh air and the earthy smell of animals. Instead, she tightened her grip on the steering wheel. It's going to be a long day. 
over 700 animals should be a multi-day project. And if this was spring and they were tagging newborns, vaccinating, and giving physicals, it would. But she hoped they could finish in a day, even if it wore them all to the bone. The Nicolases had agreed to try. He offered his hand, and she took it to slide out of the cab. Well, we have a fire going and a heated tent to keep your supplies close and at the proper temperature. He pointed to the temporary ice fishing tent that had a stove pipe coming out the top of it. The scent of cedar chips burning laced the air. Caleb's brothers worked to move the hundreds of vaccines packed in padded boxes into the tent. She could tell they were related because they had the same burning gaze and broad shoulders. And over there is our warm food and beverage center. If you need anything, you let me know. He pointed to another tent that had a space heater burning and one side left open. The table inside was covered with insulated slow cookers and coffee pots. Try the cocoa, mom's a genius. He winked and continued leading her along by the hand. She should have pulled away, but the gesture was innocent, like a kid wanting to show off his latest finger painting on the fridge. Only this setup was way more impressive than some color smears. A green John Deere lumbered by with panels skewered by the hay mover. Caleb caught her watching. Those are just in case. We don't like to be caught short. Faith nodded. I can see that. I have to admit I'm impressed with your operation. She felt like they'd set her up for success which was a really nice feeling. How would it be to grow up in a family like this, one that worked together? An ache opened up inside of her, and she rubbed her chest, hoping to get rid of it. We're ready if you are, called Drake as he waved his hat over his head to get their attention. Faith grinned. That kid had a spark inside of him that made her grin, like the little brother she never had. Let me load up my vest and we'll be ready. She headed to the heated tent and, once inside, unzipped her coat. Underneath, she wore a vest with fifty tabs, like pencil holders, where she could keep the needles close to her body and therefore warm. Working in the cold was a challenge, but nothing she wasn't up for. Hopefully, being close to the animals would help keep her fingers warm because she had to take off her gloves to do the work. When she was stocked up, she headed to the chutes. Caleb nodded around the small circle as he made introductions. You met Dad. The man was distinguished, with gray hair cut close and a full beard. His eyes twinkled like vaccinating was his favorite thing to do in the world. He shook her hand, and she felt seen and appreciated all at once. And Jack. I told you about him on the phone. He'd mentioned he had a twin in passing, and she'd stopped him to gather more info. Her interest in genetics wouldn't let it slide. She looked back and forth between the two, noting that they had nearly the same face and builds but different shades of blonde hair. While Caleb seemed to be in charge for the day, she got the feeling that it was only because Jack let him. The two had a definite connection, having whole conversations with a look. And that's Forrest, Pax, and you've met Drake. She'd already guessed who most of them were by gathering information as he dropped it during conversations. Saying things like, I guess Drake can rake something up, or Pax is working the forge, gotta go. Forrest had a twinkle of mischief in his eye, and Pax had a keen look to his eye, like he knew how things worked. Dang, this ranch grew some handsome men. No sisters, she asked. She'd hoped to find another woman out here, for the sake of friendship and solidarity, the Nicola's men were a bit much with all their cowboy swaggers, flannel shirts, and leather gloves. Not a one. Mr. Nicolas hung his head as if he'd failed in life. 
and after these five hooligans, there was no convincing the wife to try again. That's because I'm smarter than you, called a petite lady as she set another warming pot of food on the table and brushed off her gloves. The men chuckled. I'm Anna, and don't you let these boys tease you, ya hear? If they give you any trouble, you let me know. She pointed a finger at her sons, who had the decency to drop their gazes and kick the snow. Faith instantly adored Anna. Though she sounded tough, there was a whole tractor full of adoration for her boys in her eyes. I think I can handle this crew, Faith replied. Anna grinned. I don't doubt it. Work em till they drop, dear. She winked and headed back into the house. Faith faced the wranglers and put her hands on her hips. You heard the lady, let's get to work. They hopped to it so fast it left her blinking in the bright sunlight. She hoped it would warm them up, at least a bit. Everyone had a place. Mr. Nicola's and Caleb were in the chute. Jack worked the gate. Forrest and Pax herded the animals through, and Drake worked at the other end, letting the reindeer out. Faith waited outside the chute near the exit. If you'll push them against the fence, I can put the shot in from here. She had no desire to climb in with the wild animals and let them throw their weight around. Males could weigh up to 400 pounds. Which meant that if they so much as stepped on her foot, they could break a bone. Crushing her between their bodies and the fence was an opportunity they didn't need. Send in the easy ones first, Caleb called to Forrest and Pax. Forrest's face fell. I like a challenge. You might, but I don't want the lady doc to get a bad impression of our herd. Caleb winked at her. She blushed under the nickname Lady Document. They called her Dad Doc, so it was a compliment to them. And the fact that Caleb cared enough to make a good impression was nice. Sometimes on these farm calls, she was treated like the hired help. Comparatively, she was treated like royalty on the reindeer ranch. The first animal trotted into the chute and eyed Caleb and his dad. Mr. Nicola's held out a hand. Hey, Chestnut. The reindeer moved closer and sniffed his hand. Mr. Nicola's used his body to encourage Chestnut closer to the fence. The reindeer didn't seem at all concerned about Faith until she caught a whiff of her scent. Then she whipped her head around and stared at her with wide eyes. It helps if you talk to them. Let them know you're not here to hurt them, Caleb offered. This is highly unusual. Faith stared back at the reindeer, not wanting to make any sudden moves and spook her. So far, the old girl was cautious but calm. You guys could use one of those spare panels to push her over here and hold her in place. Mr. Nicolas shook his head. I'd rather not. This lady trusts me, and I don't want to break that trust. To prove his point, he came over and wrapped both arms around the reindeer's neck. She nuzzled his back. Caleb placed himself in front of Chestnut, right in the way of danger, so he could talk low to Faith. Just try talking to her. Faith huffed. They're reindeer. She said it like she was pointing out the most obvious thing in the world. They don't understand us. Except for Dunder, who had spent enough time with humans to pick up on things. These were herd animals, not barn pets. Caleb's lips disappeared inside his beard as he pressed them together in frustration. Faith glanced up to find the whole family watching her. A growing sense of disappointment filled the air. She puffed out in exasperation. Fine. Moving up to the fence, she wiped on a fake smile. Hello, 
Chestnut. It's nice to meet you. I'm here to give you medicine that will keep you from getting sick this winter. Chestnut didn't move her face, but her eyes darted to Caleb as if asking if this was real. Caleb smiled. It's no worse than bumping into a tree branch. Chestnut looked at Faith again and then slowly lowered her head a fraction. I'm taking that as a go for it. You might want to get out of the way in case she bolts, she warned Caleb. Caleb put his hands on Chestnut's cheeks. She wouldn't hurt me, would you, beautiful? Faith could have sworn the reindeer batted her eyelashes. Sheesh, a reindeer with a crush, she mumbled as she reached through the fence and administered the shot. To her utter amazement, Chestnut only flinched her ear back. Other animals had bucked, reared up, and shuddered dramatically when stuck with a needle. She threw the used syringe into an empty bucket she assumed was there for that very purpose. You did good, Mr. Nicholas told Faith as Chestnut sauntered out of the chute and into the next pen. Faith's cheeks warmed under the praise. It was just a shot. Caleb was busy getting the next reindeer brought in, and she couldn't help but watch him. He moved like a man who could take on the world, unafraid of the unknown. But darn it all, he should be on the front of a romance novel with that swagger. It was much more than that. Abner pulled her attention back to him. She responded to you. Reindeer are good judges of character. I'd trust a reindeer before I'd trust a person. He pushed off the fencing and held his arms out to the next animal as if welcoming him home from a long trip. Captain, you look good. The reindeer snorted like a bull in the pasture and pawed at the ground. Mr. Nicholas pawed with his boot and then burst out laughing. Captain chortled and nudged his belly. Faith shook her head. Are you guys like this with all the reindeer? There were hundreds of them, knowing them by name and personality was impossible. Unless. Unless they were family. Much like her patients who cared for their dogs and their cats like they were members of the family, the Nicholases cared for these animals. Caleb covered his eyes like he was embarrassed by his dad and captain. Those two. I can't take them anywhere. Faith startled herself by laughing. The sound rang out over the open sky and made the reindeer turn to study her. She clamped a hand over her mouth. Sorry. Caleb grinned, placing his hand over his chest. Don't be. I think you stopped my world just now. She ducked her head and tucked her hair behind her ear. Why did he have to say stuff like that? She had no way to protect herself from the onslaught of heat that filled her from her lower belly on up. Captain appeared in her periphery vision and she took a page out of Caleb's How to Charm a Reindeer book. Well, aren't you handsome and strong? Captain bobbed his head. Faith giggled as she gave him the shot. Then she patted his neck. He leaned into her hand before trotting out of the pen to join Chestnut, who looked like she was tired of his macho ways. This vaccination was unlike any she'd been a part of before and she found herself eager to meet the next reindeer. Part of her argued that this wasn't normal, that animals didn't behave like this and that wranglers weren't the gentlemen they professed to be. But there was no arguing with what was right before her eyes. These reindeer were special. They not only understood what people said, but they spoke back in their own ways. A lift on an eyebrow. A cock of the head. A nudge of the nose. It was like learning a whole new magical language. It wasn't long before she had to go refill her vest. Caleb met her at the tent door with a mug of steaming hot chocolate. Take a second and warm up your fingers. 
She wrapped them around the mug, thank you. I didn't realize how cold they were. I know. It sneaks up on you. He tucked his hands in his coat pocket and considered her. She blew across the top of the mug before taking a tentative sip. It was perfect, warm and with enough chocolate to fill her up. What? You're having fun. He stated it like a question. Faith took stock of the light feeling she had and the satisfaction of doing work she loved. She lifted a shoulder. I am. Caleb cocked a grin. Why? She rolled her eyes. Well, it's not because of you, if that's what you're thinking. She pushed past him and headed to the food tent to put down her cup. Caleb's laughter followed behind, nipping at her coat and making her giggle to herself. Maybe part of it was because of him. He was called away to help with something, and she continued on without him. Caleb and his family were unlike any family she'd ever known. She stopped short and stared out over the ranch. Is everything okay? asked Mr. Nicholas from where he ladled himself a mug of cocoa. I just figured it out. She turned to him. How you all get along and everything is so perfect here. His eyebrows shot up. It's the reindeer. The eyebrows slowly lowered as if he wasn't sure where she was going with this. Faith hurried to explain. You all have the same vision of caring for the reindeer and put that above all else, even yourselves. It's always about the good of the reindeer, and that in turn creates harmony. It made so much sense as to why her father chose this place over his family. He couldn't get this kind of dedication and purpose at home, so he spent his time on the ranch. Mr. Nicholas contemplated the contents of his cup. You're close. Family is most important, and in turn, the family takes care of the reindeer. I'd give all this away for any of my kids. Her shoulders fell. Not my dad. He gave me up for this. She swallowed down the bitter taste in her mouth. Mr. Nicola sighed. I don't think the explanation for what happened with your parents is all that easy. In my experience, it takes both partners giving 100% to make it work. She waited, hoping he would expound, because she had more questions about the past than she had answers. He replaced the lid on the cocoa. People are complicated. There's more to the story, have you asked your mother why she left? Or your dad why he stayed? She snorted and thumped her mug on the table. Mom's told me plenty of times that dad cared more about the reindeer than he did us. Mr. Nicholas frowned. I'd like to think the very best of my friend and defend him in this, but I'm pretty sure he got caught up in what goes on out here and didn't bring your mother along. He could have, you know, we wouldn't have kept her away. So why didn't he? That's something you'll have to ask him. Mr. Nicholas drew in a sharp breath, as if screwing up his courage but I'll bet you he cared about you the most. I couldn't spend more than three minutes with the man before he was bragging on you. I don't know that person. Maybe it's time you did. He gave her a side hug to soften the blow his words inflicted. Looks like our break is over. You ready? She nodded. She was more than ready to get to the bottom of things with her dad and to help these reindeer. She could use some more of their antics to cheer her up and cheer her on. By the end of today, she'd have a lot to talk to her father about. She just hoped she could get to the important stuff, because it was easy to talk about reindeer, not so easy to talk about the hurts of her heart. Chapter 11 
muscles that didn't get used all the time complained as Caleb let the last reindeer out of the chute. Sugar, who was ironically named because there was nothing about that reindeer that was sweet, flicked her tail as she walked past. He would have tugged her ear in response like a twelve-year-old, but he was beyond those kinds of tricks. Sugar loved to pull out the worst in people. It was almost like she knew she'd been passed up as a Santa reindeer, so she was determined to be on the naughty list. Mom always said to give her some slack because it wasn't her fault she couldn't fly. Dad would point out that less than 1% of the herd could fly and the rest of them weren't sourpusses like sugar. It was an ongoing debate between the two of them, and Caleb opted to stay out of it. That just leaves the reindeer in the barn. Dad walked hunched over and bow-legged, like he'd pulled that muscle in his back again. Probably needed a good hot bath and some time in his massage chair to work it out. Faith opened her coat and counted the syringes she had left in that nifty vest of hers. I'll take Faith in, Caleb volunteered. The reindeer had been put in their short stalls that morning to keep them from flying all over the place. They liked to let them have the run of the barn, even if it meant a clean-up job, because a flying reindeer was happier when they could climb the walls. Since Faith wasn't on the Santa-approved list, they'd taken precautions. Hey now. Forrest lifted a gloved hand. His cheeks were rosy from the cold, and his eyes were bright. How about you quit hogging the new lady dog to yourself and let some of the rest of us get to know her? He winked at Faith, who stared at him with an open mouth. Caleb longed to reach over and lift her jaw, but he kept his hands to himself and glared at his brother. I think you have some panels to clean up. Forrest laughed. I'm just messing with you. Thanks for your expertise today, Faith. I appreciate you, even if my lunkhead brother doesn't. He clipped Caleb on the shoulder and danced out of the way in case Caleb came back swinging. Caleb did not. Retaliation only fueled Forrest's teasing. Yes, thank you Faith. We couldn't have done this without you, and we're grateful you caught the sickness before it spread to the whole herd. Dad patted Faith on the back and then made his way toward the house, leaving the cleanup for the younger generation. They'd done it. All seven hundred reindeer in one long day. Caleb watched Dad lumber along. Faith came to stand beside him. I really like him. Caleb glanced down to see her watching Dad too. What's not to like? He shook his head. I forget how old he's getting. And then on days like today it hits me between the eyes. He used to outwork us all, but now he has a thing in his back. He waved his hand. Sorry, you don't want to hear our problems. He motioned for them to head to the barn, and they started off. It wasn't a long walk but it felt good to work out his tight muscles. Faith twisted her lips. Honestly, it's good to know you have problems. You're happy we have problems, that's not very Christian of you, he lightly scolded. No. That's not at all what I meant. She swatted his arm. You all seem so perfect that I'd believe nothing bad ever happens here. You do realize the whole reason you're here is to prevent something very bad from happening. He pushed open the barn door and shoved his head inside, looking up to make sure no one had gotten out of their stalls. The coast was clear, so he shoved the door the rest of the way and stepped back so Faith could go in first. I know. I know. She stepped past him, and he caught a whiff of cinnamon and chocolate. The chocolate was probably from the four cups of cocoa she drunk to stay warm, but the cinnamon? That was all her, and he wanted to know if it was a lotion or maybe a shampoo. He'd love to run his fingers through her hair and find out. He shook his head at himself. Where were all these romantic notions coming from, anyway? 
He wasn't the type of guy to go all soft for a woman, he never had been before, and he didn't plan to be now. There was just something about Faith that got to his sensitive side. He leaned against Dunder's stall as she gave him a checkup. Her earlier apprehension about being close to the reindeer was gone. Dunder was one of their largest, if not the largest reindeers on the ranch, and his ever-present antlers were intimidating. Faith didn't seem to notice. She walked in with one hand out, which she used to touch Dunder's neck and then move up to scratch behind his ears. He leaned into her touch. I think he likes you. Of course he likes me. She ran both hands down Dunder's neck and then gave him a light hug. We've bonded, right, handsome? Dunder winked in response, making her laugh. That sound. Caleb's hand went to his chest to stop his heart from leaping out. If he could combine the sounds of church bells ringing on Christmas Eve, with the bubbling of a brook, and the giggle of a child on Santa's lap, he might come close to Faith's laughter. Nothing was quite like the effect it had on him. He was all upside down and sideways because of it. While he was trying to get his head on straight Faith tested Dunder's temperature and looked in his ears and eyes. The animal stayed still for her exam. When she was done, he nudged her pocket. What is that? she asked Caleb. He's looking for a treat. Doc would bring him a carrot or an apple when he checked him over. She rolled her eyes. Sorry. I don't have anything. I got you. Caleb hurried into the tack room and came back with an oat bar. What is this? She eyed it like it was a rogue doggy treat. Oat bar, he replied. Mom makes them with organic ingredients. They have dried apples and oats. The reindeer like them. He nodded for her to give it to Dunder. She put the treat on her flat hand and moved it under Dunder's snout. He sniffed and then used his lips to pick up the bar, so he didn't bite her. Faith gave him a goodbye hug and made her way out of the stall. He's looking really good. Do you think he'll be a hundred percent by Christmas Eve? Caleb hadn't checked in with the Kringles. They had their solid eight reindeer for the big sled, but Dunder was second string. He might be getting on in years, but he still had some flight left in him. Why, does he need to pull a sleigh? Faith lifted an eyebrow and her eyes glinted with challenge. Caleb paused. This could be his opening. He could tell her all about the magical reindeer that really flew and moved to the North Pole to train with Santa's elves. Letting her in on the secret would be so easy. What would you say if I said yes? She put a hand on her hip. I'd say the kids in town were pretty lucky to have Santa ride past their house every Christmas Eve. Your family makes things pretty amazing for them. I wish I had those kinds of memories from my childhood. His heart sank at the bitterness that laced her tone like powdered sugar on crinkle cookies. Don't you have any happy Santa memories? Caleb moved over to Rudy's stall and opened the door. Faith stood outside. I have the regular ones, waking up on Christmas morning to a pile of presents and such, writing my letter. She frowned. I even asked Santa to get my parents back together one year. Probably the first year they split. Can you imagine? He glanced down, taking in the parentheses around her frown. Hey. He spoke low and stepped into her space, noticing once again the sweet combination of flavors she presented. It's totally natural for a kid. They make movies about those kids and their feelings and wishes. She barked out a laugh. I'm pretty sure you never watched The Parent Trap. He wrinkled his nose. Of course not. What kind of man would I be if I'd rooted for Mitch and Maggie to patch things up? Ah. Uh. She tugged once on the front of his coat. 
Stop, don't even let me think you're that wonderful. Okay. I won't let you think it. He shrugged and stepped back, immediately missing her nearness. Theirs was a dance of closeness balanced with time apart. They'd been stepping through it all day long, and he wasn't about to break pattern for fear she'd leave him alone on the dance floor. Faith purposefully turned her attention on Rudy and held her hand out for the reindeer to sniff. Hey, Rudy. Do you remember me? Rudy approached slowly, as if he wasn't sure what he was headed for. Caleb's heart went out to the animal. It couldn't be easy not being able to see. Rudy got closer to Faith, sniffing loudly. Faith spoke out of the corner of her mouth. I wish I had another one of those oat bars. Caleb chuckled, which brought Rudy's head around his direction. You're okay, aren't you, tough guy? Rudy eased toward him as Caleb spoke, following his voice. Faith huffed in displeasure. It's only because he knows me better. We've spent a lot of time together, haven't we, fella? Scratching the top of Rudy's head made his back leg thump. He made a circle around Caleb and then around Faith, sniffing her and bumping her as if testing her size and weight. She tried to keep her feet, but Rudy's backside hit her hip and she tripped into Caleb's side. He reached out to steady her. You okay? She nodded. He's not trying to hurt me. Caleb's smile was warm and all too revealing of the way his heart galloped. I'm glad you noticed. She glanced down at where her hands rested on his arm, and she blinked as if realizing that she was still holding him. She yanked her hands down to her sides. Have you given any more thought to surgery? She pulled out a small flashlight and waved it in Rudy's eyes. Stepping closer to him, she spoke in low tones as she gave him a once-over. Caleb watched her every move, amazed at her sureness and knowledge. We talked about it, and we are good to go whenever you are. The only catch is that one of us will have stay at the clinic. Faith jerked upright and Rudy Stutter stepped backward at her sudden movement. You can't stay at the clinic, it's part of the house. Caleb tucked his hands into his jean pockets. We've done it before. Yeah, but that was with Dad, I mean, you and I can't, her face turned red. Rudy brushed his red nose against her back, pushing her closer to Caleb. Caleb appreciated the reindeer's help, but he didn't need a wingman on this. Rudy started to lift off. Caleb panicked and lunged for him, using his body weight to hold the reindeer down. Haven't you ever had a sleepover? Caleb wiggled his eyebrows at Faith to take her mind off of his strange behavior. Leaning against a reindeer wasn't exactly normal, but he had no other choice, as Rudy seemed determined to get his hooves off the ground. No. Faith groused. Caleb considered her double meaning and liked her all the more for it. He threw an arm over the back of the deer and kicked one leg out. I promise I'll be on my best behavior. You can lock me in the clinic with Rudy. Faith considered him. I might just take you up on that. Working with Rudy while he held the deer still Faith was able to give him the shot. Caleb racked his brain for a way to make this work. Obviously, Rudy couldn't be trusted to ground himself and needed a babysitter. But he also needed the surgery, and the North Pole needed him. He had the right temperament to be one of Santa's reindeer. They didn't really know if he had the speed, because they'd never been able to let him fly at his full potential because of his eyes. Getting even one more reindeer up north would make a big difference. Technically, Mom could go with Rudy, but she was needed here. Dad might spend a lot of time in the office, but Mom was the brains behind the business. She kept their government permits in order and applied for grants that allowed them to do things like give high-quality veterinary care to the animals, including elective surgeries. 
any of his brothers were out of the question. Jack would see how wonderful Faith was and fall for her himself. Forrest would do his best to spill all of Caleb's most embarrassing moments, including video. Pax would speak little and probably be okay, but he would hate the assignment. And Drake was too young to be trusted with a reindeer off the ranch. He was trying, though, bless his heart. An idea struck, and Caleb spoke before he thought it through. Why don't you talk to Doc about it and see what he thinks? If he trusts me in his house, then maybe you can too. Faith stepped closer and looked up at him, her colored dollar eyes luminous in the dimming daylight. I'll do that. Thanks for understanding. Words. He needed words. Gulping, his mouth dry and his throat tight, he nodded. Faith slipped out of the stall and headed for Sparkle's stall next. Caleb stared after her. He glanced down to find Rudy watching him. This close up, he could probably make out Caleb's confusion. I hope you can keep a level head around her, because I'm struggling. Rudy shook his head, making his ears flap against his cheeks. Caleb chuckled, rubbed his head, and locked the stall. Stay on your feet, he hissed over the door. Rudy gave him a look that said, I will if you will. Yeah, well, that's the trick, isn't it? Caleb. Faith called. Coming. He hurried in, hoping Sparkle wasn't hovering off the ground. That was all they needed, a reindeer to out them. Gaining Faith's trust proved hard enough with regular reindeer, he could only imagine what flying ones would add to the situation. Chapter 12 Cardstock stocking cutouts lined the wall of the rehab center, sporting names in glitter, sharpie, and crayon. Faith wondered if each resident and worker signed their own or if a good Samaritan from the community had come in and decorated for the holidays. Gold tinsel garlands swooped between the stockings and added a garish festiveness to the otherwise sad decor. A ball of anger grew inside of Faith. This was what her father preferred over coming home with her. Bathroom breaks, she mumbled to herself as a reminder of why she should not be upset. Dad was doing her a favor by being here, even if it felt like another rejection. She turned a corner, noting the Charlie Brown tree with multicolored lights and no ornaments. The saddest part about the whole thing was that it wasn't even a real tree someone had felt sorry for, it was fake. Her dad must be miserable. He loved Christmas with the eagerness of a little boy waiting for his first bike. The sound of dad's laughter met her in the hallway and directed her to his room. He was sitting up in a hospital bed, wearing red flannel pajamas and watching Elf. Faith grinned as he cracked up over Buddy jumping across mattresses in the department store. Do you ever get tired of this show? Dad's eyebrows rocketed upward. Baby girl. He held out his arm, pointing to the screen. This is a classic. I watch it every December and it gets better and better. They say laughter is the best medicine. She laid her coat over a chair by the door and took in her dad's new digs. There was a large window with the shade drawn so the light didn't bleach out the television picture. The bed wasn't anything special, except that it had a rail to keep dad from falling out like a toddler. The blanket was light blue, and the walls were cream. He had a dresser and a nightstand and didn't have to share with anyone. All in all, it wasn't a bad situation for him to recoup. Not only did he get three warm meals a day, he had a standing appointment with a physical therapist, control of the remote, and a nurse to check in on him. She took a deep breath and let the remaining resentment against her father for picking this place float away and disappear. He was in the best place for him right now. She had to be here to see that but that was her issue, not his. 
The bigger problem was letting go of her own pride and expectations. Ha! Huh. How many times had she expected something out of her dad and he'd let her down? She didn't know, nor could she come up with a number. She did have a number for how many times she'd told him about her expectations, zero. The man was an only child. How would he know what a daughter expected of her dad? She rubbed her forehead. The revelations were just pouring in this holiday season. You okay? Dad asked. She dropped her hand and sat on the edge of his bed. Better than I deserve. We inoculated the reindeer yesterday against the flu Dunder has. Dad's eyes lit up and he sat up taller. Turning off the television, he folded his hands in his lap and asked, Tell me about it? His interest was too intense, and she leaned back. It went fine. The animals aren't what I expected. Dad slapped his leg as he laughed. She grinned. I know. You've been telling me for years there's something special. I just didn't expect so much personality. Moving up on the mattress edge, she talked with her hands as she described the way apples planted his front hooves and shook his head until Caleb bribed him with an apple. I couldn't believe that he'd had this apple in his pocket the whole time, like he expected to run into this problem. Dad tapped the side of his nose. The reindeer is named Apples for a reason. She laughed, tipping her head back. I guess I should have seen it coming. I thought it was because of his red pelt. Dad chuckled. She settled back into place. I think this is the best conversation we've ever had. He patted her hand. I wish it had happened years ago. Why didn't it? She glanced down at their hands. Why didn't you tell me about them, all of them? She didn't like the accusation in her voice but wasn't sure what to do about it. He sighed heavily and his body sank into the mattress as if she'd laid a heavy burden on his chest. I tried. She thought back to his phone calls, the short times they'd spent together at the diner. No, you didn't. I don't remember you ever telling me about Dunder or Sparkle or McJingles. The reindeer who liked to wear bells and pull the sleigh around town had pranced into the chute like he was a dandy ready for grooming. A compliment on his regal bearing got her anything she wanted from the pretentious stud. Dad patted her hand absently. Reindeer were a sore spot in our conversations. Faith bit her lip, not wanting to say anything bad about her mother, who'd sacrificed so much for her, but she needed to understand. Mom hated the reindeer, she said you chose them over us. Dad ran his hand down his face. There are two sides to that statement. Yes, I liked being on the ranch, it was a good place to get away from your mom. She thought marrying a veterinarian was her ticket to Easy Street. Faith scoffed. She made a comfortable living, enough to support a family, but not the kind of money that would set her free financially. A memory popped up. She didn't want me to be a vet, said it was a dead end. It was only after you offered to pay tuition that she relented. She said the student loans would have overloaded me. She's right. I was still trying to dig my way out from under them when she left. Faith slouched. I'm still not sure Mom's attitude was enough to abandon us over. You think I abandoned you? Dad's face grew red. I fought tooth and nail for custody, but fathers didn't have the same rights back then and the money for lawyers ran out real fast. Dad turned his hand over and held on to hers like it was a lifeline. I did the best I could, even knowing your mother was probably poisoning you against me. It tore me up. 
Faith worked to fit this version of her life's history in with what she already knew, what she'd lived. You never said a bad word about mom. I always felt like you just gave up. You had enough negative things in your life. I didn't want to be one of them. Tears threatened, and Faith did her best to hold them back, though she failed and had to wipe them away. I was so mean to you. Dad tugged her hand until she was in his arms. I never felt that, baby girl. I just loved you and loved you. She sniffed into his red flannel shirt. We're a mess. He chuckled. That we are. He squeezed her and then pushed her back to sitting up. One look at her face had him groping for the Kleenexes on the nightstand. Here, you're flooding the place. She hiccuped a laugh and did her best to wipe away the mascara running down her cheeks. Dad hemmed and hawed for a moment, like a man who didn't know what to do when a woman cried. Faith chuckled at his discomfort. He groped for a topic to change the conversation. Tell me about Rudy. I have this vague memory of you saying you're going to perform surgery on him. She nodded. This was something she was happy to talk about. I think I can help him. It's an elective surgery, though, the cost. Dad swatted away her concern. The Wranglers can afford it, don't worry about that. She frowned. And Caleb says he has to stay at the house with the animal. I'm not sure how I feel about that, mistrusted, that they won't leave their animal in my care. Dad squinted. You've seen these reindeer and the bond they have with the wranglers. She twisted the tissue. I thought reindeer games were just in songs and fairy tales, but they played soccer with them. Well, a version of soccer, anyway. She'd never forget the spirited game and the wranglers kicking a ball in their cowboy boots and trying not to slip all over the compacted snow while the reindeer returned it right back to them. There wasn't a goal, it was more about passing the ball around during their lunch break than scoring points. Dad laughed heartily. That's always a good time. You should see what they can do with a frisbee. She smiled warmly. I'd like that. Hugging herself, she continued. The ranch is magical. I don't know any other words to explain it. Dad opened his mouth and then shut it quickly. He looked at the blanket and then at the ceiling, battling something internally. Faith waited him out. Finally, he shook his head. They might not trust you. She jerked back. But it's not them. It's you, baby girl. Me, she pointed to her chest. What did I ever do to them? He scratched at his cheek, covered in a week's worth of whiskers. If you're going to be a part of Reindeer Ranch, you have to believe in the magic, all of it. Like what, Santa? She snorted. Yes. The seriousness to his tone washed away her quick, sarcastic remark. You're telling me that those cowboys, with their felt hats and thick flannel shirts and beards, believe in Santa Claus? He held her gaze. You want me to believe in Santa Claus? She shoved off the seat and began pacing. Do you have any idea how crazy that sounds? He laughed, stopping her in her tracks, you bet I do. But it's the only way. If you don't believe, you'll never earn the Wrangler's trust. She folded her arms and sat down with a grunt. I'm a grown woman. Dad grinned. Which is the other reason you don't want Caleb at the house overnight? Hey! She swatted at his leg, making him burst into belly laughs. You've got it bad for the Wrangler, 
don't ya? Faith's face burned, and she pressed her cold fingers against her cheeks to cool down. I'm not in love with him, if that's what you think. But ya like him. She nodded slowly as she mulled over the feelings in her heart. I respect him. Which goes a long way with me. And he respects me. When I'm looking at a reindeer, he doesn't try and tell me what I should be doing. I get plenty of that from old-time ranchers and farmers. They think that because I'm young, and a woman, I don't know what I'm doing. Don't get your hackles up. I know you're more than qualified and capable. Faith hadn't realized how tightly her hands fisted until Dad told her to calm down. I might have a chip on my shoulder about that. Dad chuckled. I don't blame ya. You're in a male-dominated field, and a lot of these old-timers, he said with a wink, come from a different era. Not the Wranglers, though. All of them listened to me. Even when she told Mr. Nicholas he was treating a hoof wound on one of the reindeer with an older technique, he'd listened intently. She'd half expected him to dig in his heels and tell her he'd dressed wounds that weigh for thirty years and it worked just fine. But he didn't. He took what she said to heart and made the change right there. The experience made her feel valued and a part of the team. Dad patted her hand. Of course they did. Because you're smart and they recognized it. Heck, I've been telling them for years that you have a better head on your shoulder than I ever did. Dad laid his arms across his chest. He took in a deep breath. He was growing bags under his eyes as they spoke. It was time for Faith to leave so he could rest. She stood next to the bed, not remembering the last time she'd hugged her father. Goodbye. Leaning over, she pecked a kiss to his cheek. Don't give the nurses too much grief, okay? He smiled softly. Try to believe in something, or someone. I'll think about it. She squeezed his hand and then gathered her purse and coat from the chair by the door. Dad was already starting to doze off. Taking him in, she wondered when he'd gotten so old. Maybe it was the heart attack, but he didn't seem like the indomitable force she'd always known. His shoulders were thinner, as was his gray hair. Her heartstrings tugged, and a thread of worry worked its way into her thoughts. Would he be able to come back to the practice? Not in the shape he was in right now. He wouldn't have lasted twenty minutes in the field doing vaccinations, let alone the whole day. What would that do to the reindeer ranch? Merry Christmas, offered a nurse as she pushed a med cart down the hallway. Merry Christmas, Faith responded. She stopped and stared at the stocking with her dad's name on it. It had glitter polka dots, which he'd probably think was fun. She reached out and ran her hand along the rough surface. Seemed everyone was in the holiday mood but her. Believe in Santa? Not likely. But she could help out a reindeer in need. That was the Christian thing to do. And she'd donate her time to keep the bill down. Her cheeks tugged wanting to smile at the thought. Yeah, helping Rudy see well would be her Christmas gift to the reindeer and to the ranch. She pulled out her phone and dialed Caleb's number. It was at the top of her recent calls list. Funny, but her partner hadn't checked in for a couple days. Neither had she. She'd have to make that call next. Merry Christmas. Caleb answered the phone. She rolled her eyes even as her stomach made the same happy motion. It's me. I know, your name came up on my caller ID. Right. Her skin felt like it sparkled like the glitter on the stocking at the sound of his deep voice coming through her phone. 
She hadn't realized how much she missed being with him until right then. She'd been okay, and then, wham. All she wanted to do was see his blue, blue eyes and walk around the barn together. Right. She'd already said that. I talked to Dad, and he's fine with you staying at the clinic, so whenever you're ready to. How about tomorrow? She pulled the phone back to look at it in shock, then scrambled to get it back to her cheek. W. What's the rush? She thought she would have a couple days to mentally prepare herself for sleeping under the same roof as Caleb. It's thirteen days until Christmas. If Rudy is going to be ready, we need to get started. The Main Street Parade, right? She ran a hand through her hair. All right. I guess tomorrow will work. I'll have the surgery room prepped by noon. Great. And Faith? Yeah, thank you. You have no idea what this means to Christmas. She felt like she was in a river, trying to swim upstream against a current of Christmas lovers. Yeah, well, Christmas can thank me when Rudy is all better. I wouldn't mind thanking you then either. His tone was low and intimate, brushing over her like a caress. She leaned against the wall for support. Her knees were all about letting this wrangler have his way with them, thankfully, the rest of her had a little more sense. I'm interested. She managed to sound as if she were light and flirty, even though she was breathing heavy and sweating in her hoodie and jeans. He chuckled. It's a date. I'll see you tomorrow. She said, goodbye, and hung up. Or maybe she'd only said it in her head because she was all kerboppled over the promise in Caleb's flirting. What did her dad say? That she had it bad for the wrangler? Maybe she did. The question was, what was she going to do about it? Chapter 13 Caleb hung up the phone and threw both arms over his head. Yes. Mom startled at the stove and clutched her heart. What in the world? Are you trying to give me a heart attack? No way. You're too young for that. He kicked off his boots and crossed the kitchen to give Mom a side hug while she stirred gravy on the stove. Something smells good. You're not getting any. She elbowed him in the belly, still sore that he'd startled her. Caleb wrapped her up and swung side to side. I just talked to Faith. Rudy is on the schedule for surgery tomorrow. Whoop. Mom hugged him back. She never held a grudge for long, and hugs were her currency. That's great news. It is, if it works. He dipped a finger in the steaming gravy and sampled. Hmm, needs more pepper. She gently shoved him away and used a spoon to taste it herself. Without admitting he was right, she sprinkled pepper over the top. Is there a chance the surgery won't take? He shrugged. I'm not sure. Faith seems to think it'll do the trick. Don't tell her or Doc I said this, but she's smarter than he is. Mom zipped her fingers over her lips, but there was an interest in her eye that said she was listening to things he didn't mean to say, specifically, how much he liked Faith. This was uneven ground with Mom. If she thought there was a chance of a wedding in the future, she'd be all over him. It's too bad she doesn't believe in Santa. He kept his head down but watched Mom out of the side of his eye for a reaction. If she did, she'd be an asset to the ranch. Rudy almost flew in front of her yesterday, and it was all I could do to keep her from seeing him. He shook his head at the memory. Mom stirred faster. You realize that Rudy could be headed to the North Pole after this? He jerked his head up to stare at her. 
No, the word came out like a weak westerly wind. Yes. She banged the wooden spoon on the side of the pan and set it on the spoon rest. He's only almost two, and he's our best prospect. Stella might be able to handle Flash. The almost black reindeer was named after the superhero that moved faster than light. Mom scoffed. She'd think she could handle him. He folded his arms and leaned a hip against the counter. You never liked Stella, did you? Mom's mouth fell open, and then she snapped it shut. I would never say such a thing. You don't have to say it. He was baiting her, but he'd always wondered about Mom's complicated relationship with the Kringle girl. It was like she didn't want to let herself like Stella too much, just enough to stay on the good list. After that, it was a battle to get along with her. Mom snatched up the wooden spoon and shook it at him. She didn't know what a good thing she had when she had you. Ah, uh, so that was it. Mom, you and I both know Stella and I would have killed each other. Our personalities were not a good fit. He'd crushed hard on the magical Christmas girl for a couple of summers before working up his courage to kiss her. They'd had a great couple of weeks, until reality set in. Stella was a firecracker, and he was a... Well, he was steady and solid and not into explosions of any kind. Maybe, but you struggled when she left that fall. I didn't like seeing you so unsure of yourself. I was unsure because I thought I'd had it all figured out. He'd daydreamed about getting to live in the ice castle he'd only ever heard about. Not to mention the elves he knew by name but had never seen. I missed out on becoming a Kringle more than I missed Stella. He stared off. I really thought I'd get to see the North Pole for myself one day. Mom patted his cheek, bringing his gaze back to their well-worn and much-loved kitchen. He sat down at the table. But we were talking about reindeer. Her eyes softened. Rudy's the best shot we have. I don't, her voice caught, and she had to clear her throat. I don't know what will happen to your father if we don't get any more flyers. You're worried about dad. Mom, come on. There's a whole world of children out there writing letters to Santa as we speak, and you're worried about what this would do to dad. He swept his arm out to the side and then back again. Mom went back to stirring her gravy. Of course I'm worried about Abner. One day, when you fall in love, you'll be more worried about your wife than your reindeer, that's how you know she's the mother of my grandchildren. She winked at him. He pushed off the counter with his hip. I know where this conversation is headed, and I want nothing to do with it. Love you, though. Caleb, wait. Mom wiped her hands on her candy cane apron before ushering him back to the table. What? She twisted her apron in front of her. I know you like Faith, but I want to caution you against getting too close to her. If she doesn't believe in Christmas, then she's not long for the ranch. I don't want you to lose your heart. I'll be fine. He made to stand, but she held him in place with a heavy hand on his shoulder. You'll be a gentleman while you're there. He would have scoffed and rolled his eyes, but his mom's caution came from a place of love. Always. Good. Good. She stepped back and smoothed the apron. She needs to keep her feelings for Christmas separate from her feelings for you. Caleb blinked. What do you mean by that? Mom frowned. Doc opened up to me and Abner one night during a difficult delivery. Faith tied Christmas to her dad and never forgave either of them for letting her down. Caleb rubbed his jaw. That was interesting. Doc was working on his relationship with Faith, maybe Caleb should work on her relationship with Christmas. If she could just believe, then he could fall in love with her. 
It wouldn't be all that hard, really, to give his heart free rein and watch it soar. But there wasn't a thing he could do about it if she closed herself off to the magic. He stood and set his hat on his head. There had to be a way to bring holiday cheer to a Scrooge, and he was going to find it. Thanks for the talk, Mom. Anytime. She waved as he pushed out the door, greeted by a frosty wind. Wahoo! Forrest yelled as the parade sleigh blurred past the house. Dad trailed behind in the side-by-side. -side. Slow down. You're going too fast for the bells. Caleb tipped his head to listen, and indeed, the sleigh bells weren't jingling. He shook his head. This was his crazy, Christmas-centered life. No wonder his mom was worried. It would take a special woman to put up with the Nicola's men. Heck, he'd settle for someone who could put up with him. Shoving his hat lower against the wind, he trudged out to the barn to get Sparkle for her nightly workout. Chapter 14 Caleb looked over Rudy's prone form, secured to the table with leather restraints. His chest went up and down, and Caleb's did the same, as if willing the reindeer to keep breathing. Seeing Rudy this helpless was difficult. With any surgery, there were risks, and Faith had outlined them all for Caleb in excruciating detail as he'd signed release forms. Faith looked through a set of magnifying glasses and she maneuvered instruments with skill. A line of concentration graced her forehead, making her look older than she was but also giving her an air of wisdom. He wondered if she hated that line or if she even knew it existed. She set down the glasses and began wrapping Rudy's eyes and face with cotton pads and gauze. It was hard work, the reindeer wasn't light, and a line of perspiration appeared at her temple. Caleb longed to wipe it away for her, but she'd been skittish all afternoon, keeping distance between the two of them. He didn't want to get in her way or make her more nervous about the surgery, so he'd stepped back and hadn't flirted with her. Hopefully, once the surgery was over, she'd calm down a little and they'd be able to enjoy each other's company. If not, it was going to be a long 48 hours. There, Faith whispered. They'd both taken to talking softly as Rudy fell asleep. Faith pushed aside the tray of supplies and changed the drip on Rudy's fore. He should wake up soon. Maybe you should be up here so he can smell you and doesn't panic. Caleb rounded the table, bringing him next to Faith. She smelled of cinnamon, and home, again. He mentally shook himself. Keep it together. Talk to him, Faith encouraged. He likes you. She smiled under her mask, and her eyes crinkled. He leaned his forearms on the operating table and spoke to Rudy. Hey, buddy. You in there? Surgery went well, he glanced up at Faith for confirmation. She met his eyes, and his whole body zinged. I'll tell you more when he's all settled. She jerked her head to the large kennel he'd brought. Inside was fresh hay and a plaid blanket mom insisted Rudy would want to sleep on. The whole family waited on pins and needles to hear how surgery went. It was as tense around the place as foaling season. Rudy, he whispered. Come on, dude. Can you twitch a leg or something? With the animal's eyes covered, there was no way to know if he was waking up. Rudy. Rudy's red nose twitched, and he let out a sad groan sounding like a drunk who was dealing with a New Year's hangover. Faith was at Caleb's elbow before he could call for her. She ran her hand over Rudy's head and then took his temperature. His vitals are good. He probably wants to be more comfortable. It's a reindeer's nature to try and stand. Do you think you can carry him to the kennel? Caleb glanced down at his arm and flexed. Faith rolled her eyes and muttered under her mask. 
He grinned, thankful she was more open to teasing now. They began unlatching the straps. Faith looked at him out of the corner of her eye, and Caleb nudged her with his elbow. Her eyes crinkled again, and he reached over to brush a stray piece of hair off her forehead. She'd pulled it all back into a bun at the base of her neck, but some of it rebelled. She turned toward him, her hands stilling and her intensity increasing. He felt it, felt the moment that she'd locked on him, and he wanted to hold on to that moment forever. Being the only thing in her whole world was an amazing feeling. His mouth went dry and his hands moistened while his heart triple-stepped. The only other time he'd ever felt like this was when he was flying a sleigh. Something brown moved in his periphery, and his brain clicked on. Rudy was floating, flying, above the table. Caleb grabbed Faith's upper arms and turned her back to the reindeer. She gasped, splaying her hands on his chest. He gulped. He couldn't breathe with Faith pressed against his chest, even if it was his arms holding her there. Looking at Rudy was out of the question if he wanted to keep Faith from seeing the reindeer hovering over the table like a magician's assistant, without the white sheet that hid the wires. Caleb, she asked. How do women do that, he marveled. Do what? Ask a thousand questions with one word. Rudy rolled over to his other side. Nutcrackers. Caleb pressed his forehead against Faith's. He wanted to be in this moment. He wanted to lose himself in a kiss with this beautiful woman. But the darn reindeer was floating off the table. Of all the rotten luck. Faith giggled, oblivious to what was happening right behind her. It's a gift. Yes, it is. He closed his eyes. Faith, do you trust me? W.H. what? I mean, why would you ask that? He forced himself to look into her eyes, to see the fear and the worry his question brought to the surface, because seeing that was answer enough. She didn't trust him. Not yet, anyway. Using one arm, he pulled her body closer to his even as he walked her backward toward the table. Stretching the other arm out, he pushed Rudy down. The stubborn thing didn't want to settle onto the hard table again. Without trust, there was no point in kissing Faith, no matter how much he wanted to. Caleb made a quick decision and threw Faith to the side, grabbing Rudy. Faith stumbled into the counter. Her hip made contact and she bounced off. Ouch! Caleb half steered, half carried Rudy to the crate. Oh my gosh! He almost fell off the table. Faith rushed to his side, checking over Rudy as if he had actually fallen. I'm so sorry. I'm not usually distracted in the oar. Caleb chuckled. I don't think I've been a distraction in the or before. Her cheeks dusted a light shade of pink that caused him to stare. She ducked her head. Um, you can put him in now. Caleb jolted as if she'd hit him with the hot shot. He'd forgotten the reindeer in his arms. Thank goodness Rudy was still out of it a little, he was floating enough to make moving him look easy. With as much care as he could manage with the awkward creature, he settled him onto the hay. You stay down, now, you hear, he whispered to Rudy. Rudy flicked his ear in response, and Caleb took that as a sign that he was aware enough to be on good behavior. He scooted backward out of the kennel and stood up tall, only to find Faith staring at him, her head cocked. She blinked several times and flipped around. The sound of her plastic gloves coming off snapped. I need to clean up in here. You should sit by him in case he gets. Scared. You sound like that's not normal. Nothing about you all is normal. She sighed, waving her hand in his general direction. He huffed and hooked his thumbs through his belt loops, what exactly are you saying, ma'am, he drawled. 
She snickered. Fine. I don't normally allow pet owners in recovery. It's hard for them to see their animals come out of anesthesia, and sometimes there are complications. So you're saying I'm an exception to the rule? Yes. You think I'm exceptional? That's not the same thing. She protested, but her eyes sparkled. Caleb did a mental fist pump. You seem a lot less stressed now. He reached through the cage and rested his hand on Rudy's back. Rudy's breathing was deep and regular, reassuring. Faith lifted one eyebrow at him. The phacoemulsification and aspiration procedure went well. I was able to remove the cataracts in both eyes. Caleb's head came around to stare at Rudy. So he might be able to see. She pulled off her mask, revealing a brilliant smile. He'll see. Caleb's heart leapt. They may have a reindeer to send Santa after all. Not to mention this sweet, good-natured animal would finally be able to fly in the open. He surged toward Faith and lifted her up. You beautiful veterinarian, you. He hugged her close and kissed her hair, which smelled like lavender. Then, just because he had the excuse, he kissed her head once again. His mom's words about being a gentleman rang through his head, and he forced himself to set Faith back on her feet. Stepping back, he cleared his throat. Sorry. I got a little carried away there. She smirked. I think I was the one being carried. He laughed, enjoying her sassiness and grateful that things weren't awkward. Hey, you can carry me any time you want. PFT, she flapped both hands. Like I could get you off the ground. Your ego is way too heavy. He laughed hard enough that he had to wipe at his eyes. You may not be able to lift me, but you certainly keep me on my toes. She grinned, and his world stopped spinning. Man, not falling in love with Faith was getting harder and harder. She'd saved his reindeer. There wasn't anything more a woman could do to earn his affection. Chapter 15 Faith pulled her hair out of the tight bun and massaged her scalp. Come on through. I'm sure you know the way. She walked through the hallway that attached the clinic to the house. It was enclosed, though not heated, and she shivered in her scrubs. Caleb was behind her, his overnight bag slung casually over his shoulder. She tried not to panic when she saw it. Having him spend the night felt like a great big deal. When he walked into a room, it was like he took over, and she had a hard time focusing on something besides him. Having him in her house, gulp, was like opening the door and inviting an avalanche inside. Her plan was to soldier through and pretend he wasn't there. She had things to get done, dinner to make and such. Besides, he was here to watch over Rudy, it wasn't like he was going to follow her around all night. They walked through the door that led them into the living room. I can't stay here, Caleb announced. She spun on him, wondering if he felt the same electrical current she'd been fighting. Except for when she'd been doing Rudy's surgery, the draw was always there. Even during the surgery, she couldn't block Caleb out completely, but she had put her attraction to him on a back shelf where it politely waited for her to save the reindeer's sight before it jumped up and refused to go back. What do you mean? Admitting her feelings never came easy. However, emotions were building up inside of her, and if he said something first, she'd burst like a dam. You don't have a Christmas tree. Her brain took a minute to turn around what he'd said, line it up against what she'd expected, and make sense of it. So, was her intelligent response. But really, she'd been thinking about having time and space with just Caleb, no reindeer, no family, 
and he was worried she didn't have a tree? He crossed to the fireplace, where the logs she'd thrown on that morning to take the chill out of the air had died down to red, winking embers. Not even a stocking hung by the chimney with care. He pulled out his phone. We have to fix this. A sense that the carefully crafted control she'd been hanging on to was slipping away made her panic. What are you doing? Calling in reinforcements. He winked. Mom? We need a jolly elf at the dock's place, stat. Faith's mouth fell open, and she snapped it shut. We don't need any such thing. I don't do Christmas trees or stockings. Why not? He turned back to his phone. Sounds great. See you soon. Bye, she scowled. That's none of your business. His face softened, and he stepped closer. I'd sure like to know, though. She sighed with all the long-suffering sound she could manage. This man tested her in ways she didn't anticipate. Because I don't believe in Santa. So what's the point? A tree doesn't represent Santa. She balked, expecting a different answer. Yes, it does. That's where he leaves gifts. Caleb shook his head. The tree represents eternal life with God. The gifts represent Christ and his gift to us. He stepped closer. Christmas isn't about Santa. She folded her arms. Says the man who's playing Santa in the parade. He rubbed his lips together, drawing her attention to them. Shoot. Was she looking at his mouth? She yanked her eyes over to the plaid couch with the red blanket thrown over the corner. Let's at least put up some decorations. The place could use a little cheer. Faith scowled at the drab tan carpet and the bare walls. Dad wasn't much of an interior decorator, being a bachelor, he was missing the kinds of things that softened a home. The sparsity worked for her, though, in that it allowed her to think of this place as temporary. She shook her head. No decorations. Caleb opened his mouth to argue, but she cut him off. My house, my rules. His eyes danced. But it's not really your house, is it? He walked around her to the hallway, where he dropped his bag inside the door to the guest bedroom. Faith was in her old room, which Dad had updated as she grew, not that she'd ever spent a night here. Still, she'd been touched to find the space had a coat of lavender paint on the walls and the headboard and dresser had been painted off-white. Those had been her favorite colors when she'd graduated high school. His efforts were a testament to his hope that she'd come work with him one day, and they softened her heart toward her dad and added proof to his statement that he'd always wanted her. Caleb clapped his hands together and then rubbed them brusquely. If I were Doc, where would I store Christmas decorations? He glanced above her head and broke into a smile. Aha! Faith glanced up to see the attic pole dangling above her. Oh no! We are not going up there. I've heard feet scampering across the ceiling at night, and I'm not about to get bit by something. She shuddered. Caleb stepped forward. Come on. Doc will be home for Christmas, wouldn't it be great to have some decorations up for him? She gritted her teeth. That's not fair. You can't use my dad to guilt me into liking Christmas. Who said anything about guilt? He took the last step into her personal space and reached up draping his fingers over the pole and leaning down so their faces were kissably close. Faith's heart pounded so loud she was sure it would wake up Rudy in the clinic. Breathing was difficult, making her gasp. 
What were they talking about? Christmas and Jesus and trees? Oh, yeah, decorating. Which she didn't want to do. Funny how she had to remind herself of that when staring into Caleb's dark blue eyes. If she wasn't careful, he'd talk her into all sorts of things. Are you always this pushy about decorating? Are you always this scrooge-why about not decorating? He searched her face, looking for what, she wasn't sure. I think we've established that. She smiled. Unfortunately, he did have a point about her dad. The old man loved Christmas with every fiber of his soul, and if he came home to this cheerless house, he'd probably regress in his treatment. Taking a step back, to where she couldn't smell Caleb's deep, manly scent that got the butterflies in her stomach drunk, she said, fine. If you want to break your back, I won't stop you. That's the spirit, Caleb said with way too much enthusiasm to not be completely sarcastic. Good luck. She twittered her fingers at him. He yanked down on the pole and a ladder spilled to the floor. Faith jumped back to avoid getting hit. Caleb climbed up without another word. Dust shook off the wood and landed on the carpet. She grumbled and went to the linen closet for the vacuum. A mess. That's what holiday decorations were, a mess you left out for a couple weeks before finally having to clean it all up again. And would Caleb be here to clean it up? No. Dad wouldn't be able to climb that ladder by January. It would be on her to put everything away, and she didn't want it out in the first place. She vacuumed up the mess but decided to leave the vacuum out because he'd probably bring a bunch more dust bunnies down with him. Ugh. That was it. She didn't need to spend her day cleaning up after this wrangler. She'd go right on up there and put her foot down. No Christmas. Chapter 16 The attic was surprisingly organized. At least, it was compared to Caleb's parents' attic. They had more Christmas decorations than most New York department stores. Which was fantastic, because each year the house looked different and yet familiar. Mom was a whiz with all this stuff, but Caleb wasn't a slouch. Twenty-some-odd years of putting up decorations and hanging out with Kringles had rubbed off on him. He grabbed a strand of outdoor lights and hung them around his neck. Hanging them along the roof without a reindeer to help would be dangerous, so he'd have to settle for wrapping the front porch railing. The rubber totes were clearly labeled, so it didn't take him long to figure out what was for the tree and what was decoration. He tried to remember Doc's place being decorated, the memories were fuzzy. Truth was, they didn't come to Doc's that often, as he spent most of his time at the ranch. He opened a box labeled fireplace decorations and lifted out a stocking with Faith's name on it. This he remembered. Doc hung it every year. The ladder rattled and Faith's head appeared. She looked around as if expecting a mouse to jump at her. When nothing happened, she climbed the rest of the way. Her short breaths and flaring, and still adorable, nostrils told him he was in for a fight. Hoping to stave off the attack, he held up her stocking. I found proof that you believed in Santa. She stopped short, staring at the stocking as if it were a ghost. I remember that. Closing the distance between them, she reached over to brush her fingers across the fur. I haven't seen this since before the divorce. She took it from him carefully, like she was afraid it would disintegrate if she held it too tight. Caleb turned away, sensing she wouldn't want him to see the emotions painting across her features. That must have been difficult. How old were you when they split? She swallowed. Five. Her eyes glazed over, and she disappeared into a memory. 
That first Christmas was hard. I woke up to nothing under the tree, and I cried and cried. My mom held me and said, her voice cracked, and she folded in on herself. Caleb moved without thinking. He pulled Faith into his arms. Hot tears hit his flannel shirt. What did she say? Fighting the emotions inside of her Faith whispered, she said that we would have had presents if my no-good father had sent us money. Caleb wanted to strangle the woman who was so full of bitterness it had overflowed into her daughter's heart. I'm sorry. He brushed his hand down her back. The lights around his neck creaked. Faith sniffed and wiped at her eyes. I wonder how many of my memories are colored by my mother's broken heart. I don't know. But you should ask your dad about that Christmas. There are two sides. And even if he was heartless and didn't take care of you, at least you'll know. The truth has a way of bringing peace. She nodded, looking numb. Hey, he hooked his finger under her chin and lifted her face. Her gray eyes were drowning in unshed tears that tore his heart out. Whatever happens, it doesn't change the fact that you're an amazing person who can do incredible things. She shook her head. Faith, I watched you during surgery. You care about Rudy. You care about Dunder and the rest of the herd. Her cheeks twitched with the beginnings of a smile. He took courage. I don't think you wanted to, but you do care. Her lips spread, but the smile didn't touch her eyes, yet. He was still working at it. I didn't want to. She choked out a laugh. Stinking reindeer made me go soft. She tugged her sleeve over her wrist and used it to wipe at her eyes. Caleb pulled her closer. You are a good-hearted person, it's one of your better attributes. Her eyes grew wide. Caleb reached for that smile. Your backside isn't bad either. She laughed even as she shoved away from him. You are such a cowboy. He held up both hands. What? I figure that's one of my better attributes. She rolled her eyes. I'd walk away, but I'm afraid you'd enjoy it too much. Oh. His chest puffed up in victory. She was laughing. She was smiling. She was flirting. Three points. The faint sound of the doorbell floated up to them. He thought fast. Tell you what, you finish going through this box, and I'll answer the door. It's probably my mom anyway. Okay. Her voice was smaller than it had been a moment ago. He leaned in and spoke as if talking to a reindeer he was trying to harness for the first time. It's just a box. She shoved at him. Go, before your mom freezes on the front porch. He hurried down the ladder and to the door. Were you in the back forty? Mom teased as she handed over a large basket. This jolly elf is almost a popsicle. Sorry. Caleb glanced under the towel draped over the contents. This is great. Thank you so much. Do you want some help decorating? I have an afternoon open. Caleb shook his head. Faith was just starting to open up to him and he didn't want to undo the closeness they'd created. Mom was a force of Christmas, and unleashing her on the holiday skittish woman upstairs would be too much too soon. There's not that much to do. Hmm, she folded her arms. Why do I feel like a third will all of a sudden? Caleb grabbed the door handle and started shutting the door. Maybe. Because you are. He winked. You remember what I said. Mom shook her finger at him. I'll remember. He shut the door and looked back at the wooden ladder in the hallway. Faith had some pretty intense moments up there. 
He'd done good by holding her while she'd cried, and his manly pride was about bursting over it. Almost all of him wanted to dart back up the ladder and take her into his arms again, but a part of him was cautious. She needed a moment to gather herself. He glanced into the basket and grinned. Maybe she needed a cookie. Thank you, Mom, he mumbled as he headed to the kitchen and pulled out a bag of Mom's frozen cookie dough. She made giant batches of it, rolled it into balls, and froze them for emergency cookie situations, which happened more often than he'd care to admit in their family of rambunctious men. He clicked on the stove and set to work, hoping he was doing the right thing. Chapter 17 Faith got lost in the task of sorting Christmas decorations. Some held memories that were foggy and just out of reach, others smacked her in the face and had her gripping the box for support. One of the things she struggled with was that if her dad wasn't the bad guy, did that make her mom the bad guy? Or was she somehow the villain? None of the answers made sense or settled into her heart, and she grew frustrated. She was staring at a paper wreath made from her handprints when she could have sworn she smelled fresh-baked cookies. Strange. She sniffed the wreath, but it smelled of construction paper and not much else. Sniffing the air, she followed her nose to the ladder. Looking down, she found Caleb smiling up at her, waving his hand over the top of a cookie sheet filled with freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. What are you doing? She couldn't help the smile that filled her face. The sight of a man in an apron and wearing an oven glove was pretty amazing. She hadn't known she had a thing for men who could cook, but by the way her heart raced, she must. Fishing, he replied. Fishing? He pointed at the tray. Bait. Looks like I caught the most beautiful woman in the house. She flushed. I'm the only woman in the house. He beckoned her to come down. Doesn't make you less beautiful. Are you ready for a break? She nodded. Let me hand you down a couple boxes. He nodded and went to set the cookies down. She grabbed the ones that didn't cause a typhoon of emotions, and her stocking, leaning over to allow Caleb to get a good grip on them before climbing down herself. He looked through what she'd selected while she went to the kitchen to wash her hands. There was a plate of cookies as well as the cooling tray. He must have been busy, though she didn't see any baking supplies. One of the reasons she rarely made desserts was that she was the only one who ate them. Either she gorged herself and then hated the scale for three weeks, or she ended up throwing half of them away. At least with Caleb here, she wouldn't have those problems. Ha! Huh. The idea of him staying a couple days with the reindeer wasn't as scary as it had been that morning. In fact, she was settling into the situation rather quickly. The cookies were warm and soft and melted in her mouth, making her moan with pleasure. Caleb walked in just as she was opening her eyes from the moment of ecstasy. If you bake like this, I'll stop complaining about you staying over. He laughed as he reached into the fridge and then poured her a glass of milk. I have it on good authority that Santa's favorite cookie is chocolate chip. That's funny, because I could have sworn Nabisco said it was Oreos. She took the milk and gave him a look of challenge. He leaned against the counter and crossed his ankles, more at ease in this kitchen than she was even after living there a week. Perhaps it was. It changes every year. She wrinkled her nose. Why? Can you imagine eating the same cookie at every house you deliver presents? She must get sick of them after a while. Faith paused in her chewing. She? Caleb coughed into his fist. Yeah. Uh. 
Let me grab one of those boxes and we can start decorating. He hurried out and came back in, a huge smile on his face. This is the fireplace one. It shouldn't be too hard to set some things on the mantle. He started unwrapping the figurines, finding carved olive with statues of Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. These are really pretty. I wonder how Dad got them. She glanced at the bottom. Look, they're stamped, made in Jerusalem. I didn't know he traveled out of the country. He didn't. We have the same set given to us by a mutual friend. Oh, who is that? The, uh, Kringle family. Caleb Hyper focused on arranging the manger scene. Every line in his body said he didn't want to talk about the Kringles. She'd shook her head. I've never met them. Caleb set his hand over hers, and warmth spread up her arm and filled her chest. If you stick around long enough, you just might. We'll see about that. What's that thing? She pointed inside the box. He pulled out a pair of candlesticks. Those are pretty. Reaching for them, she allowed her fingers to brush his, anticipating but still enjoying the jolt of attraction from the contact. He should have them up all year long. They must be special to the holiday. Caleb walked the empty box to the bottom of the ladder. Faith stared at the candlesticks. They went well with the other decor in the room, and they gave the place a sense of class it was missing. It seemed silly to hide them away for ten months of the year. She cornered Caleb as he came back into the room. I don't get it. What's the big deal for you all with Christmas? Caleb studied her eyes and forehead and glanced at her lips, making her wonder what it would be like to kiss him. He had wonderful lips. The kind that were full enough to capture her mouth and take control of it if he so desired. Would he desire that? She'd kissed enough men to know that some were wimpy kissers with flappy lips who only wanted to get their tongue down her throat. Ugh. Why was she thinking about kissing and tongues right now? Caleb swallowed deeply. When he finally answered her question, his voice was soft and thoughtful, the kind of voice that read the Christmas story by the fireplace on Christmas Eve. Christmas asks me to think outside of myself. It's not about what I get, but what I give. I know that sounds hokey. He rubbed his forehead. It's not, though. Christmas really brings out the best in all of us as we try to do more for others. Haven't you noticed that there's a special spirit about the season? Yeah, but mostly I see stores having sales trying to make a buck and people elbowing their way to the front of lines and credit card debt climbing. He stared intently into her eyes, making her feel like she was being looked at. Not in a way that judged her or made her uncomfortable but like Caleb wanted to understand where she was coming from. Perhaps her view of the world was a lot different from his, but that didn't make it wrong in his eyes, just interesting. She thought back to the Christmas before. But that's not all of it, I guess. Many of my regular patients brought in or sent holiday cards and gifts. I was surprised that they remembered me. She dropped her gaze. Realizing she was still holding half a cookie, she broke off a piece and ate it, embarrassed that she'd said so much. You're an important part of their lives. Why wouldn't they remember you? She lifted a shoulder. I'm just the vet. A small line appeared between his eyebrows. But you care for someone they love, that means something to people. She suddenly remembered Allie, who owned Bella, a border doodle. She brought Bella into the clinic at closing time, afraid her best friend was at the end of her life. 
With some medication for arthritis, Bella improved and had a quality of life she hadn't before. Ali had hugged Faith and cried with relief. She'd felt like she made a difference that day. I guess, she admitted. She finished off the cookie and dusted the crumbs off her fingers. What about reindeer? What do they have to do with this whole Christmas thing, besides the commercialism of Santa Claus? Caleb grinned like that was the easiest question in the world. Reindeer, flying reindeer, are symbols that all things are possible with God. And because they help deliver presents to every child in the world, they remind us that we are all God's children. Every child should get a gift to remind them that they are loved. She paused. It's so easy to forget that. It can be. He placed his hand over hers. It helps if you have people around you who remind you of it. She stared at their hands. Was he telling her he loved her? He'd mentioned that she had worth, that the work she did was important in this world. That didn't translate to love, but it felt very much like she was valued, and she wanted to wrap up in that feeling. But she couldn't allow that to happen. Caleb lived in a fairy tale world where reindeer and Christmas lasted all year long. She came from a background that was the opposite of his. Heck, she didn't even put up a Christmas tree. What was the point when she was the only one to see it? Caleb would probably tell her that was the point, that she was worth the effort. She grew uncomfortable in that thought. Like maybe she didn't give herself enough credit, but why should she give more? Why should she believe she was anything special when neither of her parents had believed that about her? Thanks. She pulled her hand out from under his. We should check on Rudy and then get some sleep. The pain meds will keep him sedated, but I don't want to drug him longer than we have to, and that means an early bedtime. He glanced around as if just realizing that outside, the sky had grown dark. I guess that means we had cookies for dinner. She swiped one off the plate and took a big bite. I'm okay, with that. He laughed. Somehow, that makes me like you all the more. She laughed. Who wouldn't like a woman who eats sugar for dinner? Especially a man who probably believed in elves and talking snowmen. Come on. I'll bet your reindeer could use a visit from you about now. Caleb followed her out to the clinic, eating three stacked cookies at a time. Which made her wonder if this was his first time having cookies for dinner, or if that was another thing that happened regularly in his life that hadn't happened in hers. The problem she had being around him wasn't that he wasn't great. He was. He listened without judgment, was easy on the eyes and made her crave contact like some sort of addict who couldn't get close enough to him. No, the problem wasn't Caleb. The problem was the way he highlighted what she should have had. This wasn't the first time she'd struggled with this particular realization. In high school, she'd had friends whose parents were still in love and created stability for their children. She'd watched them, Soaking in their examples at the same time it made her resent her own parents. Measuring her mother against stay-at-home moms who sewed Halloween costumes and baked cupcakes for their birthdays only made her angry. She would thought she'd accepted her lot in life. But today she'd questioned it all once again, including how much she and her attitude played a part in it. Following right on the back of that question was another one. What would her future be like if she continued with this same attitude? She wasn't sure she was ready for the answer to that question. Chapter 18 December 13th Faith crashed her eyes closed against the blaring of the alarm. Five in the morning came awfully early in North Dakota, heavy on the awful. 
She slammed the snooze button, groaned, and threw the blankets off. Knowing Caleb was in the house had thrown of her sleep cycle. It wasn't like she wanted to sneak into his room and watch him sleep or anything creepy like that. And she wasn't scared that he'd do something like that to her. It was more of this awareness of him. Of the way he smelled, like cookies and aftershave, which was a surprisingly delightful scent. Of the way his eyes sparkled, like a kid's at Christmas. Of his muscles that rippled and moved under his shirt, like those of an animal ready to pounce. She couldn't stop thinking about sharing cookies with him and the way he looked at life, her life in particular. He didn't seem to think she had a horrible childhood, but maybe one that left some questions. Which made her ask herself if it was as bad as she'd always thought. Or if she'd just been a pessimist. She finally determined to ask her dad about that first Christmas away and find out what had happened. It might not be any of her business why her parents' marriage had fallen apart, then again, maybe it was, because she was the one who lived with the unasked for consequences. Ugh. Her head hurt. She wrapped up in a robe and slipped her feet into the fur-lined slippers sitting by her bed, another purchase at the feed store, before heading to the kitchen. She turned on the lights and groaned. Being awake wasn't getting easier. The pounding in her head intensified. That was what she got for crying yesterday. Crying always gave her a headache. She figured it was God's way of telling her to find other ways to deal with things. But maybe it was his way of telling her she was meant to be a happy person in this life. She glanced around at the decorations Caleb had put up yesterday. Maybe, if she could give Christmas a try, really open her heart to it, she'd find some of that joy she'd been missing. Yawning, she turned on the television to listen to the morning news while she clicked on the hot chocolate maker. Witnesses are saying the reindeer races cars like a dog, but flies next to their vehicle, said the reporter standing in front of a sign that said Old Faithful. I've got Ranger Charles here with me to shed some light on the mysterious happenings in Yellowstone National Park. The whole world's gone reindeer crazy, Faith mumbled. Dad didn't drink coffee, but he had the world's largest selection of cocoa packets to pick from. She grabbed one at random, having never met a cup of cocoa she didn't like. Dumping the powder into the machine, she plodded out to the clinic to check on Rudy. He should be awake any time now. Though she didn't want to startle him, his eyes were still bandaged, having him alert would be a good thing. Also, the bandages were an issue. It wasn't like she could put a cone on a reindeer to keep him from scraping against the edge of the cage in an effort to get them off. So, she needed to make sure he kept them on for a while longer. Just in case he had rubbed them off in the night, she turned the lights on in the lobby but didn't turn them on in the recovery room. She crept in and glanced down to find the cage empty. Panic shot through her like ice down her bathrobe. Rudy, she whispered as she dropped to her knees and grabbed the cage wire. A clang brought her eyes up, and she screamed. Rudy hung upside down like a bat. His bandaged eyes turned to her as if he could see through the gauze and right into her heart, and his red nose let off a glow. The sight was terrifying, a Christmas nightmare. Rudy snorted loud, the sound echoing off the walls. Scrambling back from the kennel, she used the wall to climb to her feet and run for the house. Caleb! She threw open the door and charged down the hallway. Caleb! Banging on his door, she looked over her shoulder, afraid Rudy had figured out how to escape and was coming after her. The door flew open, and she lost all the air in her lungs. Caleb shirtless and in flannel pajama bottoms was startling in a whole other way than finding a reindeer hanging from the ceiling of his kennel. She gulped, 
doing her best to work up moisture in her suddenly dry and uncoordinated mouth. Rudy. She pointed toward the clinic. Caleb put his hands on her shoulders and moved her out of the way even as he kicked into a whole other gear, leaving her by herself in the hall. She leaned against the wall opposite his open door. It was a good thing she hadn't had all that bare chest to think about last night, she wouldn't have gotten any sleep. Running her hand through her hair, she gathered her courage and made her way to the clinic. The doors were open, and she could hear Caleb talking to Rudy. You scared her. What are you doing in here? He, she paused just inside the door. He what? Levitated? Was there even an explanation for what she'd seen? He was upside down. She moved into the room, finding Rudy settled into the corner of his kennel. His nose was the same red it had been the day before, and he hung his head like a scolded child. Caleb measured the kennel with his arms. I guess he could roll over in here. Forrest welded the cage to be large enough for him to stay in it comfortably for a couple days. No. I mean. She slapped her hand to her forehead. He was hanging upside down. Caleb stared at her. Are you sure? Yes. That sounded convincing. No? Even better. She tossed her hands up and headed back to the house. Obviously, Rudy was fine and could wait ten minutes for her to put on clothes and drink her cocoa. Caleb followed behind her. She had to work hard not to watch his every step through the room and on his way to his bedroom. A commercial for fried chicken came on the television, and she stared at it as she ran through what had just happened. Her heart was tired, like it had run a thousand miles in ten minutes. The cocoa was minty and helped clear her thoughts. She had seen Rudy upside down, his ears facing the floor. She felt sure of it. As sure as she was that the television was on. However, it was dark in the room, and shadows did funny things. Caleb came back a moment later, wearing a shirt and having tamed his bedhead a bit. Too bad. She liked the rumpled look on him, not to mention the muscles he sported. Grabbing another packet, she started the cocoa machine for him. I swear to you, that reindeer was hanging from the ceiling. He smirked. You expect me to believe a reindeer could fly? She groaned. It sounds crazy, right? But that's what happened. Are you sure you were awake? She blew out a breath. Not really. We're back in Yellowstone National Park. The reporter came back on, and both Faith and Caleb turned to watch. With an eyewitness of the flying reindeer people have dubbed Dancer. Caleb snorted. Then he looked at her like he'd been caught sneaking out to spy on Santa. Did you see that story before you went out to see Rudy? She nodded. Well, there's your answer. You heard the story and saw a reindeer and your brain mixed the two together. I was sleepy. She glanced at the dark window and rubbed her arms for warmth. Do you think they'll call your family for comment on all this? Why would they? His confusion was almost comical. Because you're reindeer experts. Oh, yeah, well, there's that. He laughed. I don't know. Sometimes we get news people poking around. Especially this time of year. I have an idea. He spoke quickly, as if his mind were running a 10K. I'll start some breakfast, and you go take a shower to wake up. Then we'll both go check on Rudy. He moved across the room, 
snagging his cocoa mug right as the machine beeped to let him know it was done. Omelets or pancakes? Faith hugged herself. Rudy had been upside down. Hadn't he? She stared at the television, where a guy who looked like he belonged in a biker gang gestured wildly as he talked about Dancer flying outside his driver's side window on his way home from the bar. She flipped the television off. The world was crazy, but she wasn't. Reindeer didn't fly. Caleb was right, she must have conjured the whole thing up in her half-asleep state. If you're cooking, I'll take pancakes. She smiled to reassure him that she was sane. He held up the frying pan and spun it around like a gunslinger. You got it. She grinned and made her way back to her room. A hot guy making her breakfast and a flying reindeer. If she wasn't careful, she'd start talking to leprechauns too. A shower and a clean pair of clothes would do wonders to make her feel like herself again. Bless Caleb for not laughing at her. He was a really great guy. She closed her eyes and saw Rudy's white bandages staring back at her. Shaking her head, she got rid of the image and replaced it with Caleb without his shirt on. That was better, but full of its own troubles. She sighed. There was no safe place to rest her thoughts. If she didn't get a hold of them, they'd run away with her and Caleb and a whole lot of kissing. Chapter 19 December 14th I don't know, Jack. Caleb paced Faith's front room. Funny how in the short time they'd spent together here, he'd come to think of it as her house instead of Doc's. I can't see a way around mom and dad when they join forces. He'd spent a lot of time thinking about how they watched each other's back and wanted a marriage with as much dedication, it was wonderful but infuriating at times like these. Yeah, but one of us has got to go after Snowflake. His twin's voice sounded tinny, which meant he was in the workout arena. Caleb paused in his pacing to look out the front window toward the driveway. Faith had gone out on a ranch call, and he didn't want to be caught talking about disappearing reindeer after the way he'd made her think she'd dreamt Rudy upside down in his stall. Reindeer. He thought they knew better by now when it came to flying in front of people, but discretion didn't seem to be one other their traits. If anything, they were a bunch of show-offs. Agreed. The driveway was empty, so he took up wearing a path in the carpet. But Dad's the owner of the ranch and technically our boss. If he says we don't go, then we don't go. Working with family was as much about managing your relationship as it was about getting the work done. If Jack took off without permission, there'd be a reckoning when he got home. None of us are really guaranteed a place on the ranch forever. Dad could up and sell it for his retirement. Jack snorted in derision. We both know that would never happen. Okay, probably not, but you understand we can still be fired even if we're his sons, right? They love us something fierce, but they also believe in tough love. Did they ever? As much as people thought their family was perfect, they were far from it. The one thing they had going for them that everyone else seemed to envy was loyalty. If a brother was in trouble, he had four men for backup, not to mention dad, doc, and mom. And truly, mom was the one who kept the kids in line who would have picked on the Nicola's brothers for still believing in Santa. She was a mother bear that would scare off the abominable snowman. Yeah. Sounded like Jack remembered the days he was grounded for not making grades. And grounded at their house meant no flying sleighs. For teenage boys, it was like sucking all the joy out of the world. Try playing the video for dad, see if it changes his mind, but don't expect much. The news was playing a video of Snowflake racing a snowmobile. 
It was grainy and you only saw her fly past in a blur, but it was certainly their missing reindeer. The video was viral on YouTube even as experts did their best to discredit it. Seemed like there was a world full of grouches this year bent on destroying Christmas cheer. I'll give it a try. Would you be able to go with me? The only reason they hadn't gone yet was Rudy's surgery. Caleb glanced at the door that led to the clinic. Rudy was sleeping, again. Faith said it was normal, but he didn't dare leave her alone with the reindeer in case Rudy felt like snoozing upside down again and scaring their vet half out of her wits. I don't think so. I've got a lot going on with Rudy and Faith. I'm itching to get him in the workout arena, but I'm also worried that he won't be everything we're hoping. I feel ya. Thanks, bro. I'll see you tomorrow. If not sooner. The sing-along is tonight. You gonna bring that girl you're chasing after? Caleb didn't even bother to check his grin. Maybe. He hadn't thought of the sing-along, but now it sounded like the best idea ever. The town did their Christmas sing-along upright with a giant tree lighting at the beginning and the high school band accompanying the singers. It was one of his favorite traditions. I'll need to arrange some things. Like someone to babysit Rudy while Caleb went out to play. Gravel crunched outside, and he leapt to the window. Faith set the old truck's parking brake before climbing out. I gotta go. Faith just got home. He clicked off before his brother could tease him about how he'd phrased that. Yes, she'd gotten home, but not to their home. Although he did feel like he was playing house when he made them dinner. Lemon pepper chicken was easy enough, and the can of green beans wasn't fancy, but it would feed them. Nourishment was what Faith needed after being out in the cold. Good food and a cup of hot cocoa. He dashed into the kitchen to hit the start button on the cocoa machine. It gurgled before Faith pushed through the front door. Caleb scrambled for the barstool, where his book lay open on the counter. He'd been meaning to read the latest XX Dollar novel and had thrown it into his duffel on a whim. It was a good thing too, because he was used to being in motion and he'd done a lot of sitting around today. Something smells great. Faith called from the front door. Caleb dithered, wondering if he should go out to greet her like he wanted to or if he should not appear so eager. She came into the kitchen, the cold clinging to her clothing like icicles hanging from her sleeves. North Dakota weather was like that, it wouldn't let you forget it, even when you got out of it. She shed her coat and hung it over the barstool next to him. Is this for me? She pointed at the cocoa machine. Caleb had yet to unglue his tongue from the top of his mouth. Faith's cheeks were rosy and her eyes bright. Her hair, up in a high ponytail, was disheveled. Man, he'd like to make her look that good. Burying his hands in her hair as he kissed that blush to her cheeks would be a treat. He shook himself. Yep. All yours. He lifted his own mug and took a sip of the slightly cooled cocoa. You look happy. She threw a smile over her shoulder, and he about fell off his chair. Seriously, this woman had no idea how beautiful she was, and it was undoing him. I forgot how much I like going out on ranch calls. The work is challenging, but there's something about being with a herd of animals or working beside someone who respects their cattle. She pulled the mug out and took a sip, her eyes closing in pleasure. Caleb bit his cheek and thought of Dunder to keep himself from leaping over the counter and taking faith in his arms. It appeared that absence did make the heart grow fonder, because she'd only been gone for a few hours and he was falling all over himself. Would you want to move in permanently? He did his best to keep the conversation casual despite the way his heart hammered out hope that she'd choose to stay. After all, you already have a bedroom here. 
She smiled into her cup. Dad and I need to clear up a lot of things. I didn't get to see him today because of this emergency. I don't think we are at a point where being business partners is a good idea. Working with family is a challenge. He lifted his mug in salute and then felt like an idiot, so he hurried and slurped a sip. You just said you loved the ranch calls, and I haven't seen you this happy since you got here. If he didn't know that she'd gone out to old man Miller's, he might be jealous of the man who put the spring in Faith's step. She laughed lightly. It was a great day. I almost got kicked by the bull, but he just missed me. I think my heart about jumped out of my chest. She placed her hand over her heart even as her smile slipped. My practice is in Grafton, though. I have a lot of money wrapped up in it, and I can't just walk away. It's impractical to even consider it. Well, there went that hope. If only Faith could see herself in Sleigh Bell Country. She'd realize how good this place was for her. Everything in her bright countenance said that moving here would be an improvement over the life she had in the city. Maybe she needed a big dose of this small town to change her mind. He stood, closing his book in the process. Let's go out. She half choked on her cocoa. But I just got in. He pressed forward. Tonight is the sing-along. It's a huge deal in town, and it's one of the best traditions we have, second only to Santa's ride on Christmas Eve. He winked, hoping she'd take his pressure as friendly and not desperate. Her brow furrowed. What about Rudy? Check on him, but he's in good spirits when he's awake. I'll see if Pax can come sit with him. He doesn't like crowds, so he'll appreciate the excuse to get out of going with the family. He hoped. It was true that Pax was an introvert, the only one in the whole family. If he didn't look so much like a Nicola's, they'd think he was adopted. Come on. You have to experience this at least once in your life. Faith chewed her bottom lip. If you put it that way. She glanced down at her layers and layers of clothing. I'm not dressed for an occasion. You'll be the most beautiful woman in the park, guaranteed. Her rosy cheeks turned a dark shade of red. Well, how can I say no to that, she whispered hoarsely. He broke into a grin. Yeah. Her smile was almost as big as his. Yeah. Woot. She laughed at his fist thrown in the air. First the reindeer. She pointed towards the clinic. If he's struggling, we stay in. He's doing great. Caleb held the door open for her. You're going to have such a good time tonight. It's really spectacular. She nodded. I'm already going, stop with the sales job, she teased. He backed off as she grabbed a pair of gloves and headed for Rudy's kennel. He was standing up, drinking from the bucket as if he'd flown through the Sahara. When he finished, he lifted his head, water dripping from his chin. That's a good sign. Faith opened the door and hunched over to go in with Rudy. She talked softly. Caleb was only more encouraged by the reindeer's improvement. It looked like things were on the upswing for the reindeer ranch and for him personally. He couldn't force Faith to feel Christmas cheer, but if she was ever going to get it, then the sing-along was the place to be. He hoped she felt something tonight, because if she didn't, then her heart was closed to Christmas. The very thought made his chest ache. Chapter 20 The night was dark but Faith didn't mind at all as she hooked her arm through Caleb's and held on. Ahead of them were bright lights and a large group of people in coats and scarves. They looked like the cast from A Charlie Brown Christmas with blue coats and bright pink beanies. No one seemed worried about how they looked when staying warm was the focus. 
As they got closer, she could see space between the family groups. Caleb reached for her hand, well, her mitten, as he weaved through the crowd to get them closer to the front. His hand was strong and would never let hers go. She enjoyed the comfort it brought, as well as the thrill that tickled through her rib cage. He'd been in high spirits on the ride over, sharing memories of past sing-alongs with her as if handing out pieces of chocolate. She'd soaked them all in, wishing she had something like that for her memory box. She couldn't think of a single tradition that tied her to more than her mother or father. Being a part of a community was a new and somewhat overwhelming experience. She spotted Caleb's family standing close to the brass instrument side of the bandstand and was about to point them out when Caleb brought them to a stop behind a pine tree, out of view but still able to see what was going on. Had he done that on purpose to give them privacy? A man standing on a red carpeted box and wearing a top hat and tails lifted a baton. Are you ready to sing some carols? His deep voice carried over the tops of their heads, sprinkling his enthusiasm like a salt shaker. The crowd let out a cheer. Well, I can tell your voices are all warmed up. He earned a chuckle from the crowd. Faith caught herself joining in and stopped. She wasn't a joiner, and being here pushed her limits. She clutched Caleb's hand for strength. We'll start with an easy favorite, said the band director. His arms went up and then down, and the music started. Tentative at first, as if they weren't sure about putting their lips to the cold metal, the band warbled into Away in a Manger. Mr. Director wrapped his baton on the music stand once, and the band members straightened up and produced a clearer sound. He nodded his approval before turning around to the crowd to get them started on the words. The band might have been hesitant, but the townsfolk were eager and jumped in with their whole hearts. Faith sang quietly, more intent on watching those around her than hitting the right notes. A few feet away, a young couple rocked back and forth, each with a child in their arms. The father held a toddler boy and the mother a baby. The toddler wiggled at first but settled in to watch his dad sing about the baby Jesus. Faith's heart lurched with a need for a small family of her own. The stirrings came every now and again, but never this strong and never this pointed. She pressed her free hand over her belly, wondering if she'd ever have the chance to sing a lullaby. When the song was over, the music paused for just as long as it took for the kids to flip their music and then they were off in a lively version of Hark. The herald angels sing. Even though it was a hymn, the crowd bounced and moved as if they were part of heaven's choir. An elderly woman in front of them raised both hands in the air, joyful all ye nations rise, she practically yelled. She turned in a circle and sang up to heaven as if filled by the Holy Spirit. Faith swallowed down the emotion building in her throat at the woman's rapture. She believed, there was no denying it. She loved Jesus and she wanted to praise his name in song forevermore. It was a beautiful, touching sight that had nothing to do with sitting still, arms folded, in church and everything to do with allowing the Spirit to surge through your soul. Faith closed her eyes hoping it would help her forget people watching and just be in the moment. A scripture, long ago read and filed away, popped into her head. Let them praise his name with dancing. She couldn't have told you the book or the verse if asked, but the words turned a key and she began to tap her foot and sway her head. She wished she could play an instrument. Anything that would help get the swelling of emotions out of her and into the world. Opening her mouth, she sang with abandon. No one could pick her out in this crowd anyway. As the song drew to a close, the warmth that had filled her up began to draw in on itself, folding until it fit nicely in her heart. Opening her eyes, she found Caleb watching her, his eyes filled with fondness and something more? 
she reached up on her tiptoes and whispered in his ear. Thank you for bringing me. He wrapped an arm around her and drew her to his chest. I was right. About what? You're the most beautiful woman here. He brushed her hair off her cheek and then let her go, watching the director as he readied them for Silent Night. It would be their last song. Which was probably a good thing, because Faith couldn't feel her toes anymore. She could feel her heart, though, as if it had just woken up for the first time in her life. She glanced at Caleb. Part of it was him. Clutching her hand over her chest, she realized that the feeling was still there. Small and bright. Perfect. And not from Caleb, but from the music and from God and from getting out of his way so he could tell her he loved her. That was Christmas. Maybe Caleb had known that all along. Maybe that was why he loved to decorate and bake and work with reindeer, because he knew God loved him. It certainly made a difference. Because Faith wasn't so worried anymore. It was like accepting Jesus' love put things into perspective. Whatever happened with her dad would be okay. If he turned out to be a jerk who'd left her mom penniless, then she'd make it through. For the first time in her life Faith didn't feel alone. She gave Caleb's hand a squeeze. He was something special. She only hoped that whatever path she stepped onto tonight, it included him. Because this strong, cookie-baking wrangler was going to be difficult to give up. Chapter 21 December 15th I'm all twisted inside. Caleb put his hand over his stomach, which was leaping around like a two-week-old reindeer hyped up on sugar. Not that they ever gave the animals sugar. He could only imagine. It's going to be okay. Faith continued to unwrap Rudy's bandages, moving slowly and reaching around his neck when necessary. There was an aura of peace around her that was downright alluring. It had happened during the sing-along. He could tell you the exact moment, because as soon as she'd closed her eyes, he'd watched her. Watched and hoped that she could feel some of the peace and hope threaded into the music. The band wasn't as good as last year's, and the group they'd stood by weren't locals. But Faith's whole countenance had glowed, and she'd seemed to drink in all the wonder of the season in that one song. For his part, Rudy held unnaturally still. Caleb could almost hear him say, I don't dare hope this worked. Or maybe that was what Caleb felt inside and he was projecting it onto the reindeer. And he had so much hope wrapped up in whether or not the surgery worked. The whole family did. Which was why they were all waiting impatiently for him to bring Rudy home. Two plus days was a long time for a reindeer to be at the vets. The last bit of gauze slipped away, and Faith reached for the bandages lying over his eyes. Okay, hit the lights. Caleb pounded the switch with his fist, too nervous to hold still, and they were plunged into semi-darkness. He wished there was more he could do for Rudy than dim the lights, but he had no idea how to make this easier on him. Faith spoke to the reindeer. I'm going to remove them at the same time. Please don't freak out. Rudy continued to hold still as an ice sculpture. Caleb, if you could come over here so I'm not the first person he sees. I think he's used to my voice by now, but I don't want him startling and jerking around. Faith ran her hand down Rudy's neck as she gave instructions. She was in control to the hundredth degree, and her calm was a huge factor in keeping Caleb from climbing out of his skin. Sure. He came to stand beside her and placed his hand on Rudy's neck moving down to scratch the spot just over his shoulder that he liked so much. Rudy sniffed the air, recognizing his scent and pushing his nose into Caleb's chest. Okay, okay. 
I'm happy to be here, buddy. Are you ready to try out your eyes? Rudy huffed, sounding a lot like, get on with it. Faith smiled over his nose at Caleb. Their eyes locked, and for a brief moment, it was just the two of them. She looked away first, ready to do what needed to be done. Caleb watched her instead of looking at Rudy's eyes. He'd be able to tell if the surgery was a success from Faith's expression. Her hands moved slowly, her eyebrows drawn together in concentration. She cupped both sides of Rudy's face and leaned over, inspecting. A moment later, she had an eye-examining tool of some sort in her hand and was peering into Rudy's left eye. When she pulled back, she grinned from cheek to cheek. Caleb let out the breath that had burned in his chest, begging for relief. Only he couldn't let it go until he was sure things were going to be all right. He looks great. Faith moved to check the other eye. Caleb held up his hand. How many fingers am I holding up, Rudy? Faith giggled. Stop. He can't magically count now that he can see. Caleb ignored her sarcasm. Reindeer games taught more than speed, agility, and teamwork. When Rudy was nothing but a calf, they taught him how to count. If he could remember. That would be a big step in getting him to the North Pole. Rudy tapped his hoof three times. Faith's eyebrows shot up. Holy smokes, that's an impressive trick. Caleb laughed and threw his arms around Rudy. You amazing animal, you. I feel like I can fly. Rudy perked up, and his back end lifted a couple inches off the ground. Caleb felt the shift and gently kicked at his back hooves. Not now, you dolt, he whispered. I promise we'll get you in the workout arena soon, though. Rudy's feet settled back down. Faith finished checking him and returned her equipment to the proper places. She was careful about doing things like that. He could imagine her socks were lined up in her drawers and her clothes hung at regular intervals in the closet. While he wasn't a neat freak by any means, he liked things orderly, and Faith's organization skills were one more check mark in the We'd Get Along Forever column. If only she wasn't leaving after Christmas. He sighed before pulling himself back to the happy moment of Rudy's recovery. Are you ready to go home? Rudy lowered his head and shook it. Then, seeming to think better of that, he pawed at the ground. It took some time to get the tractor started up so Caleb could lift the metal kennel from the clinic to the back of Doc's truck. The big rolling door in the side of the recovery room had been installed for just such emergencies, and Caleb was grateful to Doc for thinking ahead. He was also grateful that Pax had thought to be dropped off and driven Caleb's truck home last night. Faith went inside the house to grab his duffel bag, and he took the opportunity to load Rudy. Fastening a harness around the reindeer's chest, he spoke low. Okay, it's just a little hop. Not really flying, you aren't cleared for that kind of activity yet. Understand? Rudy pranced as if the ground was too cold to stand still. But that wasn't the reason he was light-footed. His jolly self was ready to take flight. The harness would do little to slow him down, especially with just Caleb holding onto the lead rope. One good tug in the air and the two of them would be high above Sleigh Bell Country. I'm trusting you, he warned Rudy. They really didn't need two loose reindeer on the news. Ten feet in front of the open kennel, Rudy lifted off the ground. Caleb grabbed the rope with both hands, grateful he'd thought to bring along a pair of leather gloves. But Rudy didn't head for the clouds. Instead, he walked through the air as if walking an invisible shelf that led right into the back of the truck. When his feet clamored against the tailgate, his back end started to slip, but he recovered quickly. We'll have to work on your landings, Caleb quipped, 
earning him a dirty look from the usually lovable reindeer. It wasn't bad, just not smooth enough for Santa. Rudy's ears perked up. Yep. Caleb probably shouldn't be telling Rudy this, what with it being so early in the process, but he wanted to share his relief and excitement with someone. Faith wasn't an option, as she'd only laugh in his face if he mentioned providing Santa with flying reindeer. The surgery puts you back on track to join Santa's reindeer. Rudy's eyes widened, making the white stand out in the shadowy interior of the kennel, and his nose started to glow. Caleb laughed. I'm excited too. Faith hurried out, and he shut the door, locked it, and then shut the tailgate. Faith didn't want Rudy's eyes exposed to 35 miles per hour winds, which was the top speed he was allowed to drive back to the ranch. So they'd covered the kennel with a thick green tarp made from an ancient army tent. Caleb put a finger over his lips. Don't say anything to the others in the barn, okay? We have a lot of training to do. Rudy sat on his backside like a dog. Good. Faith climbed into the truck, carrying his bag and wearing a huge smile. In her other hand was a med kit. She wanted to check on Dunder while she was out at the ranch. Is he all tucked in? As tight as children on Christmas Eve. Caleb slipped behind the steering wheel. He wouldn't have let her carry all that if he didn't need the private time with Rudy. You ready? As ever. Is it crazy that I miss Dunder? I don't think so. But then, I'm one of those crazy wranglers who spends too much time with reindeer and not enough time with people. Faith stared at him. You are on the strange side. Hey. He tickled her side, and she scooted across the seat to get away from him while laughing. Grinning because the whole world felt right, he put the truck in reverse and backed out. His phone chimed. He sighed. Mom's excited about Rudy coming home. He stopped to type out a reply, letting her know they were on the road but it would take some time because he had to drive slowly. Did she miss her firstborn? No. Faith giggled again. I know how she feels. I'm not sure which of you I'll miss more. He rolled his eyes. Great. My competition is a reindeer. Well, there's always Pax. She laughed lightly. I just have to get him to talk to me. Caleb chuckled. His brother had practically fled the scene when he and Faith had gotten home from the sing-along. Pax tended to get tongue-tied around pretty women and hadn't said more than three words to Faith before spraying snow as he'd left the driveway. The drive out to the ranch was slow but enjoyable. They listened to the local radio station that played Christmas music 24-7. Faith hummed along between answering his questions about vet school. She had some great stories, and he liked learning about other animals and the health issues they faced. So many of their problems came from eating things they shouldn't or being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It made him worry for Snowflake. She'd never lived in the wild. He hoped she knew how to find food. She'd already proven she didn't know enough to stay away from people. That might be their fault, though. The Wranglers didn't believe in any type of physical punishment or in rough handling their herd. Dad said Selnora, Santa's head stable elf, had taught great-grandpa how to raise a reindeer right. It was one of the few times an elf had left the North Pole. But with the herd depleting and the U.S. government getting involved, Santa needed someone willing to guard the breed. The elves could have done it, except that they didn't like to be too far away from Christmas magic, it made them grumpy. The turnoff to the ranch appeared, and Caleb signaled even though there wasn't a soul on the road. Faith stared out the window. He knew the moment she spotted the herd, because she let out a gasp of wonder. Did she even know she'd done it? 
The sound was pure and sweet, and it did funny things to his lower belly, making it burn like a yule log. He pulled in and backed up to the barn. The rolling door went up, and he continued to back right into the breezeway. Dad hit the button, and the door went down. Caleb and Faith climbed out to find the entire family gathered around the tailgate. Give the guy some room to breathe. Caleb made shooing motions. Mom clasped her hands in front of her chest. We're all just so happy. Did it all work out? Dad asked Faith. She nodded, her lips pressed together. The surgery was a success. I was able to remove the cataracts in both eyes, and from what we can tell, Rudy can see without obstruction now. Whoop! Forrest threw his hat in the air and hugged Faith. She let out an oomph. Caleb was busy untying the tarp, or he'd thump his brother. Jack caught his eye from across the kennel and laughed. Relax, he's not stealing your girl. Their quiet conversation was covered up by his family's happy chatter with Faith about the surgery and recovery. She's not mine, Caleb muttered. Jack flipped up the first edge of the tarp. You had two days alone with her and you didn't get so much as a kiss. I'm disappointed in you. He shook his head sadly. Not all of us kiss for the fun of it, a kiss means something to me, Caleb fired back. Jack laughed easily, unperturbed by Caleb's barb at his active social life. You're missing out. Besides, Caleb continued as if Jack wasn't trying to talk him into doing something he wanted more than anything else in the world, she's leaving after Christmas. He'd realized that believing in Christmas wasn't the only obstacle in their way. Though Faith's grey eyes dancing was one of the prettiest things he'd ever seen. Oh. Jack's shoulders dropped. So that's it, then. Caleb shrugged in return. They finished uncovering the kennel, and Caleb threw a look at Jack telling him to distract Faith. Jack jumped down and took Faith's arm. I've always wondered about the reindeer's hooves. Their voices trailed off as they reached the passenger side door. Caleb motioned for Pax to open the door, and Forrest lunged for the lead rope. Easy, Caleb told him as Rudy backed into the crate, frightened by the sudden movement. At the sound of Caleb's voice, Rudy cautiously stepped forward. He seemed to meet each set of expectant eyes, matching up the people before him with the fuzzy shapes he'd known before, before stepping off the tailgate into midair. Mom squeezed her eyes shut in relief, and a single tear escaped. Dad side-hugged her and laughed, pleased as punch to see the reindeer so boldly moving through the air. Pax and Forrest exchanged fist bumps. Caleb hopped down and took the lead rope. All right, big guy, enough showing off. Rudy trotted in a circle around him, using as much rope as Caleb would give, while he spiraled to the floor. Everyone surged in to rub his neck or his back, cascading compliments over his head. Rudy lapped them up. Then, he took a moment to inspect each of them, running his eyes over the details that had escaped him for over a year. When he got to Dad, he buried his face in Dad's chest and tears fell from both their eyes. Faith appeared beside Caleb and linked her arm through his as she had at the sing-along. Did she feel the spirit that was here? The specialness of this moment? He glanced down to see her eyes glisten. She tipped her chin up and stole his breath with a look. She did feel it. He could see the lightness and the joy reflected in her eyes. Without thinking, he pressed a kiss to her hair. She leaned into him and he soaked in the feeling of her, of sharing this moment with her, of sharing the magic. Ahem. Blinking Caleb turned to find Mom staring at the two of them, her eyebrows raised and her arms folded over her chest. Whoa boy. Mom was a lot of things, 
but Silent wasn't one of them. He braced for her questions and her comments about that small kiss. Reaching for Faith, Mom pulled her into a hug. You've done a good thing, dear. A very, very good thing. Thank you. Faith returned the hug, and when she stepped back, her smile was huge. My pleasure. Really. I, she looked around at all of them. I can't tell you what the reindeer have done for me. My heart feels fuller, and it's because of them. I know it. Mom beamed. They tend to do that to people. Everyone chuckled. It was a long-standing inside joke that the reindeer had a way of sneaking up on a person and softening their heart against their will. For that Caleb would forever be thankful. Faith wasn't the same person he'd met in the hospital. Well, she was, but she was a better version of herself, freer with her happiness in a way she had kept a lid on before. You're staying for dinner, aren't you? Mom asked Faith. Forrest led Rudy into his stall, chatting about all the things the reindeer had missed while he'd been gone. Apparently, two of the bulls had gotten into an argument that they were still sorting out. The rest of the herd had ostracized them for not behaving, and they were in the far end of the enclosure, glaring at each other. Caleb shook his head. Reindeer. I'd like to stay, but I'm scheduled to have dinner with my dad. She dropped her chin. Caleb's heart went out to her. The conversation she planned wasn't an easy one, but it should bring some closure. Do you want me to go with you? he offered. No, she tucked her hair behind her ear. This is something I need to do alone. Mom gave Caleb a look that said he'd better fill her in later. He smiled in return. Well, in that case. Mom hugged her again. Goodbye, and thank you again. You're welcome at our table anytime. Okay. Faith patted Mom's back. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Dad appeared and put his arm around Mom's shoulders, steering them back to the house. Faith watched them walk away. They're a great couple. I wonder what their secret to staying married so long is. They're both too stubborn to leave the ranch, quipped Forrest as he walked toward the door. He flipped around so he was walking backward and winked. Don't underestimate a stubborn man if he's stubborn for all the right reasons. Faith laughed and waved as he left. Somehow I doubt that's the secret, she said. Pax shuffled over, his hands buried in his pockets. It's a lot of little things. He too left through the side door. Drake followed after them, not offering up any advice or observations. He was nineteen, an age when he still took for granted that his parents made it work. Jack hit the button on the wall and the rolling door went up, signaling that someone had to pull the truck out. Caleb handed the keys to Faith, grateful she'd let him drive Rudy home. Somehow, she'd known he needed a job to keep his mind off things. By the way, Jack called. They're both wrong. Oh. Faith spun to focus on him. Then what is the answer? He pumped his eyebrows, and Caleb groaned. Kissing, and lots of it. With that, Jack sauntered out, leaving Caleb's cheeks burning and his mind spinning. Leave it to his twin to make saying goodbye to the woman he'd shared a house with for two days more awkward. Thanks, Jack. Thanks so much. So, dinner, he fumbled, taking off his hat and running his fingers through his hair. He held his hat in front of him like a shield to keep him from doing something stupid, like taking faith into his arms. They could be good together, so good. But kissing Faith would be a life-altering event, one he might be ready for, but he wasn't sure she was. Chapter 22 December 15th, Evening 
Faith held the bag of takeout down by her side, feeling like she was sneaking past the guards at a high-security prison rather than vicing her dad in a rehab facility. The greasy smell of burgers and fries floated around her like flashing lights, giving away her position. Residents stuck their heads out of doorways, sniffing the air. And workers and scrubs lifted their noses as if they couldn't believe something would overpower the stale bleach smell the janitor's latest mopping had left behind. Even with all the attention she gathered along the way, she couldn't get her feet to move any faster. Burdened by the uncomfortable questions she had to ask, she watched as Dad's door loomed ahead, seeming to get farther away with each step instead of closer. Then, in a blink, she was standing in the open doorway, wondering how she'd gotten there so fast and if she really wanted to go through with this. She clamped her elbow down on her purse, feeling for the other surprises she'd brought Dad. Depending on how things went tonight, she might take them back with her and leave his room without a decoration. Taking courage from Caleb's words that the truth would give her closure, she forced herself into the room. Dad was sitting up in a chair in front of the television, watching a holiday love story unfold on Hallmark. Faith's fear dipped at the sight. That man, a hopeless romantic, really, wasn't going to bite her head off for sticking her nose in where it wasn't wanted. Right? Merry Christmas. She held up the grease-stained bag and wiggled it side to side. I thought you might want something that didn't come on a plastic plate. A smile spread across Dad's face, and he held out his arms. I'd take a hug more than anything. She obliged, noticing that he'd lost weight. Being here was harder on him than he let on. The evidence was right there in the lines on his face. Her heart clenched, and she wondered if she should go through with her plan or let him rest here and gather strength. What if she stressed him out so much he had another heart attack? She pulled back and dragged the rolling tray away from the bed, putting it between them like a table. Okay, I know you're supposed to eat healthy, so these are sweet potato fries, baked, not fried. She set the first tray on the table. Dad leaned over and sniffed like a bloodhound. And then this is a turkey burger on a whole wheat bun, no sauces, but I brought you a packet of light ranch. His eyes brightened. You remembered. She reached for the only other chair in the room, a stool with wheels, and pulled it to her spot at their makeshift table. How could I forget? You're the only person I know who likes ranch dressing on their burger. The waitress made you repeat yourself every year. Dad laughed. And it was the same waitress. What was her name? He snapped his fingers. Annabelle. Angela. Agatha. Annalise, Faith filled in. She didn't only go to the diner with her dad. She and a good friend, Katie, would go there for milkshakes on Thursday afternoons to commiserate over their math test scores. Not that either of them got anything lower than an A-. Their wallowing had more to do with the time it took to get those grades. Mr. Jensen was anything but an easy A. That's right. Dad bowed his head. Faith folded her hands in her lap and said Amen when he finished the prayer over the food. That was another thing that had embarrassed her when she was young. He prayed, even in public, before he ate. She didn't mind it now. In fact, she might just try it herself, over breakfast in the privacy of her home. She'd have to work up to praying in public. This is great faith. Thank you. His humble sincerity was an open window for conversation, and she hurried to climb through. Dad? I have some questions about things. She fiddled with the thin napkin in her lap. Go ahead. He chomped three fries at a time, 
his eyes on her as if he wasn't afraid of anything she had to say. The first Christmas you and mom split was. She swallowed, looking for a word without barbs and settling for, hard. Where were you? Mom said you didn't want us. I just. I've thought a lot about that memory, and I'm not sure I trust it. I'd like to know your perspective. Dad leaned back in his chair and pushed away the burger and fries. He folded one arm over his chest and rested his chin in his other hand. I don't want to say anything bad about your mom. You never have. Unlike what she said about you, but Faith didn't say that part out loud. And I don't want to paint myself as the perfect man, because I'm far from it. Even right now, I have feelings in my heart I'm going to have to talk to Jesus about someday. And it won't be a pleasant conversation. A smile ghosted across Faith's lips. I need to know. You deserve to know. I don't suppose she's told you the whole story from start to finish? Faith pressed her lips together and shook her head. Dad turned his body so he was talking past her, like it was too much to face her head on as he relived his past. When I met your mom, I thought I'd met a ray of sunshine. She was bright and fun and she had a way of making me feel important. His eyes darted to Faith and away again. That was one of the follies of my youth. I always wanted to be somebody. A big deal in town. I cared too much about what people thought of me. Your mom fed into that, pumping my ego. And I lapped it up. He cleared his throat. This was hard for him, talking about the man he used to be. Faith didn't remember that man, but she saw glimpses of him every now and then in her dad. The traits he talked about hadn't disappeared as much as they'd been tempered. She'd like to know how that had happened, so she kept her mouth shut and waited for him to continue. We got married and had you ten months later. I thought life was going my way. I didn't see that your mom struggled. First with. What do they call baby blues these days? Postpartum depression. That's it. He touched the side of his nose. She had it bad and I didn't know what to do, so, like a coward, I withdrew when she'd cry and cry. I couldn't get her to stop, and I thought I was a failure. Then she started calling me a failure, and I got angry and pulled back some more. Faith shook her head. How sad for Mom to have to deal with all that on her own. It must have been difficult. I didn't help it any, Dad nearly whispered. As she was coming out of that, she was bitter, angry at me for not supporting her more. She called me names, threw dishes at me when I came home late from work, and then went down to Joe's on the weekends to forget she was married to a no-good, emotionally distant man. He coughed, grabbing his chest. Faith rubbed his arm in support. They'd had to cut open his sternum in order to do the surgery, and a cough had to hurt like the devil. He settled back, his face drawn. She left, taking you, which surprised the heck out of me. I thought if she wanted out, she would have left you behind. At first, I was so angry, thinking she had taken you to spite me. Later, I realized she was a decent mom and she loved you, it was just me she didn't want. The version Dad painted was like looking through her memories with a new set of glasses. She could make out lines that weren't there before, ones that had been crossed by both parties. His admission of emotionally abandoning her mom colored so much of the bitterness her mother spewed against Dad. Also, knowing her mom wasn't the saint she painted herself to be shaded Faith's own feelings toward her. She loved her mom. She did. But there were times when living with her was hard because she'd lose it over the smallest thing, 
like not hanging up her backpack. Faith was a good kid, better than many who were into drugs, drinking, and sex. They might not have gone to church, but Mom held Faith to a certain standard. The truth was, she hadn't dared break any of her mom's rules, spoken or unspoken, because mom's temper was volatile. She'd never hit Faith, but she was physically intimidating, throwing plates across the room like dad talked about and scaring her into being good. Christmas, she prompted, not sure she wanted more of her wounds under the microscope of dad's life story. I didn't know where you were, he said simply. What? Faith leaned forward, not sure she'd heard him. I didn't know where you were. Your mom took off and didn't make contact until the next February. I was out of my mind with worry over you. Faith fell back against the chair. So you didn't refuse to send us money? His face grew soft and he reached for her hand. No, baby. When your mom finally called, I offered her the house and everything in it, if she'd move back to town so I could see you. She refused. We divorced, and the courts laid out child support and visitation. By then, she'd established a life for your two in Grafton, and I was given holiday visits. Faith's hand curled around his. Then why didn't you move to Grafton? The question was an accusation in and of itself. If he couldn't get mom to move here, why didn't you come after me? Dad's shoulders fell. I thought you were better off if I stayed away. Why, she yelled, unable to hold back the feelings of abandonment that had grown quietly inside of her for decades. It was several things. Your mom made visiting hard by changing times at the last minute, being out of the house when I got there, and sometimes not letting me see you at all. I didn't want you to be a bargaining chip, but your mom felt that you were the ticket to getting what she wanted from me. After a while, I was flat broke and worn down. Faith surged to her feet. So you gave up? Her hands clenched into fists. Dad nodded. I was fighting a losing battle, and it was tearing you up. He lifted his steel blue eyes to meet hers. I loved you enough to step aside. She drew her arms to her chest and hugged herself. I wish you'd kept fighting. She admitted the deepest desire of her heart in a whisper. I know. And I'm so sorry. He hung his head. His admission of guilt and his apology hung in the air between them, asking Faith if she'd be willing to accept either. I need a moment. She stepped into the hallway and leaned against the wall, needing space to breathe and clear her head. She tipped her head back, staring at the popcorn-textured ceiling. What am I supposed to do? Soft piano music started. She strained to make out the tune, Angels We Have Heard On High. Following the sound, she found herself in an empty gathering room. The music wasn't coming from the piano in the corner but through the speakers. Sitting in a folding chair Faith pulled out her phone and dialed Caleb. She just wanted to hear his voice. Merry Christmas, he answered. She warmed at his deep timbre. I'm not sure how merry it is right now, she said without the usual pleasantries. She'd had breakfast with this man just this morning while wearing her bathrobe, that gave her the right to jump into a conversation. Uh-oh. Wanna talk about it? She heaved a sigh. I'm still sorting through some things. How's your dad? Right now? He's probably wondering if I'm going to chew him out or hug him. Which one do you want to do? Both. Welcome to having a family. She warmed at the way he lightened the mood without making light of her feelings. He's sorry for what he did, 
but I'm not sure I can forgive in the blink of an eye. Do you think he's just barely sorry? She thought on that. No. He's felt bad about this for years. And he'll probably feel bad for a while longer. True. Guilt like the kind Dad carried didn't go away with a few words. It had to be rooted out by change and through Jesus. So what's holding me back? Change isn't easy. What would she have to change? No, it's not. And maybe there's something you want to say to him that's hard for you too? He pinpointed the problem so easily, it startled her. Caleb Nicolas, you're pushing all my buttons right now. He chuckled. Sorry. I'm just being honest with you. I appreciate it. And I don't. He outright laughed, and she warmed all over. She could do this, she could say the things that were in her heart. Even if Dad pushed her away or whatever, as he was a confessed emotional abandoner, it was a possibility, she'd make it through. Thanks for talking to me. Anytime. How's Rudy? She'd been reluctant to leave him at the ranch, but the reindeer seemed at peace there and ready for a nap. He's itching to get to the workout arena. Any idea of when he'll be ready? Eyes heal fast. He can try a light workout tomorrow afternoon if you're willing to help him take it slow. He'll be thrilled with that. Thanks. You're welcome. She cradled the phone, not wanting this warm feeling to go away. You're stalling, aren't you? She laughed. Yes, and pointing it out isn't helping. Except that he was helping, because she felt better, calmer, and more like herself than she had when she'd walked out of her dad's room. It was strange how Caleb was the person she wanted to call to talk over her feelings. They'd grown close over the time they'd shared a roof, and she didn't want that to go away. It would have to once she moved back to Grafton. She'd already done the long-distance relationship thing with Dad and wasn't too thrilled about picking it up with a boyfriend. Not that Caleb was her boyfriend. He hadn't even kissed her, and he'd had opportunities. It was just. She'd never been this close to someone before, never been willing to share her pain nor call in an emotional crisis. Thanks, she blurted. For what? For being someone I can count on. I haven't had a lot of those in my life, and I recognize a good thing when I see it. Anne. I'm a good thing. Her whole body warmed at his suggestive tone. Ah. Uh, geez. Why do you have to say it like that? He laughed. Because it makes you blush. Admit it. You're blushing right now. I'm hanging up right now, she teased him back. Faith, he hurried to say. Yeah, I think you're pretty great too. Oh. You think I'm pretty. Good to know. Two could play his word game, and she found that being on the other end of it was sweet. He laughed. That too. But then, I've never made a secret about how gorgeous you are. Gorgeous? She giggled. Now you're just trying to butter me up, but I like it, so don't stop. You got it. Good luck with document. I hope you two work things out. Thanks. Me too. Let me know how that workout goes. I will. They said, goodbye, and she hung up. Setting the phone in her lap, she stared at it for a moment. The conversation with Dad had shifted her world. That movement was jarring and painful. 
Caleb was also rearranging things in her heart, but those changes were warm cider and welcome and made her a better person. She pushed to her feet and made her way back to Dad's room. He'd eaten a couple more bites of his turkey burger, but other than that, the room was the same as she'd left it. The television was silent and dark, and Dad sat in his chair, his chin down and his arms folded. He was peaceful, like he was praying. Maybe he was. Are you praying? She blurted into the otherwise silent room. He rubbed his lips together as he lifted his head. I was. She came into the room and sat back down across the rolling table. I'm afraid to ask what you're bothering God about. He shook his head. We are never a bother to God. We're his children, and he loves to hear from us. You're probably right, she conceded. Throwing her shoulders back, she looked at her dad. Thank you for apologizing. I'm. She took a moment to search her heart. I'm still confused about some things, and I mourn the time we lost together. Dad moved to speak, but she held up a hand. I'm aware that some of the blame for that lands on my shoulders. I can brush it off as being a teenager, too immature to see further than my Friday night plans, but I wish I had done some things differently too. I could have made an effort to call you more. And since we're bearing our sins here, the thought crossed my mind often and I shoved it away, rationalizing that if you wanted to know about my life, you'd call more often. In hindsight, I realize how difficult both mom and I were. She shook her head. I guess there's no good excuse for either of us. Dad's cheeks wrinkled as he gave her a tentative smile. Perhaps we can start over? From here. I don't know. I can't just wipe away the hurt, Dad. I know. I don't expect you to. And if something comes up you want to talk about, I'm okay to visit that with you. But maybe we could just start acting like the father and daughter we want to be and see where it goes, no holding back. Faith's chest warmed, and she recognized the feeling she'd had at the sing-along, the sense that Jesus was in this moment. And why shouldn't he be? He was the ultimate forgiver, so he would be here when she faced the challenge of forgiving. If that's what you want, then I have something for you. She stood up and found her purse, pulling out the items she'd brought and holding them up. Dad's eyes lit up. Our stockings. She smiled, feeling like she was moving on to firm, supportive ground instead of the rocky path she stumbled over when talking about the past. How many years did you hang this up? Every year, he replied fervently. She reveled in the knowledge that he'd loved her, even from afar, even though she'd held back. Well, I think we should hang them in your room here. Deal? She moved to the wall across from his bed, where a bulletin board with several pins hung. They should be strong enough to hold up empty stockings. He picked up his burger and took a big bite. We can't forget to take them home for Santa to fill, though. Faith smiled over her shoulder as she worked to push the pin into the tired old cork. What? No protest that Santa is real? Dad goaded her. She shrugged. I'm okay, with a little Christmas spirit. Dad laughed. There's hope for you yet, girl. She finished and stepped back to admire the stockings. They hung straight and brought a sense of holiday to the room that was missing before. Well, you're out of hope, old man. Because I'm going to kick your butt at Rummy. She pulled a deck of cards out of her purse and plunked them on the table. Dad grinned. You haven't beat me yet. I let you win, she countered. For twenty years? I don't think so. 
He finished his burger and cleaned off the table, shoving wrappers and garbage back into the sack so they'd have a place to play. Faith grinned. We'll see. Don't think I'll take it easy on you because you have a weak heart. I'd be mad if you did. She smiled as she shuffled the deck. They said Christmas was a time for miracles, and maybe this was hers. She'd not only gotten her dad back from a near-fatal heart attack, but she'd gotten him into her life in a way she'd never thought possible. If that wasn't a miracle, she didn't know what was. And then there was Caleb. He'd become an important part of her life too. Undeniable after the way she'd turned to him tonight. But what was she supposed to do about it? He'd never leave that ranch, and her life, financial and otherwise, was in Grafton. Sure, she and Dad would make this work, any time they spent together would be more time than before. But a romantic relationship would die a slow and painful death with the distance. As fun as it was to flirt with Caleb, she had a feeling he was going to be the one who got away. The thought was like a branding iron to her heart and made her want to cry out in pain. If just thinking about letting him go caused this much sorrow, what would actually driving away do to her? Chapter 23 December 16th Lunch was an hour ago, but that didn't mean that it was warm on the ranch. Caleb tucked his gloved hands in his pockets and leaned into the wind. Old Man Winter decided to wake up with a vengeance this morning and take it out on North Dakota. Despite the freezing temperatures Caleb was determined to get Rudy into the workout arena. Making a flying reindeer go slow was always a project. In the past, they'd used weights and sleighs and lead ropes. Since this was Rudy's first time flying in a long time, he could be timid. Or he could be a complete idiot and go zero to one thousand in a blink, slamming himself into the wall or bleachers. It had happened before. Thankfully, the arena was heated enough that they wouldn't freeze, it was getting there that was the hard part. His legs were numb and his cheeks burned from exposure. Next time, he'd bring a scarf. He stumbled into the barn his feet cold as bricks and making him trip over the smallest pebble. Banging his hands against his legs to encourage circulation, he ducked into the workroom, where Pax was working on the runner for the big sleigh. Pax wore a welding helmet, lifted so he could inspect the curve on the front of the long piece of steel. How's it coming? Caleb moved closer to the forge, grateful for the heat that poured out of it like warm caramel. The barn was kept at 50 degrees so the animals and humans would be comfortable in the winter, but he was cold enough he needed extra help. It's coming. Those three days it took to set up, vaccinate, and take down put me off schedule. I'll be lucky to get it done in time for the parade. Using a sledgehammer, he pounded against the steel, then nodded that he liked the shape. Pax was in his own world out here comfortable with himself and the work. Though he didn't seem perturbed that Caleb had interrupted. You going to work with Rudy? he asked. Caleb grinned. Yep. I promised him he'd get to fly today. I've never seen so much prance in his step. We may have to rename him. Pax hammered three more times. He came from Rudolph's line, though. Seeing that his joke had landed flat Caleb just went along with the conversation instead of trying to explain what he meant. That he did. So maybe we'll keep it. Toasty now, and starting to sweat in all his layers, he moved away from the flame. Stop over if you want. See how he does. I'll wait to hear your report over supper. Sounds good. Caleb patted the doorframe once and then went to get Rudy. Pax was hard to read. Caleb would like a closer, better relationship with his brother, but it took two people. 
Maybe Pax was fine not ever talking about important things together, but Caleb missed the kid who used to follow him around the ranch and talk his ear off. Rudy was upside down in his stall, standing on the ceiling just because he could. You enjoying the view from up there? Caleb called. Rudy ran around the outside walls in a spiral until he was standing in front of Caleb. He headbutt him. Yeah, you get to fly today. Caleb rubbed between his ears. I expect you've been waiting long enough for this, so let's get you in a harness. Caleb hurried out to the tack room to find a leather harness that would fit Rudy. The gear hung along the far wall with the reindeer's name on a board above their stuff. Kind of like a coat room in elementary school. They didn't have gear for Rudy. Caleb tapped his chin as he contemplated his options. Rudy butted his back, anxious to get going. Startled that the reindeer had followed him into the tack room Caleb jumped. Hey, you're not supposed to come in here. He laughed. I didn't think you ever would, but look at you. You enjoy exploring this ranch, don't you? He turned back to the wall. I think you're about the same size as Waffles. He reached for the butter-colored leather. Waffles didn't fly but could pull a sleigh. I won't tell him you borrowed his getup if you don't. Rudy winked in response. Caleb grinned. The energy coming off the reindeer was all Christmas hope and buckets of faith. Harnessing a reindeer who wasn't used to a harness was always an experience, but they usually worked with young reindeer, not almost grown ones. Rudy kept trying to turn around and look at what was happening, making him chase his tail. Which in turn made Caleb laugh and his fingers stumble. If you don't hold still, we're never getting out of here. Rudy huffed as if Caleb was the one slowing them down. You think so, but it doesn't take Dunder this long to gear up. Rudy scowled. Don't like being compared to a legend, huh? He leaned closer to Rudy's ear. Let's see about making you a legend too. Rudy lowered his head and shook as if he had a full rack on and the move was impressive. It wasn't so much so without the antlers, but Caleb got the idea. Rudy was feeling his potential, and it was time to get him in the air. They made a mad dash from the barn to the arena doors. Caleb fumbled with the latch while Rudy watched him with one raised eyebrow, asking, what's your problem? The weather's fine. Some of us aren't built for the cold. The door flew open and Caleb fell inside, barely catching himself and staying upright. The things I do for you, he mumbled. Rudy stood inside and stared at all the apparatuses and training tools. They had different level blocks to jump from. The higher ones were for new reindeer, the longer the fall, the more time they had to get their hooves under them. The shorter blocks were for the more experienced reindeer. Santa's crew had to be able to take off in one leap. Ramps provided a chance to practice takeoffs on an incline, like a rooftop. The house stop next to it had two sloping sides to practice landing on uneven surfaces. There were also bars for walking across, and then, in the air, were lead ropes. A ladder led up to the platform where the wrangler would attach a wire from the harness to the lead. With this setup, the reindeer could work on flying straight or flying in tandem with another reindeer if they put two together up there. Getting a rhythm was important when pulling a sleigh, and if they were going to be among the chosen eight, they had to be able to fly in sync. More toys and reindeer games were scattered about, including hoops to jump through and hoops for playing catch. Balls and even dolls filled the toy box. The outside edges of the arena were tamped down by years of running with reindeer. Let's try some laps. He changed into his running shoes and took up the lead rope. You can't fly faster than me, got it? Rudy gulped. This was his big day. 
If he couldn't make it around the arena without crashing into a wall, his chances of making it to the North Pole were slim. But Caleb didn't have to tell him that. They started off at a walk, with Rudy keeping pace beside him, all four feet on the ground. When Caleb felt like he was warm enough to run without pulling a muscle, he gave the command, on, Rudy, and threw his arm forward, telling the reindeer to get off the ground. Rudy tripped over his front feet as he worked to get into the air. The lead rope wouldn't let him fly higher than Caleb's elbow, but loft wasn't their goal. They did two laps before Caleb broke a sweat. Rudy landed on shaking legs with eyes full of satisfaction. You did good. Caleb patted his neck. Let's try some rings. Flying through rings took precision and concentration. When pulling Santa's sleigh, a reindeer had to concentrate for hours at a time, dodging obstacles like snow, sleet, and even military airplanes. See those two rings? He pointed at the ones in the middle of the arena. Rudy followed where he pointed and stared. I want you to fly through one, go to the end of the dirt, turn around, and come back through the other. This was a simple exercise. Normally, he'd have another reindeer demonstrate, but he didn't have one today. He took the lead rope off Rudy and stepped back. Go on. Try it out. Rudy stumble started again. Dang, they'd have to work on that. He shouldn't be tripping over air. The reindeer kept looking down, like he was afraid he'd drop out of the sky at any moment. Losing his sight had taken away his confidence in his own amazing abilities. Caleb rubbed his jaw, wondering if it would come back. The door squeaked open and Jack came in, lifting a gloved hand in greeting even as his eyes glued onto Rudy. Rudy made his approach and got through the first loop. He trotted over to Caleb, his tongue hanging out. He'd gotten it half right and was darn proud of himself for that. Caleb clapped, and Jack joined in. Positive encouragement mattered to a reindeer. Rudy dipped his head to acknowledge their praise. Jack sidled up beside him. You trying to get him to do the back and forth? I only explained it once. He'd never done it before, so. Don't get all defensive. Jack pounded Caleb's back. I was just trying to catch up. Come on. Caleb hurried to the stand where the hoops rose up out of the metal base. Rudy hovered over his shoulder. Caleb pointed to the hoop on the right. One. He then pointed to Jack, who had jogged to the end of the dirt, already knowing what he had planned. Two. Then he pointed to the second loop. Three. And finally, he pointed to himself. Four. Got it? He went through the numbers and pointing again. If he gets this, then he's smarter than half the reindeer we've sent to Santa, Jack called from the other end. Rudy's eyes sparked with challenge. He backed up and got into position to go through the first hoop. Ah, uh, no. You gotta start on the ground. Caleb pointed down. Rudy rolled his eyes but lowered himself to the arena floor. Good. Caleb jogged to the opposite end of the dirt. He cupped his hands around his mouth and called, on, Rudy. Rudy had his usual rough takeoff, but then he got through the hoop without incident. Come on, Rudy, Jack called to encourage him to go all the way. Rudy loped down to Jack. That's two. Go three, boy. Rudy made it through the correct hoop. Down here. Caleb waved his arm at the same time Jack yelled, four. Four. The reindeer loped to Caleb, circled above his head, and then landed with a grunt. Caleb threw his arms around his neck. That was beautiful. Jack ran over, his boots kicking up sand behind him. 
I can't believe you got that. He hip bumped Rudy's shoulder. That was incredible, tell me that was your first time, and I might kiss your shiny red nose. Rudy shuddered and stepped away, eyeing Jack as if he'd gone crazy. Caleb Belly laughed. It was his first time, but if you try to kiss him, he'll run you over. Jack waved off Rudy's grumpy face. He caught the reindeer's eye. Can you do it without me over there? Rudy pushed between the two of them so he was at the starting point and pawed the ground. It was Jack's turn to be surprised. Where did this attitude come from? It's not attitude, it's determination, Caleb replied. On, Rudy. Rudy was off. Not at full speed, but at a clip he could make the hoops and turns. When he came to land in front of them, he kicked up a leg and sprayed sand all over Jack's legs. Caleb laughed. In case you missed it, that was attitude. Rudy chortled. He trotted over to the water trough. So. Jack brushed off his pants. They were on a training break, which meant the floor was open for conversation. What's going on with you and the vet? Did you kiss her yet? Caleb kicked sand over Jack's boots too. That's none of your business. Which means you haven't. Jack shook out his leg, sand falling like water from his pants. Is it because she doesn't believe? Caleb thought back to Faith's face during the sing-along. The quiet peace. The radiant joy. She's coming around. I'm not as worried about all that as I was, it's the long-distance thing. I don't think she'd move to town. You mean you're falling for her? I didn't say that. Jack went on as if he hadn't denied a thing. Better you than me. I'm not looking to settle down yet. We aren't getting any younger. Caleb walked over and glanced in the trough. It was half empty. Rudy's sides went in and out quickly. He was tiring but determined. This was the end of their workout today. Caleb wasn't going to push the animal harder than was good for him so soon after a surgery. Though his eyes seemed to work just fine, the anesthesia had slowed his body down. I'll always be younger than you, Jack quipped. A statement that hadn't held much weight while they were growing up. In fact, at every birthday Caleb took great joy in reminding his brother that he was the oldest. Seriously, though. Jack stared down at the dirt and kicked a clod. Are you going to marry her? Caleb copied his posture. Not because he was trying to make fun of his twin, but because they had a lot of the same mannerisms. We're a ways out from that, but everything in my heart says she'd the one for me. Jack lifted his gaze, a lazy half-grin on his face. Then it's time to take her on a sleigh ride. A sleigh ride was a huge deal at the reindeer ranch. It meant commitment and revealing all their secrets and inviting someone into their world, forever. Once a person stepped into a flying sleigh, they were never the same. Caleb shook his head, rubbing the back of his neck. We don't have a flying reindeer who can pull a sleigh. Right, well, we have a lot who can pull a sleigh on the ground. Start there. He reached for the lead rope and attached it to Rudy's harness. I'll take him back and brush him down. Thanks. Caleb went to the bench and sat down so he could change out his running shoes. He dumped a half cup of sand out before putting them on the rack. When he was alone in the arena, he called Faith. She answered, and he asked, What are you doing? I'm cleaning Muffins' teeth. He jerked, not expecting that answer. Sounds fun. It's a laugh a minute. Is Rudy okay? She asked the last part quickly, as if she'd just realized what time it was and that he would be working with the reindeer. 
He just finished his workout, and he did better than I expected, better than Jack expected. And that's saying something. Don't worry, we took it easy on him. I don't worry at all. You treat those reindeer like princes. And Dunder. Has he gotten a workout yet? Caleb's shoulders fell. He's still moving slow. The virus really took it out of him. A reindeer his age may not get back to his old self. Sometimes they just. Don't. That's depressing. He paused and straightened his back. But not why I called. Oh. He looked at the hoops, remembering Rudy's determination. If the reindeer could face a challenge head-on, so could he. Will you go on a sleigh ride with me? His hands grew slick and he rubbed one on his leg, traded the phone hands, and rubbed the other one clean. Sure. It sounds like a merry event. Did you just make a Christmas pun? She hesitated. I think I did. Wow. I'm impressed. She giggled. He pressed on, encouraged by her lightness. I'll pick you up tomorrow afternoon for a sunset ride. Now I'm impressed. It's a date. He wanted to make sure she knew that his intentions were for courting and romance. It is, darn it. He was on his feet in a blink. What? Did she not want romance? Had he jumped from friends to more too fast? Well, if it's a date, I gotta dress up, and I have nothing to wear for a sleigh ride. He grinned. She was flirting with him. Well, I plan to wear everything I own to ward off the cold, if that helps. Aya. A no-pressure date. Something clattered in the background. None, come as you are. You asked for it. Ha. I can take anything you can dish out. We'll see about that. They said goodbye, and he hung up. This was good. They were moving in the right direction, together. Maybe she'd go back to the city and her life and they'd have one great date to remember. Or maybe this was the start of something more. He wouldn't know until he tested the winds. His hat knocked forward and flash blew across his vision, barely clearing his head. Hey! Caleb yelled at Jack, who was smirking from the door. Have fun with that one. He's been pent up too long and needs to stretch his legs. Flash zoomed circles around the arena. His speed was his greatest strength, but he had two gears, stop and go. I thought you were going to help with workouts today. Caleb enjoyed their time together with Rudy. Seemed like now that they were all grown up, he and Jack didn't hang out as much. There were times when the distance between them was like ringing a gong and feeling the vibrations in his soul, not an entirely pleasant feeling. I changed my mind. I'm off to town to find someone to smooch under the mistletoe. Good luck with that. In their small town, he was more likely to find a horse under the mistletoe than he was a girl. You should take some on your date, it's a guaranteed goodnight kiss. I don't need a weed to help me get a kiss. I have my Nicola's charm. Too bad you didn't get any, Caleb fired back at him. Jack flipped his head. As if. They both grinned. See ya. Bye. Caleb put his hands on his hips and turned to watch Flash. He checked his watch. It would be another twenty minutes before the reindeer wore himself out enough to do anything productive. He sat back down and leaned back, thinking about faith. A no-pressure date. He liked the sound of that. A chance to get to know one another as potential romantic partners sounded. Like online dating. He wanted more than exchanging basic info. He wanted to hold her hand, to hold her. A normal date wouldn't do. 
he'd need to sweep her off her feet without looking like he was trying too hard. That was the trick. He rubbed his palms together as a plan began to form. Chapter 24 December 17th When you said we were going on a sleigh ride, I didn't think you'd bring a reindeer to my house. Faith stared in shock at the gray animal with the green leather harness. Are those silver bells? Only the best for you. Caleb grinned as he swept his arm out to showcase the two-seater black sleigh. She had to admit that the color combination was striking, almost royal in appearance. The sleigh itself was made from wood but painted a dark black on the exterior with silver trim and steel runners. Come on, I'll introduce you to the reindeer so he doesn't try to throw you out on a tight curve. Caleb took her elbow, but Faith planted her boots in the snow. Would he do that? Well. Caleb scratched the back of his neck. See, the thing is, there's an etiquette that's involved with sleigh rides. Reindeer, our reindeer, at least, are kind of particular about these things. Oh. Now you have my attention. Caleb pumped his eyebrows suggestively before assuming a serious face. Reindeer are happy enough to pull a sleigh, but they are picky about who they let in it. Of course, every reindeer in the herd is dying to be a part of Santa's team, so she never has an issue stepping into a sleigh. Wait. Faith touched his forearm. She had on a thick pair of gloves stuffed to the fingers with hand warmers, but even then, touching Caleb raised her temperature. That's the second time you've referred to Santa as a she, what's up with that? Santa's daughter took over a few years back. Ginger flies the big sleigh now and runs things at the North Pole. Faith stared at him, her mouth agape. Was he serious? Are you serious? He nodded. She'd think he was teasing her, except his eyes held none of the usual sparkle that came when he was trying to pull one over on her. He truly believed Santa's daughter delivered toys. Okay, then. Who was she to judge? He could believe in whatever kind of Santa he wanted. As they made their way to the front of the sleigh so she could be introduced to the reindeer, she rolled around the idea of Santa's daughter inheriting the position. Why not? Women were perfectly capable of fulfilling Santa's duties. She kind of liked the idea, actually. This is Lucky. Lucky, this is Faith. She's going on a ride with us this afternoon. Caleb motioned for her to address the reindeer. A couple of weeks ago, she would have felt foolish being introduced to a reindeer, but after spending so much time with Rudy, she didn't have any reservations. Hello there, good looking. She held out her hand and let him come to her, sniffing. He lipped at her fingers, looking for a treat and making her laugh. Sorry, Caleb jumped in. No treats until we get where we're going. Lucky grunted and then jerked his head toward the sleigh, telling them to get in already. Faith laughed. I guess I passed the test. She climbed in the sleigh feeling like she was taking a big step. This was her and Caleb's first official date. One day, she'd tell her grandchildren about her sleigh ride with a real reindeer. Peeking out of the corner of her eye, she tried to picture life with Caleb. It would be a simple life, on the ranch, no doubt. The man had roots deeper than the poplar trees that populated the forests here. Their white trunks with black markings were beautiful in the winter wonderland. On, Lucky! Caleb called in a deep voice. Lucky strained against the harness for only a moment before the sleigh started cruising easily behind him. He kept his head up and his ears turning every which way. 
The sleigh bells were beautiful. Not too much, but just loud enough that they created a music of their own. Faith slid her arm under Caleb's and hugged his side, for warmth. He grinned down at her. There's blankets. She glanced down and found a pile of plaid fleece. When she reached for them, she found that they were warm and hugged them to her chest. What magic is this? He chuckled. Not magic, bricks. I heated them in the barn's fireplace before heading your way. There's a couple in special compartments in the seat too to help us stay warm. I should have told you all this when we got in, but we're burning daylight. She draped the blanket over the two of them, making sure the bricks were covered too. It's so cozy. How do you like traveling by sleigh? She glanced around at the scenery moving by. It's nice. I like being a part of nature while we're moving. And it's nice not to be in a hurry for once. He nodded, turning into town. He managed to stick to roads that weren't plowed, so the runners weren't scratched up. Pax would have his head for messing with his polished job. They waved at people out shoveling their walks or running errands. One woman dropped her grocery bag and stared at them. Caleb's ears went dark red and he ducked into his scarf. Who was that? Faith prodded. He moaned. Nobody. Oh no. He wasn't getting off that easily. In my experience, when a man says nobody, it means she used to be his somebody. Faith turned in her seat and looked at the woman. She had long, blonde hair and wore a fitted plaid peacoat with tall boots. Faith hated her. Not really, but a huge surge of competitiveness reared up and made Faith want to throw a snowball in the woman's face. Let's just say Hazel wanted to be my someone. We went to prom together and everything. It didn't work out. He turned them into a park and headed toward a beautiful white gazebo set on the hill. Excitement grew like ice on windows doing a cold front. Hmm. He glanced down at Faith again. I can promise you I never took Hazel on a sleigh ride. Faith giggled. Even though it seemed silly, she liked the idea that warm bricks, blankets, and riding in a one reindeer sleigh was their thing. Her attention was diverted as they drew closer to the gazebo. The steps were lined with bright red poinsettias, and Edison lights hung across the ceiling, creating a soft glow that would be stunning as soon as the sun went down, which would be any minute. I hope you don't mind an early supper. Caleb pulled the reindeer to a stop, and they lurched as the runners gained traction. I skipped lunch today, so I don't mind at all. She folded the blanket and put it back over the brick to hold in the heat. Caleb frowned. Why? Because I was in a hurry to get everything done. I would have waited, he argued. She spun west and opened her arms wide, soaking up the last rays of sunlight. But this wouldn't have. The orange sun was big and softened at the edges as it touched the horizon. Caleb came to stand behind her and placed his hands on her hips. Her heart leapt and she leaned against him, afraid her knees would give out. His woodsy scent, mingled with the crisp air and the smoke from nearby chimneys, filled her senses. This is the second best place to watch a sunset, he said low, his breath warm against the sensitive skin beneath her ear. What's the first? He chuckled, the sound coming from deep in his chest and reverberating through her. I'm going to keep that as a surprise. She took his hands and folded them over her front. I can live with that. Although it's hard to top this moment. I can think of a couple ways to make it better, he mumbled. She thrilled at the possibilities, 
because she could think of some pretty wonderful ways to kick up a sunset too. Remembering the reasons not to fall for Caleb was getting harder and harder. While they were being friendly and exploring the waters, that didn't mean she had to go and give her heart away even if he was intent on sneaking off with it. The hill was the perfect spot to observe every shade of the sky as it dropped from grey-white to scarlet and then navy blue. When the first star came out, she pointed. Make a wish. Caleb gazed down at her. Mine already came true. She turned in his arms and wrapped her hands around his neck. Did you happen to bring some mistletoe? His face went white. Shoot. No. Really? I'm shocked. He looked like he could kick himself. Jack told me I should, but I didn't want to see too forward, since it's a first date and all. She laughed feeling heady and reckless. We lived together for two days. I don't think it would have been too forward. No? She reached up and kissed his cheek, slowly, deliberately, letting her breath warm his skin. Was that too forward? she whispered. I don't think so. He pulled back so he could see her face. He nuzzled her nose. I like being with you, Faith. Me too. She relaxed a bit into that phrase. They weren't promising the world, their futures, or anything beyond enjoying some time together, which took a lot of stress off this almost kiss. If he'd just lean in and get it over with, then her heart would stop hammering against her ribs and she'd be able to take a full breath. He kissed her cheek and then her jaw. She angled to give him better access to her neck, but he used his thumb to pull her chin back down and brushed his lips across hers. Sparklers! Her skin prickled with awareness, and she moaned involuntarily. Caleb answered with a growl and kissed her again, slowly, exploring the feelings growing between them. She wrapped her arms around his neck and held on. When they pulled apart, she glanced down, feeling shy. She'd never put that much feeling into a kiss before. It was like all the other times she'd kissed, she'd been worried about what the guy was thinking or if she was screwing things up. But with Caleb, she'd lost herself and just felt. And the feelings were beautiful. Hey! Caleb lifted her chin. I don't know how much time we'll have together, but I'd like to make the most of it. So you want to kiss me again, she teased without thinking. Caleb tickled her side. Yes. Yes, I do. He kissed her quickly. And I'll probably do that again before I drop you back home. But what I meant was... I'd like to have this Christmas with you, no talk of what comes after. Let's just see where it all goes in the next week. She counted in her head. Seven days until Christmas. Not even a full twelve to count down. It wouldn't be enough. But it would be a memory she could carry with her for a lifetime. I'd like that. He hugged her close. We have to do all the Christmas couple things. Releasing her, he showed her to the gazebo, where there was an outdoor couch with huge red cushions and a table covered in heated dishes, warmed by candles burning underneath. Two questions. She held up one finger. What couple things? And, she popped up the second finger. When did you do all this? He laughed. I did this right before I came to get you. And we'll brainstorm Christmas couple things while we eat. Deal. She settled into the couch while he pulled the lids off the different foods. One was chicken soup, and the other was rolls. They had hot chocolate to drink and warm rice pudding for dessert. 
With all the care Caleb took on her behalf Faith hardly felt the chill in the air. By the time he finished kissing her goodnight, she could have started a forest fire. As she let herself into the house, she sighed happily. She'd never had a boyfriend at Christmas. This was a new adventure, albeit a temporary one. She found herself humming jingle bells as she put on her pajamas. It was easy to get caught up in the holiday when Caleb loved it so much. Maybe even after she left the reindeer wrangler behind, she'd hang on to some holiday cheer. Either that or she'd end up with a broken heart and never want to celebrate Christmas again. Nope. She spoke out loud to give her thoughts more weight. I'm not going to fall in love with him. And I'm going to keep Christmas in a separate compartment. Her heart snickered like it knew better, but she told it to shush and squeezed her eyes shut, willing sleep to come so she could wake up quicker. She and Caleb were going Christmas shopping tomorrow. Chapter 25 December 18th Caleb laced his fingers through Faith's, on air that she let him. She glanced up from the shaving kit she debated over for her dad and winked. He tripped over how happy that wink made him feel. He was flying without a reindeer, and it felt so good. The local feed store was a compact version of a box store found in other towns. Sleigh Bell Country didn't need much more than a half rack of men's clothing, a whole one for the ladies, and a couple patterns of bedsheets with matching towels and bathroom mats to choose from. However, when December first rolled around, they packed the aisles until the fire marshal came in, waving his badge around, and demanding they keep walkways open. Caleb had been here one year when Marshal Adams had shown up, his face red and spit flying from his mouth as he barked orders. The shop owner, Timothy Wright, had been just as loud and animated. It was right then that Caleb had ruled out a career in retail. I think I'll get him the one with the shaving bar. Faith put the red box back and tucked the brown one into the crook of her arm. What about you? Anything you need to pick up? He nodded. Something for my dad. Reaching across her, he took the red box. Thanks for helping me decide. She laughed, and they made their way to the registers and then stepped out of the gold-framed doors. Caleb shuddered and stopped to button up his coat. Caleb. He spun around, looking for the person who had called out to him. Who's that? Faith asked. He rolled his eyes. Carly Jefferson. I can't imagine what she wants. Carly and a cameraman he didn't recognize weaved in and out of the crowd on the sidewalk to catch Caleb. Phew, I wasn't sure you heard me. Carly tossed her long hair over her shoulder, thought better of it, and draped it all over one shoulder, patting the curls to make sure they were bouncy. What can I help you with, Carly? He didn't like the cameraman sizing him up. Caleb stood taller, beating him by at least an inch. Faith held his arm and stepped closer. He loved her possessiveness and wished it meant more than it probably did. Carly ran her tongue over her teeth as if checking for lipstick. I've been calling the ranch, but no one is home. He shared a look with Faith, telling her that they knew full well who was calling and they hadn't answered on purpose. She stifled her laughter with a cough. Have you heard about the reindeer sightings in Yellowstone? Carrie pressed. Caleb lowered his brow. That's strange. Reindeer aren't native to Yellowstone. I know. She giggled. That's part of the story. How did the reindeer get there? But also, people say it flies. He shot his eyebrows up in mock surprise that he hoped came across as real shock. Flies? Yes. I'd love a quote from a reindeer expert. It could get my story picked up by the network. 
Carly clasped her hands around her microphone in front of her chest and pleaded with him. Caleb groaned. I'm not the Nicolas you want, Forrest is the one who does interviews. She wrinkled her nose, just for a second, but the look of yuck was there. Hmm. What had his brother done to make Carly think that of him? Caleb's older brother mentality of needing to pull his brothers out of their scrapes kicked in. Carly switched back to being all smiles and happy pleading. Forrest is all the way out at the ranch, and you're right here. Please. He glanced down at Faith to see if she minded. She nudged his shoulder. Go on. I'm interested to hear what you have to say about the mysterious reindeer sightings. He smirked at her but told Carly, fine. She squealed, unprofessionally, and glanced around. Let's use Main Street for a backdrop. The cameraman grunted. Carly positioned herself with a decorated tree behind her, fluffing her hair. We good, Tom. Tom gave her a thumbs up. She motioned for Caleb to come stand by her. Tom pushed a couple of buttons and then counted down from three before pointing at Carly. Carly's smile brightened 60 watts. I've tracked down one of Slay Bell Country's resident reindeer experts Caleb Nicolas, who works with one of the few herds of domesticated reindeer in the nation. Tell me Caleb, have you ever seen a flying reindeer? Sure I have. Caleb grinned at Carly. She blinked several times and seemed to remember that she was the one who was supposed to ask questions. Ah, uh, when? He glanced up as if looking for the memory in the power lines above their heads. Every Christmas Eve. He leaned a little closer. I wait up for Santa. She laughed, realizing that he was playing into the Santa story and that debunking flying reindeer would ruin Christmas for her younger viewers. Have you ever seen one in Yellowstone National Park? I can't say that I have. But I can see why Yellowstone would be a place a reindeer would want to visit, there's been a lot of hype about Yellowstone being the first national park a hundred years ago. Carly laughed, though the sound was forced. Caleb felt bad, she was looking for a hard news quote that would get her some notice from the higher-ups, and he was doing his best to keep it light. He dropped the tongue-in-cheek attitude and got down to business. The majority of reindeer don't fly. He added a wink here. They aren't particularly aerodynamic, and of course they don't have wings. However, we have over a dozen reindeer at the ranch who are trained to pull sleighs. They work well in teams, and eight is an ideal number to have harnessed to a large load because it allows the wrangler to manage personalities. Not all reindeer get along. Carly asked, almost in spite of herself. No. But the bigger problem is that most all reindeer think they should be in charge. Think of a baseball team, every guy on the bench thinks he's a starter. So they're egotistical, then. We prefer the term confident. Carly laughed again, and this time it was a natural sound. So what do you think about the supposed flying reindeer sightings? He rubbed his hand over his beard. I hope it's true. Because then they'd no right where to go find Snowflake as soon as the holiday was over. It would be a wonderful world to live in if reindeer really did fly. Carly grinned at him. The camera light went off and she threw her arms around Caleb, trapping his arms at his side. That was perfect. Thank you so much. She jumped back and waved for Tom to follow her. We don't have much time to edit. Tom grunted. Caleb reached for Faith. She sidled up to him and tucked herself into his side. You did pretty good. I think you've got a future in film. He barked a laugh that earned him curious looks from the shoppers streaming in and out of the store. What about you, ma'am? He pretended to hold a microphone. 
what do you think about the supposed flying reindeer in Yellowstone? He pushed his hand toward her chin. She cocked her head. I didn't used to think that it was possible, but I'm starting to feel Christmas magic, so maybe it's true. She tapped her heart. Caleb dropped the interviewer act and kissed her forehead, closing his eyes and breathing in her cocoa and mint scent. He'd thought spending time with Faith, kissing, flirting, sharing, was safe because she would leave. But if she actually believed, he couldn't even fathom what that would do to his heart. Chapter 26 December 19th Faith walked past the tree she and Caleb decorated that morning on her way out to the clinic for an emergency call. The a.m. might be a strange time to hang ornaments, but it was the only time they could fit it in, and since he was bent on doing all these couples' holiday activities together, they had to be a little creative with their schedules. She touched a red bobble as she went by, making it sway. The alley between the house and the clinic was chilly, and she tucked her sweater around her body, hunching against the cold. What she wouldn't give for Caleb's warm body to cuddle up against right now. There was a woman waiting for her in the clinic entry, a cat carrier on her lap. Faith did a double take. I know you, don't I? she asked. She shook her head, making her long hair bounce. I usually see document. She sniffed as if deigning to bring Faith her cat, which was currently dry heaving in its case, was a personal insult. Faith held back her comment that she had more training than her dad. In the end, he had more experience, so she didn't have much pride to stand on. Dad's out for a few more weeks. Why don't you come on back to the exam room and we'll figure out what's going on? Faith opened the door and held it as the woman breezed through, smelling like roses that were several days past their prime. Or maybe that was the cat. She set the case on the counter, and Faith read the name tag. Can you tell me what's been going on with Mr. Crumplekins? Faith asked as she pulled out a pair of gloves. I could ask you the same thing, the woman said. Faith took a moment to check her chart on the computer. Her name was Hazel. Hazel? Hazel. The woman who'd thrown darts from her eyes at Caleb when they'd been on their sleigh ride. The woman who'd wanted to be Mrs. Caleb Nicola's in high school. Well, that explained a lot. Grateful she'd finally connected the dots Faith put on her professional mask and went to work, opening the cage and pretending she didn't hear Hazel's comment. The calico cat huddled in the back of the carrier and glared. I know, you don't feel good. The smell of vomit wasn't too overpowering. She'd worked on sicker cats. I take good care of him, thank you very much. Faith nodded, though she didn't say anything. She reached inside and pulled the cat out, grateful it wasn't angry enough to swipe at her. She had handling gloves but preferred not to use them if the animal was cooperative. Has he eaten anything out of the ordinary lately? Hazel huffed and stared up at the ceiling. He got into a batch of fudge last night? Faith cringed. Cats don't usually eat chocolate unless they've been given it before. Have you ever fed him chocolate? Hazel gulped. I let him lick my fingers after eating, once. Translation, I do it all the time and I think it's so funny. Was there anything else in the fudge I need to know about? Nuts or berries? Bacon. Excuse me? Faith stared at her. I crumbled bacon and sprinkled it on top. My dad loves it. She cocked a hip. Doc does too. Mr. Crumplekins ate his batch. Like dad needed all that fat. Dad suffered a major heart attack. 
He can't have bacon or fudge, and especially not bacon fudge, ever. Faith used her clinical voice, which was shorter and tighter than her regular conversation voice, but she felt the need to establish boundaries with this woman. Hazel narrowed her eyes. I saw you on a sleigh ridge with Caleb. Faith glanced down at Mr. Crumplekins, wondering whose side he'd be on if a catfight broke out in the exam room. Who was she kidding, he'd side with the woman who gave him bacon fudge. How serious are you? Hazel's eyes dropped to Faith's ring finger. We aren't that serious. This is Dad's clinic. I'm just helping out until he's able to return. Although she had no idea how he was going to manage this place. He was still pale, and his energy was low. He'd work himself into another heart attack if he tried to help everyone in these parts who needed a vet. Then again, it wasn't like he'd asked her to stay on and be his partner. He could, and she'd consider it. At the very least, she could extend her vacation time. Hazel smacked her palm on the table. Don't play innocent with me. Sleigh rides mean something in that family. Not one of those brothers have ever let a woman set foot in their sleighs. Faith kept her head down to mask her shock. No one? She'd assumed sleigh rides were a regular part of the Nicola's men's romancing routine. Caleb was so good at it with the gazebo and the bells. Was she really his first? That seemed unlikely and highly flattering all at once. Maybe we should focus on your cat. Faith pointed to the guy currently spewing on her counter. Hazel's hands flew to her cheeks. That's the third time, do you think he'll pull through? Faith went on to explain that getting the chocolate out of his system was a good thing, but that she wanted to keep the cat to monitor him for a few hours. He might become dehydrated. Hazel was civil but cold, and in the end, she walked out without a backward glance for her feline or the mess he'd made. Faith moaned. The first thing Dad needs is a vet tech. In her office, the techs took care of all the bodily fluids. She settled Mr. Cuddlekins in an observation crate with a bowl of water and then cleaned up the mess. All the while, her mind was on what Hazel had said about sleigh rides meaning something to the Nicolas family. She couldn't puzzle it out. What exactly did it mean, and what did that say about the way Caleb felt about her? Was he trying to tell her he more than liked spending time with her, that he might even love her? She wasn't sure how she felt about him jumping to exclusivity without telling her. Chapter 27 December 20th Five days until Christmas and Dad had had enough of the rehab facility. He'd called Faith, begging her to break him out of jail. Faith swiped Hazel's card through the reader while she cradled her phone against her cheek. Normally, she wouldn't take a personal call during work hours, but Dad only called in emergencies. Watch him, and if he starts vomiting again, bring him back immediately, she told Hazel. I will. Hazel hadn't been too happy when Faith had called to recommend Mr. Cuddlekin stay the night, but it couldn't be helped. He'd become dehydrated and needed in four. Oh, and keep him out of the fudge. Faith said it as she would have to any other customer. Hazel stuck her tongue out and marched out of the building. Faith laughed at the response. It was childlike and said a whole lot about why Caleb didn't see a future with that woman. Who was that? Dad demanded. Mr. Cuddlekins and his owner. Faith smiled. She'd always talked about the pets first and then given the owner's name second as if the people belonged to the animals. It reminded her that she'd become a vet because she wanted to help those who didn't have voices. 
so often they hurt but couldn't tell you why. Figuring that out made her feel in tune with their needs, and they became the primary focus of her life. He had a bad reaction to her bacon fudge. Dad coughed and then said, I hate that stuff. The bacon is rubbery and the fudge weak. Faith burst out laughing. You'll be happy to know I forbade her from bringing it to you anymore. Bless you, child. She checked the schedule and didn't see another patient for at least 15 minutes. So, when can you pick me up? Dad asked as if it had already been decided. Christmas Eve, like the doctors said. Even though Dad was sick of being cooped up, he was right in going to the care center instead of home with her. Frankly, she was a little scared for him to be out of there. What was he going to do if he had another heart attack? Who would be here to help him? That's just three days away. I've always been a fast healer. Come get me. She smiled at his grumpy butt trying to be persuasive tone. It was a sight of her father she hadn't seen before, and it was endearing. Sorry, Dad. I don't know what to tell you. I don't feel good about bringing you home early. He harumphed. She glanced around, and her eyes landed on the tinsel garland Caleb had snuck over here and hung around the window. But the place looks great. Caleb and I decorated yesterday, we even put up the tree so we'd be ready for you to come home for Christmas. Caleb, eh? He rubbed his whiskers, the hair was bristly enough that the phone picked up the sound. The shaving kit she'd gotten him couldn't have been a better idea. I'll call you back. He hung up quickly, and she shook her head. He had something up his sleeve, though she wasn't sure what. She saw a batch of border doodle puppies for their shots, all ready to go to their new homes on Christmas, and she was checking the supply closet to put in an order when the phone rang again. She glanced at the number and answered with, What's up? Dad ho ho hoed into the phone. I need a ride. Her shoulders dropped. Dad, I'm not breaking you out. His earlier call was sweet but constantly asking was wearing on her patience. We've been invited to dinner at the Reindeer Ranch tonight. I'd be much obliged if you'd come get me instead of making one of the boys come out and pick me up. His tone was lighter. Having something to look forward to must be good for him. Wait, we've been invited? She pressed her palm to her forehead. Dad. Did you invite us for dinner at someone else's house? How humiliating. She'd worked hard to keep a professional relationship with Caleb's family, not pushing too far into their personal lives because she wasn't going to do more than Christmas date their son. If she ever had to come back here to help dad again, she didn't want things to be awkward. And nothing made for an awkward relationship with a guy's mother more than playing with her son's heart. Faith might not have kids, but she had a protective instinct for animals. If Caleb's mom's mother bear was anything like Faith's, she was in trouble. Abner invited me. Uh... Huh, and what did the doctor say? She pulled out the box of wound tape and counted the spools. Not enough to get through another month. Making a note on the supply list, she put the box back on the shelf and continued. Dad grumbled about her not taking his word. He says it's fine as long as I don't overdo it. I figure you can drop me at the steps and pick me up there too. Great, so I'm your chauffeur now? You're my date for dinner, they told me to bring a guest. She huffed a laugh. How can I turn down an invitation like that? Come on, girl. It'll be fun. 
The Nicola's family is always welcoming, and Abner and Anna are no slouches in the kitchen. Curiosity was a funny thing. Like an elf on the shelf, it appeared in the strangest places, and hers arrived at that moment. She'd seen the Nicola's family at work, and she wanted to see them at rest, like observing animals in their natural habitat. Some of the family dynamics were apparent on the ranch, but they changed when Abner and Anna were together. It was almost like the two of them were a force for good in their home. She had no idea what that looked like or how to reproduce it, which she'd like to one day when she settled down. On top of that, she wanted to see Caleb. He was training Rudy that afternoon and wasn't sure he'd be much company after which was why he'd come out this morning to decorate the tree. Apparently, the reindeer was stronger than they'd originally thought. Rudy took well to what they'd done so far and was on his way to becoming one of the lead reindeer. Which was a funny phrase to use. Faith was constantly picking up new vocabulary from her time with Caleb. Time she cherished. Okay, I'll go. She warmed at the idea of spending the evening sitting next to Caleb. That's holiday. Dad cheered, making her laugh. What's the dress code? Christmas sweaters. She laughed again. Of course it is. They worked out the details, and she hung up. A worry snagged at her thoughts and wouldn't let go. What if Caleb didn't want her to come for dinner? The invitation hadn't come from him. She quickly dialed his number. He didn't answer, so she sent a text. Dad got us invited to dinner at your house tonight. I hope you don't mind. She stared at the phone, wondering if she should just cancel and offer to take Dad to a restaurant in town. They could reenact the Christmas lunches they'd shared over the years. Memories of the silence between them haunted her. Okay, maybe not reliving the past, but trying again on new ground. Just when she was about to make the call, her phone beeped. Caleb, that's great. Can't wait to see you. Wink. She hugged the phone to her chest. Okay, then. It was settled. She was going to dinner at Reindeer Wrangler Ranch. She only hoped Caleb's parents were as accepting as he was, because there was so much riding on this dinner. Officially meeting the parents was another couple's holiday experience she and Caleb were going to have, only this was one that hadn't been on either of their lists. She hoped the butterflies in her stomach calmed down before then, or she wouldn't be able to eat a thing. Chapter 28 December 20th Watch out! Dad yelled. Faith pulled the steering wheel back and had them in the middle of the long stretch of road out to the ranch. She'd been obsessing over tonight and how dinner was going to go with Caleb's family. Was she supposed to act like his girlfriend or pretend that they weren't kissing up a storm every time they got together? Sorry, she said to her dad. What's with you tonight? Though dad looked festive in his red sweater with tan trim and a pair of neatly pressed jeans, he was jittery. Which didn't help Faith's nerves one bit. I'm nervous. She put her hand in front of the heater vent to dry off her sweaty palm. Dad's shoulders softened. What for? She glanced at him out of the corner of her eye. He had a knowing smile on his face, and yet he was pale. I'm worried about you, if you must know. She reached over and patted his knee. You had a major heart attack not long ago, and I'm scared. Dad put his hand over hers. She was always surprised at how large they were, how big his knuckles seemed. He said he'd built up some muscles working on a dairy farm in high school. 
If it was genetics, she'd missed that gene. Her hands were dainty in size, though capable with animals, and they disappeared inside her dad's. I'm not going anywhere for a while, quite a while if I can help it. Dad squeezed her hand. I've been given a second chance with you, and I want to take it. Tears stung, blurring the already hard-to-see road in the headlights. Me too, Dad. Their open conversation about the past had done them well. It served as a foundation for their future relationship, which she hoped would be close. He hadn't asked her to stick around any longer than Christmas, and she was waiting on an invitation. Even though they were talking more and doing real communication, she was still timid and not ready for rejection. So she hadn't put herself out there and offered to stay. If Dad sent her packing, she might just break. But if she left like planned, then she was emotionally safe and could come back when he asked without feeling like she was overstepping. The other reason she was nervous enough to space out and almost drive them off the road was that she was worried about her reception at the ranch. Hazel's words, a sleigh ride means something to those men, had run on repeat through her mind all afternoon. Surely Caleb's family knew he'd taken her on a sleigh ride. Not knowing their expectations was like walking on rocks over hot lava, one slip and she was a goner. Her hands shook, and she gripped the steering wheel to keep from giving away how scared she was that the tentative relationship she and Caleb had going was about to be shredded. The giant gate to the ranch appeared in the high beams, and she gently tapped the brakes to slow down. Dad leaned forward as they went under the metal and wood structure. I always loved that entrance. Makes you feel important just driving through. Faith nodded. The first time I saw it, I wondered what they were keeping in here that deserved such a big introduction. Dad chuckled. Do you get it now? She thought about Dunder's quiet majesty and Rudy's sweet and determined personality. Then there was Sparkle, with her princess attitude, and Lucky, who pulled a sleigh as if he were the lead in a parade. They were special and worth the grand entrance into their world. I think I do. She smiled at him. Faith pulled right up to the front steps of the house, as instructed, and put the truck in park. Let me come around and help you out. Before she could unbuckle her seatbelt, Abner was outside, sans coat, and hurrying down the steps. He swung Dad's door open and gripped Dad's hand as if they were about to arm wrestle. Only there was no competition in Abner's soft blue eyes. Instead, they were filled with deep joy. It's good to see you, old friend. Faith's nerves lessened at the kindness in Abner's tone. Dad used his other hand to clasp the back of Abner's. It's good to be seen. They shared a look that was full of brotherly love and gratitude that they had more time together. Faith wanted to hug them both. Let's get you in by the fire. Abner helped Dad out of the truck, and he paused to wink at Faith. We're mighty happy to have you for dinner tonight. Then he shut the door and patted the side of the truck. Faith warmed at his welcome. Between Abner and Caleb, she had two friends. The rest of the crew remined to be seen. She parked behind a green Ford and then hurried to the house. Just as she got to the door, it swung open and Forrest grinned, motioning for her to step inside. He had on a deep green sweater with a Santa face on the front. The beard was made of something fuzzy that begged rubbing. Forrest did just that as he grinned at her. I'm mighty thankful you're here tonight. Oh. Faith went to take off her coat, and Forrest reached out to help her. She wasn't used to men doing those types of things and accidentally smacked him in the chest as she took her arm out. Sorry, she mumbled. Forrest didn't even acknowledge that it had happened. 
which was just as gentlemanly as helping her with her coat. He hung it on a peg near the door. See, Mom was planning on leftovers tonight, but when she found out you and Doc were coming, she pulled out all the stops. He leaned a little closer. You saved me from reheated asparagus. He shuddered. Faith found herself smiling at his antics. I do what I can for the benefit of mankind. Forrest's smile widened as if her answer delighted him. He offered his elbow. I have a feeling you and I are going to get along famously. She linked her arm in his and followed him into the kitchen and dining room area, finding a hive of energy. Dad was in a rocker by the fireplace, talking to Pax. He seemed content, and some of the color was back in his cheeks now that he was out of the cold. Every time he paled, she wondered if his heart had stopped pumping. That fear would take time to get over. Abner and Anna were at the stove, stirring and checking timers. Faith wished she could sit and observe them together, but Forrest pulled her right up to the game table where Jack was waiting, rubbing his hands together. Ever play reindeer poker? He shuffled the deck in front of him. Faith looked for Caleb. Um, no. Jack scoffed. What's my brother doing on those dates? She bit her lip to keep from blurting out an answer as a hundred sweet kisses flooded her thoughts. Forrest burst out laughing as he fanned her blushing face. We don't want details. Have a seat. He pulled out her chair and she sat down. She hiked up her courage and asked, Where's Caleb? Jack jerked his head toward the back door. He's training. He should be done soon, though, Forrest jumped in. He asked us to entertain you until he got done. Faith smiled to herself. It was nice of him to make sure she had company. So, reindeer poker? Jack dealt three cards to each of them. Same rules as Texas Hold'em, except we use reindeer cards. He flipped over the deck to reveal a reindeer king with Christmas lights strung in his antlers. Faith laughed. I think I can get the hang of it. What do we bet? Christmas mandums, what else? Forrest shoved a bowl of red and green candy her way. Reds are five and greens are ten. She nodded, noting the amounts and then reaching for her cards. They played, trading piles of candy with each hand and betting crazy amounts because it was candy. Forrest was a ham, doing everything possible to keep the attention on himself. But Faith couldn't fault him for it because he was always careful to make sure she was treated like a lady. Jack was a bit on the cocky side, a good bluffer the first time. As soon as she figured out he was more confident than skill at cards, she called his bluff and earned a good-sized pot in the process. Even though she was having a great time, she looked at the back door every few minutes, longing for Caleb to get there. Hey, Jack. Forrest winked at Faith, letting her know he had a joke up his sleeve. Yeah, Jack shuffled his cards. How many brothers does it take to distract Faith from Caleb? Faith's neck warmed and she squirmed in her chair. How many? Jack asked. I don't know. It can't be done. He winked again. Faith pressed her lips together. Good thing Caleb just got here, or Faith might have whiplash from looking at the door all night. Forrest pushed up from the table as Caleb came in, his eyes locked on Faith's. Her chest tightened and it was like he'd sucked the oxygen from the room, he was so handsome. Shy and uncertain how to greet him in front of his family, she ducked her head. Caleb took Forrest's seat and touched her cheek. You look beautiful in that ugly sweater. 
She laughed, relaxing at his touch. Thanks. She glanced down at the gingerbread man with a broken leg. The gumdrops on his belly were made from fuzzy balls, and there was actual tinsel above his head. Jack stood. Thanks for the game, Faith. You're leaving? She didn't mean for any of them to rush off. He looked at Caleb. I'm just giving him some time with you before my family swallows you whole at dinner. Appreciate it. Caleb nodded at his twin. Jack pointed at him. Remember this the next time I ask you cover my turn cleaning stalls. There's always a price. Caleb turned away from his brother, took up Faith's hand, and threaded his fingers with hers. How was the rest of your day? Faith stared at their hands, so perfect together. Busy. Sounds like training is going well. Better than I could have hoped. He kissed her knuckle. Dinner's on. Abner called over the conversations in the room. Caleb stood, not letting go of her hand. Come on, I saved you a seat. She laughed, because he'd just gotten there and didn't have time to save anything and because she felt accepted and cared for, not only by Caleb but by his brothers too. Dinner was wonderful. Conversation flowed easily as Dad joked about his time in the rehab center, his recovery, and a particular nurse he was sure had a crush on him because she snuck him extra strawberry jello, his favorite. Caleb gave a generic update on Rudy's training. The whole room listened in on that with bated breath. Faith was heartened to see the care they took for their animals, knowing them all by name and asking questions that proved they were invested in Rudy's recovery. Toward the end of the meal, Abner raised his glass. I'd like to propose a toast. Faith reached for her cup. It was as cold against her palm as the room was nice and toasty. To Faith. Abner lifted his glass higher. Faith startled. Caleb squeezed her knee under the table. For giving sight to the blind this Christmas season. We're all grateful you came to the ranch when you did. To Faith. To Faith echoed everyone at the table. Faith's eyes stung as she took in the faces around the table. Her heart swelled inside her chest, and she had to swallow back the emotion building up. She'd never felt so accepted and loved as she did in that moment. Part of it was because she'd contributed to the family, that felt really good. But she would have done the surgery for Rudy even if the Nicolas family hadn't invited her to dinner tonight. The other part was because she could tell they liked her, truly liked her for just being her. From playing reindeer poker to teasing her about sneaking off to the barn with Caleb after dinner, the family had opened their arms and welcomed her without holding back. She'd never had that before. And she wanted it badly. She looked at Caleb. Do you know how lucky you are? He brushed his finger across her jaw. I think I do. Though she had been talking about his family, he was talking about her. His tenderness undid her, and she was grateful that she was sitting down or else she'd have swooned into his arms. How was she ever going to leave this all behind? Chapter 29 December 21st the morning after Faith and Doc came to dinner Caleb whistled on his way into the house after doing morning chores. He'd fed the herd in the field just as the sun was coming up, and the rosy color in the sky reminded him of the way Faith had blushed last night. He couldn't get enough of her reserved pleasure that his family so openly accepted her. It was almost like her soul craved it, and he couldn't help but believe that she'd been placed in his life for a reason. Perhaps God wanted her to see what a family could be like so she could look forward to creating her own one day. 
But it could just as well be that God wanted faith in Caleb's life, with his family, and she needed to know that she would be unconditionally loved here. He hoped the second reason was the case, but he knew enough to know that his plans and God's plans didn't always line up. That hadn't stopped him from spending a lot of time on his knees last night praying. It's three days until Christmas, there's no way you'll make it back. Dad's yelling came through the barn walls and hit Caleb in the chest. It wasn't often that Dad raised his voice, someone must have pushed him too far. He had a pretty good guess as to who it was. Charging ahead, his whistling dropped Caleb swung open the barn door to find Dad and Forrest squared off. Sparkle and Galen looking over their stall doors to see what the commotion was about, those two loved a bit of gossip. Pax was leaning against Dunder, sneaking him reindeer treats as he watched the two males battle it out. Forrest planted his feet. I'll fly back, Dad. His words came out as if Dad were an idiot for not thinking of that option. He threw his hand at Dunder. Stella and Chris rode Dunder here from Alaska when he was sick. I can handle Snowflake. Ah, so that was what this was about. Caleb shut the door behind him and joined the fray. If you find her, and that's a great big if, I shouldn't have let her go. Dad stomped back and forth like a bull in the pasture. Caleb held up both hands. Whoa! Dad! We couldn't leave Stella stranded. She's over toys. Protecting Santa and all that he stood for was woven into Dad's soul as much as red thread was in his flannel shirt. For him to make a statement like that meant he was thrown off his game in a major way. Forrest poked Caleb's chest. You agree with me. You're the one who had to do the news interview, and we've had calls from all the major networks wanting quotes since then. Snowflake is drawing more and more attention. There's people camping in the snow trying to get a glimpse of her. Someone's going to get frostbite, or worse. We need to get her back home ASAP. And I told you all we'd wait until after Christmas, your mom deserves to have her kids here to celebrate the birth of Christ. Caleb watched his father pace back and forth. Suddenly, he understood something that he hadn't before. It wasn't that Dad didn't want to get Snowflake, it was that doing so could hurt the woman he loved. As much as he was programmed to take care of the reindeer, Mom came first in his heart, and it was tearing him apart to have the two things he cared about in this world at odds. Caleb got it, because he'd been dealing with it on a much smaller level with faith. Smaller because they weren't married or even committed past this Christmas. But big enough that the lie he told her about Rudy not flying in his cage that day rolled over him like a barrel of reindeer poop. He had a right to stay true to the reindeer, at least, that was what he told himself. If Faith was staying and they were moving to the next level, not so much. But for now, keeping the family secret was more important than his budding feelings for the veterinarian. He put his hand on Forrest's shoulder. I agree with you that we should find her as soon as possible. But I don't agree that you should leave now. One for the family and family for the reindeer. Remember? Forrest shoved his hand away. We were children when they taught us that. We're not kids anymore. It's no less true now. We look out for one another first, and as a family, we care for the reindeer. We gotta look out for mom, bro. Forrest growled. Mom should understand. Caleb thought back to mom watching dad and worrying about what would happen to him if the reindeer stopped flying. She does. But she's right in that family comes first, especially at Christmas. Forrest shook his head. I'm going to the feed store. We're low on grain. He stomped out of the barn. Caleb found dad studying him. They locked eyes, 
and Caleb knew he'd crossed into a new level of manhood and Dad knew it too. There was a welcome to the club gleam in Dad's eye, accompanied by a pinch of worry. Pax clicked his tongue at Dunder, drawing both their attention to him and the reindeer. He put Dunder in his stall and shut the gate. Dad folded his arms. Let me guess, you agree with Forrest. Caleb huffed. You're not one to hold back in the face of conflict, are you, Dad? What? Dad demanded. We aren't all here to fight with you. Relax. Caleb prayed Pax didn't throw his glove down and challenge Dad to a verbal duel as well. Pax didn't jump into the fray. He thought about his answer, studying the beams in the rafters that the reindeer used as perches. The longer Snowflake is out there, the higher the chance of her being caught or hurt or even injuring herself. But. He scratched under his hat and then righted it. She's bringing hope to a lot of people who seem to be struggling this year. Have you noticed? Everyone is so short with each other. He gave Dad a pointed look. Dad had the humility to realize that he might have jumped on Forrest a bit too quickly, and he ducked his head. Pax went on. I don't want to see Snowflake in danger. Nor do I want to see Mom's tears when one seat is empty at Christmas dinner. She has a tender heart and loves her family in Christmas, and putting the two together is her greatest joy, I don't want to take that away from her. He pushed off the stall door and left them thinking about his words. Dad kicked the ground. I don't know if that boy should be a poet or a politician, Caleb filled in for him. Dad chuckled. He can talk both sides of any situation. It's because he's full of empathy, Caleb agreed. And Forrest has none. Dad's hand fisted. That's not true, it's just all directed to the reindeer. I don't think he's trying to hurt Mom's feelings. Caleb felt funny standing there talking about emotions and feelings, so he headed over to a bale of straw and moved it across the breezeway, just to do something manly. Dad followed him and put his boot on the bale. You were pretty cozy with Faith last night. Caleb brushed straw off his pants. We're enjoying one another's company. Anna invited them to Christmas dinner. Caleb wasn't surprised. Doc was a part of dinner every year, and it made sense to invite his daughter along. That was nice of her. Yeah, so don't screw this up. Dad smacked him on the back. What do you mean? If Faith takes over for Doc, either now or in the future, and you break her heart, it would be strained at best and horrible for the ranch at the worst. Caleb ran his hand down his face. She's going back to her practice after Christmas. That's as far as we have planned out. You saw Doc last night. He's in no shape to work out here. Dad dropped his chin to his chest. Breaks my heart to see my friend like that. I'll bet it does. Caleb glanced away to allow Dad a moment in his emotions. I don't know what's going to happen with Faith, but if it ends, I'm hoping it will be on friendly terms. I think you two ought to have a conversation about this. Nope. That was part of the deal. We only have until Christmas. Caleb looked around but couldn't find another bale to move. Then make a new deal. Dad nodded once as if the whole thing was decided, and then he headed out. And put that bale back, he called over his shoulder. Gladly, Caleb mumbled. He needed to move about a hundred more to get the restless feeling out of his muscles. Setting the bale next to Dunder's stall, he looked over and found the reindeer looking back at him. His eyes were clear and his ears up. He'd gained some weight in his belly and filled out. How about it? Do you want to fly some laps? Dunder tipped his antlers side to side, 
as if gauging his ability to handle exercise, and then finally nodded. Good, because it was you or Flash, and I didn't feel like taking my life in my hands. Dunder chortled at that. He stood still while Caleb got the harness on, and they headed for the workout arena. A good run would help Caleb clear his head, though he doubted it would empty his heart. It was so full of faith that it weighed him down at the same time it lifted him up. He didn't want to feel so much for her, but it seemed that was inevitable because she was just that wonderful. Chapter 30 December 22nd It had been a long day. Faith dragged herself inside the house and collapsed on the couch. The horse she'd been called to check out had an intestinal issue. In order to fix it, she'd had to give the animal meds to shrink its pancreas. Once they'd taken effect, she'd sedated the horse, hung him upside down from the farmer's tractor, and then laid him down and rolled him. It was awful to do that to an animal, and if she didn't know that it actually worked, then she'd never recommend it. The whole time, the owner was either in tears or cursing Faith's name. Faith's stress level had been through the roof. The treatment was the animal's only hope. Once the horse had woken up, she'd shaken herself out and then proceeded to fill the stall with stuff to shovel. This time, the owner had cried tears of joy and hugged Faith. Faith had hugged her right back because she'd been so grateful the horse was okay. Now her arms ached and her back was stiff and all she wanted to do was fall into a bathtub and soak her muscles. Her phone rang, and she answered it, hoping it was Caleb. Hello? Hi, sweetie. Faith blinked in surprise. Mom? How are you? She hadn't heard from her mom in months. I'm doing great. Just putting the guest list together for Christmas dinner and wondered if you'd be coming by this year. Faith hedged. She hadn't been home for Christmas since her partner had gotten married, taking the extra shift so he could be with his wife. I'm spending the holiday with Dad this year. He has some health issues, and I'm helping out with the clinic. Faith rolled her eyes at her own vague answer. There were a hundred details she could have told her mom. Anything about Caleb would have been interesting. But somehow she knew better than to bring up Reindeer Ranch. Oh. That's very charitable of you, Faith. The man hasn't given you reason to take care of him, but there you are. The words were nice enough, but the tone was like claws down Faith's back. Why did she feel like she was doing something wrong? It's not like that, Mom. Dad and I are working through some things. Good luck with that. He's as communicative as a washing machine. Mom. Faith pushed away from the back of the couch. Ever since she'd realized how much her mom's view of dad had colored her own, she'd wanted to say something to her mom. I don't believe I have to pick sides. I can love both you and dad, my heart is that big. Please don't feel threatened by this. He's not going to take your place. She wished she'd been able to say those words as a child, because so many of mom's insecurities could have been handled differently. I know you do, sweetie. You have the biggest heart of anyone I know. I just don't want to see that man leave you high and dry again. Faith's blood boiled. He didn't. You're the one who left without a forwarding address. Her declaration was met with silence. Look, Mom. I don't want to fight. It's Christmas. You're even starting to sound like him. Mom sniffed. The next thing you know, you'll tell me that you're working that darn reindeer ranch. Truth. Faith breathed. Truth will provide closure. 
I've been out there. Many times. It's a beautiful place. Don't fall for it, Faith. Mom's words stabbed at her through the phone. Don't you think for a second that they would care for you more than they care for the reindeer? If your father wasn't a vet, they would have kicked him off the land years ago. Faith remembered Abner's look of true friendship, his extended hand and the caring in his manners. I don't believe you. She cleared her throat, suddenly more strung out and tired than she had been after almost losing a patient. Mom, I'm going to love Dad. He's being honest with me, and we're talking about hard things. But I'm not going to stop loving you. I hope you have a very Merry Christmas. You've always been a stubborn child. Stubborn in the best ways, like you. Faith grinned as she repeated what she always said to her mom when she'd complained of her strong will. Mom chuckled. Come visit soon. I will. They said goodbye. Even though the conversation ended civilly, Faith wasn't settled. She hated to have to be so firm with her mom about this, but she couldn't see another way. And telling the truth was freeing. Not that her mom admitted to leaving dad that first Christmas, and she probably never would. She'd created an alternate reality where she was the hero, and she'd live there until she died. Faith was only starting to realize the type of woman who'd raised her. But she was happy to find that those same traits weren't inside of herself. Some of them she'd consciously avoided, like the big outbursts and drama. Others, like telling lies to people she loved, felt foreign, like trying to use her left hand to write. Her phone rang again. This time she checked before answering. Hi, Dad. Hi. I was just wondering if you were coming over tonight? She glanced at the clock and silently cursed. She should have been to the rehab center a half hour ago. Sorry. I had to go out to the Parker's ranch today. I have to change, and then I'll be over. Everything okay? She smiled. Yeah, it worked out all right. I'm looking forward to hearing the story. Her grin grew bigger. Sharing her days with Dad had become something of a routine that she liked a lot. He understood all the jargon and even questioned her diagnosis a time or two, which made her think through things better. She enjoyed their shop talk. I'll be there as quick as I can. A shower and change of clothes and she was on the road into town. At her practice, she always wore scrubs and tennis shoes, but out here, she was in jeans and flannel. It felt good, like she was more herself on the outside. The rehab facility had a fake tree out front, all lit up even though it was barely five o'clock. The sun had been down for fifteen minutes already, which made her feel even more behind schedule. To make matters worse, she hadn't been able to get a hold of Caleb while she'd driven. Usually, when he didn't answer, it meant he was in the workout arena. She hoped things were going well for him. He'd said Rudy was up to 23 laps a day. When she'd asked what was normal for a reindeer, he'd shrugged and said they could go for hundreds of miles. The ones in the field didn't seem too intent on putting miles behind them, though. They mostly stood together and bellowed at random. Faith made her way to Dad's room and knocked on the open door as she stepped inside. Dad was in his chair, the small table sat next to him and he had a deck of cards laid out. Dad had joked that she needed to understand his pain, so they were eating in tonight, whatever meal was provided by the facility. He was still bucking for an early release, and she was still digging her heels in that he stay the whole time. They'd come to an uneasy truce not to talk about it anymore. Are we playing reindeer poker or rummy? 
She draped her coat over the chair and sat down. Dad smiled. Rummy. I saw the way you took those Nicola's boys for all their candy. She laughed. Hardly. But I was well on my way when we started dinner. She picked up the deck and shuffled, dealing their first hand. Dad leaned over, looking at her. You seem upset. She sighed, noting the tension in her neck and back. Mom called. Say no more. He leaned back as if she'd brandished a poisonous snake at him. Did either of her parents have a mature bone in their body? Really? I was thinking. Dad changed the subject. Next month, when the Longhorn herds start to calve, we would invest in one of those side-by-sides. It might make getting around a bit easier. Faith's hands hovered over the cards. That's the first time you've said anything about working together after Christmas. What are you thinking? Dad frowned. What do you mean? I mean I need to know specifics before I decide if staying is what I want. Dad's frown turned into a full scowl. You live here now. No, she carefully set down the deck and the words. I came to help while you recovered. No one said anything about moving here. Least of all you, she added silently. I just did. Dad folded his arms. It only makes sense. You don't belong in that city clinic, you belong out here. Faith blinked, insulted that he didn't think she belonged in her own business. I built that city clinic from nothing. It's not an investment I can just toss away. Although now that she thought about it, she hadn't checked in with them in days. Maybe a week. You're happier here. What does happiness have to do with it? It's my job. Your happiness has everything to do with it. What if I asked you to move closer to me? Would you do it? No. This is my home, and the reindeer need me. An old wound cried out and forced Faith to take a look at it. She gritted her teeth. I am not my mother. I am not my mother, she repeated in her head. Dad, I need you. I want you to be a part of my life. Great. He swiped his cards off the table and began sorting his hand. Then it settled. Nothing settled. Faith tossed her cards face down. You're asking me to uproot my life to move here but won't do the same thing for me, doesn't that seem a bit hypocritical? Dad's lips formed a thin line. It would, from your perspective. I can see that. But if you knew what I knew, you wouldn't ask it of me. Irritation at her irrational parents bubbled over. Then tell me. What would open my mind and make everything suddenly seem clear? Dad opened his mouth once and then shut it quickly. I can't tell you. Fed up with the game Faith stood and yanked her coat off the chair. Then I'm leaving. I told Mom you were being honest with me and we were healing old hurts. Well, you just created a new one, congratulations. Faith, wait. Dad called after her as she quick-stepped down the hall and out to the frigid North Dakota winter. Hugging herself, she climbed into the still warm cab of the truck and fired up the engine. Dad acted like he had some big secret. Whatever. She didn't want to be toyed with anymore. All she really wanted was to fall into Caleb's arms, where the world made sense and no one was mad at her. She started up the truck and headed out to Reindeer Wrangler Ranch. Even if Caleb was busy training, she'd talk to Dunder. 
The reindeer had more sense in him than both her parents combined. She tried to call Caleb to see if he was available, but he didn't answer. Great. At least she knew she could find him in the workout arena. She pressed on the gas and took the truck up to top snow-packed road speed. She couldn't get to Caleb fast enough. Chapter 31 The more she thought about the parental hand she'd been dealt, the more upset Faith became. Why was it Caleb's parents could manage to stay married and civil and hers were a couple of candy canes short of a stuffed stocking? She made it out to the ranch, ready to launch herself into a tirade about her bad luck and let Caleb soothe her troubles away with a couple dozen kisses. The lights were in on the barn and this was the usual time for him to get done, so she headed that way. Stepping inside, she called out a, hello. No one answered back, so she went all the way in, happy to warm up for a moment. The walk from the truck to the barn had chilled her to the bones. She rubbed her arms, noting the lack of human noises. Might as well check on Dunder. As if he'd heard his name, she heard a deep grunt for an answer. I could use someone who is happy to see me. She opened his stall, but Dunder wasn't in there. I could have sworn. She heard the grunt again only this time it sounded like it was coming from above her. Glancing up, she fell back against the stall wall at the sight of Dunder and Sparkle standing on the barn beams. How did you? She glanced at the door she'd left partially open and darted for it, pulling it tight to make sure no one got out. That was one of the first lessons she'd learned, shut the gate, shut the door, shut the cage. Okay, Forrest? Jack, she yelled. I don't know what kind of prank you're pulling, but it isn't funny. They could get hurt. She pointed to the two reindeer. Sparkle shook her head as if she took offense to the idea that she couldn't be in the rafters. Prancing in the air, she hopped off the beam and swooped around the barn. Gah! Faith threw her hands over her eyes, expecting to hear a splat or a clatter. Neither came. When she peeked through her fingers, she found Dunder gliding to the floor. Um, that was. Her head spun, and she couldn't find words to continue. It was the moment with Rudy upside down in his kennel all over again. She rubbed her eyes, certain they were playing tricks on her. It was a long drive out to the ranch, and she hadn't been paying attention. She was tired, worn out, really, from working all day and then dealing with her parents. I'm going to find Caleb, she told Dunder. She backed up, groping behind her for the knob. When she fell backwards out the door, she slammed it shut. No way. No way. No way, she chanted as she sprinted to the indoor arena. I am not crazy. She pushed through the door and stopped in her tracks Rudy flew from one side of the arena to the other, making sharp turns. Caleb was on a stand like a circus master, calling out instructions. Good. Now land on the roof. Rudy approached the steeply pitched mock roof and landed on the ridge, taking two steps forward. That was good. But you've got to get it down to one step, you're not supposed to wake the kids up, Caleb called. Rudy flew to him and hovered while Caleb scratched behind his ears. Faith stared, and things began to click into place. Like how she and Caleb spent most of their spare time at her place how she was only allowed at the ranch when invited or called ahead, how she'd never been shown the workout arena, how someone always went into the barn before she did. Holy smokes, reindeer could fly. Her knees buckled and she grabbed the wall for support. Reindeer. Fly. Click, click, click. 
Click went the puzzle pieces. Her father knew it. Caleb knew it. And neither of them had told her. What the heck? She yelled across the open building. Caleb whipped around, and Rudy backed up, still in midair. Fueled by the sense of betrayal from the two men in her life she should have been able to trust Faith rushed forward. He flies. She shoved her finger in Rudy's direction. Dunder flies, and sparkle. And you didn't tell me. Her arms went rigid by her side. Caleb climbed off the platform. He watched her carefully. Yes, they fly. You're only tell me that because the proof is doing circles around you. Caleb grabbed Rudy's lead rope and tugged him to the ground. You're not making this easier, he told the reindeer. He was upside down that morning. Wasn't he? Caleb swallowed and nodded. Faith threw her arms up. You've been lying to me since the day we met. Now hold on, Caleb held up a palm. It's not something we tell the whole world. Faith's anger surged like a tidal wave. Neither is all the stuff I told you about my past Caleb. I thought we shared things. Would you have believed me? He asked low, his navy blue eyes full of questions and begging her to understand. She opened her mouth, but the answer stuck. The truth was, she might not have. Even if he'd told her last night, she would have thought he was joking. She might have played along, but she wouldn't have actually believed him. That's beside the point. No. It's the whole point. His tone was even, not like her parents who yelled at the first sign of a disagreement. Like she was doing. She swallowed and worked to tame her anger. I let you into my life and into my heart. You should have shared this with me. You're leaving. Faith, the reindeer have to be protected from the outside world. There are precious few who know they can fly, please understand. She blinked back the tears that wanted to fall. The whole day piled upon her, and she heard everything from her mother's warning that the reindeer would always be more important than her to the betrayal from dad, who'd never told her Santa was real. Finally, there was the feeling that she should have been more to Caleb. If your kisses meant half of what you claimed they did, then telling me wouldn't have been a problem. She turned on her heel and hurried out. Swiping at her tears, she made a plan. It was clear she couldn't stay here. No one trusted her enough to tell her that reindeer could fly, so she wasn't really one of them. Dad tried to claim otherwise, but his plea for her to stay was as empty as his house. If he believed in her, he would have done things differently. With all this pain, she couldn't spend one more night in his house, and she didn't want to be anywhere near where Caleb was going to be. He was supposed to be one of the good guys, but he'd held back as much as her dad. If that was the kind of man that Reindeer Wrangler Ranch turned out, then she didn't want to be a part of it. It was time to go back to her normal life. It was time to go to Grafton. Chapter 32 Nutcrackers Caleb rushed Rudy to the barn and pushed him through the door. He couldn't leave the reindeer in the arena without supervision, and he couldn't chase after Faith with a flying reindeer following him like a Macy's Day Parade balloon. He shut the door tight, they didn't need another snowflake issue flying around town, and ran for the parking area. By the time he got there, all he could make out were her taillights. Shoot! He threw his hat in the snow. What's eaten, you? asked Jack. Faith knows. Caleb snatched his hat off the ground. She knows, and she's ticked off that I didn't tell her. I feel like I've been caught with another woman. 
Jack laughed and then schooled his features. Sorry. What are you going to do? Kayla blew out a breath. I'm going to chase her down. He headed for his truck. Whoa. Jack grabbed his arm. Do you think that's a good idea? She just found out that reindeer can fly, and she's mad. That's a lot to process in one night. Caleb filled his chest with air, letting it expand past all the tightness Faith yelling at him had caused. What had she said about her dad? There were so many layers to this that he was buried in them. She was pretty angry. Exactly. And what do we do with angry reindeer? Jack spoke slowly as if leading Caleb along. We let them cool off. Right. Caleb hunched forward. Everything inside of him told him to go after Faith, to make this right. But Jack was the level-headed one at the moment. Okay. I'll give her the night to sleep it off. Good idea. Jack side-hugged him. Caleb headed back to the barn, needing to put the reindeer up for the night. He couldn't shake the feeling that he was making a huge mistake, even if logic told him otherwise. Chapter 33 December 23rd Faith blinked back the tears that pricked her eyes and made her throat close off. The Grafton Clinic had welcomed her with a warm puff of air that smelled like disinfectant and animals. Her partner, Jonathan, had been shocked to see her walk through the doors this morning. If she was an employee, she would have felt sheepish just showing up, but she was part owner and her own boss, so she'd gotten to work. By lunch, they were ahead enough that she felt good sending the other vet home. Go on, I've got this, and if an emergency comes in, I'll call you. Jonathan shoved his arms into his coat. I appreciate the time off, but it's not a big deal. We had a system down while you were gone. She felt the jab that she wasn't needed. Well, too bad for Jonathan that she paid for half this place and he couldn't tell her to leave. Pasting on a smile, she shoot him out the door and went back to work. Jonathan's system became clear as she found the supply closet reorganized and the staff bringing patients through in a different order of events. Instead of her meeting with them first and discussing the issue, the vet techs took vitals and entered the info into the computer. She was supposed to look at the info before going in to see the patient. More than once, she'd shown up in a room without a clue as to what she was there to treat. The owners weren't that happy with her, and she wasn't all that thrilled with the changes either. Irritation seemed to be her welcome home party. Add to that the heartbreak of losing both Caleb, her dad, and a family Christmas all in one, and she was one broken fingernail away from a complete sob fest. No matter how she looked at it, no one needed her or trusted her enough to bring her into their world, not even her partner, who'd made all these changes while she'd been away. She swiped at an errant tear. This was her lot in life. The sooner she accepted it, the better off she'd be. Except that there was this voice, or feeling, that came from the same place the music had touched during the sing-along that told her not to believe all that. She wished it was louder, so it could drown out the negative thoughts she had. But it was a whisper and just as hard to grab onto. A huge part of her ached to be in Caleb's arms. To hold fast to his shirt while he claimed her lips and told her everything was going to be okay, that she was his world. But that wasn't going to happen. She hadn't stopped in to tell Dad that she was gone. Instead, She'd sent him a text that said, I found out your secret. You should have told me. I'm going back to Grafton. He'd sent her a dozen texts, none of which she'd read. It didn't matter what anyone said now, because they should have said so much before. She swiped her cheeks clean and made her way into exam room one. 
She couldn't fix her own life, but she could help this dog get better for Christmas. Chapter 34 Christmas Eve Caleb felt like his skin was on fire as he and Mom walked through the rehab center to help Doc pack up and move home Christmas Eve morning. Faith was sure to be here, and he wasn't sure what he'd say to her. Apologize a hundred times over, of course, beg her forgiveness and then beg her to stay. It wasn't a particularly long list of things to do, but it covered the basics. Faith had a history with the ranch, that much she'd told him when she'd opened up about her parents. He'd wounded her in the most personal way, and if he'd given it an ounce of thought, he would have been compelled to tell her before she'd found out for herself. They entered Doc's room to find him sitting on the maid bed, wearing jeans and a flannel shirt and his cowboy hat. His bags were packed and placed at the foot of his bed. Where's Faith? Caleb blurted. Mom put her hand on his arm and gave her head a little shake. Caleb wasn't about to be shushed. Doc, where's Faith? He crossed the room and crouched in front of the gray-haired man, who hadn't lifted his head off his chest. She found out about the reindeer the other night and was mad, he explained. I need to talk to her. She's not answering. Doc shoved his phone at Caleb, who fumbled but didn't drop it. I messed up big. God's not gonna be happy with me. Mom sat on the bed next to Doc and took his hand. Doc, God is forgiving. I'm sure he understands that family relations are difficult. Bah. Doc shook off her comforting touch. Mom blinked in surprise. Caleb scanned the texts, starting with Doc's latest begging Faith to call him so he could explain. He offered to share his whole life story with her. He offered her the clinic if she'd just come back. He scrolled up until he got to Faith's text that said she was leaving town. She left. He jerked his head up. Doc nodded. That's why I called Anna to come get me. I needed a ride home. He choked on the last word, and tears flowed down his wrinkled cheeks. I've lost my girl. The one thing God asked me to do was bring her home, and I failed. He covered his face with his hands and cried like a little boy. Mom's face filled with compassion, and she rubbed his arm. Doc, come on. There has to be a way we can fix this. Nothing's too big of a problem that the family can't take care of it. Caleb rose to standing and then rose to his full height. Sorry, Mom, but you're wrong. Caleb, she scolded, darting her eyes to Doc and telling Caleb to be more sensitive to his feelings. Caleb shook his head. This isn't something the family can fix. But I can. He strode to the door. I'm going after Faith, and I'm not coming back unless I have her in the truck. See? Doc pointed at him. That's the kind of love God wanted me to have. Love? Caleb jerked back as if Doc had punched him. Mom's face softened. Yes, love. It's. I'm. Ha. Huh. He scratched his head. He hadn't told Faith he loved her. Caleb. Mom smiled knowingly. It's Christmas Eve. You're supposed to be Santa in the parade tonight. You've been looking forward to this for years. She was right. He'd hoped one day to take over for Dad, but the old man held on to the job as long as his aching back would let him. It doesn't matter. I should have gone after Faith last night, but I didn't, and I need to go right now. Nothing matters except getting to her. That's what love is, Mom insisted. Caleb glanced at Doc, who nodded slowly. I've been a fool, but even I can tell your head over heels for my girl. Get out of here. 
He shoved his hands through the air as if pushing Caleb out the door. And if you get the chance, tell her I'm an old fool who wishes he was a better man. Caleb pushed his hat lower on his head and nodded. He glanced at the clock. It was early, but he'd have to hurry if he was going to bring Faith back before Christmas. He broke into a run, his boots pounding against the floor. Chapter 35 Christmas Eve Faith held the fluffy white cat to her chest as she made her way out of the observation room and to the waiting area, where Fluffy Soner waited to be reunited with her beloved pet. The cat had been hit by a car and sustained a broken leg. Faith was able to set and cast the leg, in bright pink. Fluffy! Taylor cried, and she rushed across the waiting room to Faith. She looked sad. Her fingers brushed the cast and she started to cry. Faith glanced at Taylor's mom before speaking to the little girl. Fluffy's going to be okay, she tried to reassure her. The cast doesn't hurt, and she can even walk with it if she feels like it. Taylor sniffed. I asked Santa to make her better. I wrote the letter and mailed it last night. Brady says Santa isn't real, and I told him he was and that Fluffy would come home and he'd see. She burst into a fresh wave of tears and buried her face in her mom's legs. Faith shifted so Fluffy was under one arm. Hey, hey. She spoke low and soothing. Santa is real. She briefly closed her eyes, unable to believe that she knew the truth about Santa Claus and the truth would provide a foundation to build upon. Those were Caleb's encouraging words. Look! Fluffy is going home with you for Christmas. Just like Santa would want her to. In fact, I'm sure he has something special in his sack for Fluffy. Taylor peeked out at her. He never brought Fluffy a present before. Well. Fluffy's never had a cast before. Santa would want her to feel better soon. Taylor sniffed and glanced up at her mom, who nodded her head. I'll bet he has something really special, she agreed as she handed over Fluffy's carrying case. Faith placed it on the floor and put Fluffy inside. Now, he needs lots of love and you have to let him sleep as much as he wants to, okay? Taylor nodded. Okay, and don't forget to put a couple carrots or some oatmeal cookies out for the reindeer tonight. They work hard too. Faith stood up and found Caleb standing in the doorway, his eyes full of love and his hat in his hands. I won't. Taylor took the carrier, and her mom helped her study it. Faith snagged a cat toy off the display and tucked it into the mom's purse. Mom winked over her shoulder, and they were off, leaving Faith alone with Caleb. He shook his head. You just told her to feed the reindeer. Faith lifted a shoulder as she spun around to organize the papers on the receptionist's desk. Since it was Christmas Eve, she'd sent everyone home and offered to wait for Fluffy's family on her own. Puttering around the office was better than letting the walls close in on her at her apartment. The place was bare of any Christmas decorations and pretty much the most depressing place on the planet. It's the reindeer who have to pull the heavy sleigh. They deserve a treat. One second she was standing there, feeling like an eggshell, she was so fragile. The next Caleb's arms wrapped around her from behind, his warmth encircled her, and she could breathe for the first time since she'd left the ranch. You're one big-hearted woman, he said into her hair. So help her, she didn't want to lean into him or on him or need him in any way ever again. But his chest was solid behind her, and his arms were real and comforting, and he smelled like outside and body spray and Christmas, and she couldn't help herself. 
Turning so her face was in his chest and her arms around his middle, she said, I'm so mad at you. The effect of her words was somewhat muted by the fabric of his button-up shirt, but he got the point. I know. I'm mad at me too. And Jack. I really mad at Jack. She tipped her head up so she could look at him. Why Jack? He told me to give you time to cool off, and like an idiot, I listened. I had no idea you'd drive three hours to get away from me. He brushed her hair off her cheek and tucked it behind her ear. I'm so sorry, Faith. You were right. I shouldn't have withheld anything from you, and I never will again. One side of her mouth ticked up as she fought a smile. Nothing? Nothing. Ever, wait, ever? What do you mean by that? And please, take your time explaining, because my brain went in thirteen different directions, twelve of them really good and one I didn't like so much. The twelve all had to do with them together, half of those involved mistletoe. But the one was him walking out of her life to save her from himself. He rubbed her nose with his. First off, let me say that I like fighting like this much better than the way we fought last night. Can we agree that this is how we'll solve our difference from this point forward? Faith giggled. You have a lot of explaining to do before I agree to anything. He pulled back. Fair enough. Glancing around, he found the waiting bench and led her over to it, holding her hands and keeping them as they sat down. I've been watching my parents. They are fiercely loyal to one another, at the expense of other things and even other people sometimes. Like when? She'd noticed something special between Abner and Anna too, and was eager to hear what Caleb saw in their relationship. Well, you know that reindeer in Yellowstone? She gasped. That's one of yours? Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that until you just said that. Is his name really Dancer? How did he get out? How are you going to get him back? Caleb chuckled. Her name is Snowflake, and she is wicked fast. We loaned her to one of Santa's daughters named Stella, and she lost her in Yellowstone. Aha! Wait, Stella was one of Santa's daughters? Wow! Faith grabbed the front of his shirt. Caleb! That's awful! We have to go get her. Caleb placed his hand over hers. We have a rescue plan already in place, and it starts the day after Christmas. Why wait? She couldn't picture Rudy or one of the other reindeer out there on their own. They were domesticated animals, who knew if they could fend for themselves in the wild. Because family comes first, even before reindeer. He caught her gaze and held it. Faith, I want you to be first in my life. Her throat went dry. His hand tightened around hers, and he cupped her cheek with the other one. I want you to be my family. Caleb, she whispered, the air rushing from her lungs. Part of the reason I messed up so bad was that I wasn't clear on what I wanted. We kept saying you were going to leave, and I kept hoping you wouldn't. But I didn't feel like I could tell you everything if we were just a holiday fling. She laughed and then sniffed as the dam of emotions broke. It never felt like a fling to me. Me either. His thumb stroked her lower lip, making it tremble. I'm in it for forever faith. She laughed and cried at the same time. Me too. A slow and sexy smile spread across his lips, and he leaned forward. Does this mean you'll come home? She sighed into the word. Home. I've always wanted one of those. 
He kissed her lightly, testing and teasing all in one brush. I'll build us a beautiful home on the ranch. You can have whatever you want. She used her grip on his shirt to pull him closer. I just want you. He closed the distance between them and kissed her soft and slow. His hands buried in her hair, and she lost all track of time and place. There was only his kiss and the low growl he made when she kissed his jaw. Who knew how long they stayed that way? When they pulled apart, her stomach gurgled. Caleb laughed. I think you worked up an appetite. He rubbed his beard in the crook of her neck, making her giggle. I haven't eaten since yesterday. I'm starved, she admitted. Me too. I saw a burger joint down the street. You want to pick something up on our way out of town? She thought about the way she'd left things in Slaybell country. Caleb was right. Nothing was more important at Christmas than family. Yeah, I want to grab something for my dad too. Caleb's warm smile said he knew she was going to talk this out with her old man. Sounds like a plan. She hurried to shut the clinic down, making the mental shift to moving to Slaybell country. Jonathan would buy her out in a heartbeat. After the cool reception she'd gotten when she'd come back, it was obvious he was ready to be on his own. Which was just fine with her. Her condo would sell, or she could hire someone to rent it out. Either way, it wasn't an obstacle. She hadn't even unpacked her bags. They could swing by and be on their way home in fifteen minutes tops. Tonight was Christmas Eve so that meant that. Oh my gosh! The parade! Caleb's head came up from where he was scrolling on his phone, waiting for her to do what she needed to. You're going to miss the parade. She wilted. I'm so sorry. I know how much you were looking forward to playing Santa. Caleb tucked his phone away. Jack wanted to fill in but I told him to buzz off and pass the suit on to Forrest. He grinned. Faith laughed. One of these days, you're going to have to forgive Jack for giving you bad advice. I lost 24 hours with the woman I loved, it's going to take a while to make that up to me. Caleb offered his hand, and she took it, locking the clinic behind her. He stopped and wrapped her up. Besides, I'm right where I want to be. Faith lifted to meet his lips with hers and reveled in the knowledge that she was in love. In love with a wrangler who trained flying reindeer for Santa. She burst out laughing in the middle of their kiss. What? Caleb asked. I just realized that you work for Santa. That makes you an elf. She poked his arm. He lowered his brow. First off, I'm an independent contractor. Secondly, I'm a wrangler, Missy. He touched his hat brim. That's 85% cowboy, 15% reindeer specialist, and 0% elf. Hmm. Seemed she'd struck a nerve there. Wrangler. Elf. She held out her hands as if weighing the two of them against one another. Potato, patatu. He tickled her side. She laughed and scooted deeper into her seat. She'd have to drive to her place and then leave her car there. It still wasn't worthy of Sleigh Bell Country's winter driving conditions. Caleb leaned over the top of her. I love you, Faith. She buried her fingers in his beard and pulled him closer. I love you, Caleb. She kissed him, and her soul filled with music. The kind of music that made her feel things through every fiber of her being. 
The melody wrapped her up and testified that this was the man she was meant to find. That dad's heart attack had happened for a reason, to bring her to Slaybell country to meet Caleb and to heal their relationship. He pulled back, his breath fogging up the windows even with the door hanging open. Let's go celebrate Christmas. She smiled and bit her lip. Never had she felt the holiday so deep inside of her. She'd never be alone again. From this moment on, she would hold this feeling close to her heart, and each December she'd reach in there and clasp it tight because Christmas had brought her true love. Chapter 36 Christmas Day Caleb reached for a pumpkin cinnamon roll, his parents go to Christmas morning breakfast. Dad made them the day before and let the dough proof in the fridge. Mom would get up and pop them in the oven and make cream cheese icing. They were just one more example of how his parents were a team, and for that reason, they tasted all that much sweater. Because he hasn't slept much last night, his eyes scratched when he blinked, but he could see that Santa had come during the few hours between dropping Faith off at her dad's and sunrise. The stockings were stuffed to the brim with goodies and trinkets, while the tree overflowed with gifts. Santa always stopped at Reindeer Wrangler Ranch, no matter how busy her night. It looked like the elves had outdone themselves rapping despite Stella missing for part of December. Actually, now that he looked at it, the whole wrapping job looked more like something Robin would do than what Stella usually ordered. What in the world was going on up there? Whatever it was, it all seemed to work out just fine, as Christmas Eve had gone off without a hitch. Forrest landed in the chair next to him and swiped a roll for himself. Morning, Dot. Good morning to you. Caleb laughed at how happy he sounded. Now that everything between him and Faith was fixed and they were talking about a future together, the whole world looked brighter. How was the parade? Best one yet. Forrest popped a piece of bread into his mouth and chewed. I wouldn't be surprised if they asked me to be Santa every year. I had children eating out of my mittened hands. Drake sat down across from them. Caleb rolled his eyes. You go ahead and enjoy that while I snuggle up to a warm body next Christmas Eve. Drake picked up his plate and went to eat in front of the fire, his ears bright red. Caleb and Jack exchanged looks and then burst out laughing at their little brother's embarrassment. Mom and Dad came in next, wearing matching sweaters Mom had bought online. Dad's was a little tight around the middle, but he wore the blinking Christmas tree like a badge of honor. Caleb smiled behind his mug of cocoa, already planning sweaters for himself and Faith to wear next Christmas. Life was so good right now. His cell phone lit up. Who would call this early on Christmas, asked Mom as she made her way to the fridge. She put the eggnog in front of Dad's plate before taking a seat. Dad smiled at her in thanks. Oh. The caller ID read Robin Kringle. He flashed the screen at his parents. It's the North Pole. Don't just sit there, answer it. Mom waved her fork at him. He hurried to push the answer button before the call went to voicemail. Robin wouldn't take too kindly to being ghosted. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you and yours Caleb. Are you with your family? Jack wandered in from doing chores. He'd drawn the short straw that year and had to get up to feed before breakfast. When they were younger, it had been torture waiting to open gifts. Now that they were all grown up, the process was more organized and a lot less messy. We're all assembled. Can you put me on speakerphone? I need to talk to the troops. That didn't sound good. He pressed the button. Okay, we're all listening. If she said they needed a reindeer, he was sure he could have Rudy ready by next Christmas Eve. 
even sooner if Rudy kept up his training schedule. The reindeer was determined to make it to the North Pole, and it seemed everyone was rooting for him, even the old-timer, Dunder. Last night was pretty eventful, she started. Pax got up from the fire and came closer to listen in. Stella and Chris got married in Vegas. Vegas. Ha. Dad slapped the table. That sounds about right. Jack leaned over Caleb's shoulder. Please tell me there was an Elvis impersonator involved. Robin laughed. Sorry to disappoint you. It was an old man with a comb over. Forrest snapped his fingers and made a face that said Stella had just missed the mark. Anyway, Robin continued, somehow Chris picked up Snowflake in Yellowstone and flew her to Vegas for the wedding. The whole family breathed a sigh of relief at once. So you have her, then? Caleb clarified. Wheel, Robin hedged. We had her. But when we popped up the chimney after the wedding, she'd taken off, with the sleigh. Jack leaned over Caleb so hard he shoved Caleb's chest into his plate. Hey! He shoved back, but Jack scrambled for the phone. You're telling me we have a reindeer loose in Las Vegas? Forrest shot a look at Dad. Dad's jaw hardened. That's the thing. I don't think she hung around long. When Ginger and Joseph were delivering gifts last night, they swore they saw another sleigh over Idaho. Dad started clearing breakfast off the table, and Mom appeared with a huge map of the United States, which she spread out before them. She wouldn't like the warm weather, she'd head for something colder, and that means going north. Mom traced her finger from Vegas due north. She could be in any of these unpopulated areas. Jack shook his head. She's too much of a drama queen. She'd want an audience. True. Pax nodded. Maybe in this area. Mom circled her finger around a town named Sandpoint. You think? It's as good a place as any to start looking, agreed Jack. Now that the holiday is over, we can help, offered Robin. We'll bring a couple of sleighs down and meet you there. That would be great, Forrest answered. Bring your brother-in-law. It would be a good opportunity for him to work with the reindeer. He'd love it. Caleb checked the time on his phone. He left it on the table so the planning could continue but pushed out his chair and stepped away. Jack took his place, making notes in his own phone. Dad saw Caleb get up and followed him to the coat room off the kitchen. Where you headed? Caleb grinned. I have a date. You're not going to stay and help us figure this out. Caleb shook his head as he sat on the bench to put on his warm winter boots. I'll be happy to help, but I'm not going to change my plans with Faith. Let me know what you need me to do when I get back. Dad looked him over. One for the family, huh? Is that where this is headed? Caleb stood up and slipped his arms into his coat. Yep. He'd meant what he'd said to Faith, he was in this for the long sleigh ride. Hang on a second. Dad hurried past the planning crew at the table and back to his bedroom. Caleb continued to layer up. He had a couple bricks out by the fireplace in the barn and a big blanket waiting in the bottom of the sleigh. Dad returned and held out a small black box. If you want to make her yours, then I'd better give you this. Caleb took the box and cracked the aged hinges open. Inside was an engagement ring. The design was beautiful with a medium-sized diamond surrounded by holly made from precious stones. Dad put his hand on Caleb's shoulder, and they looked at the ring together. It was my grandma's. She gave it to me the day you were born and asked me to hold on to it until you were ready to get married. Caleb stared in awe. 
she did. He had one memory of his great-grandma. She'd been smiling at him and handing him a cookie. That was it, but he remembered how it felt to be loved by her, that was how strong she'd loved. Yes sir. There's another one for Jack when he finally figures out that he's not the center of the universe. Caleb chuckled before sobering. You're okay with all this? It's not freaking you out that I want to get married and start a family or anything, is it? Dad pounded him on the back. It's about darn time is what I say. And your mom is way overdue for some grandchildren. Caleb warmed at the thought of holding his baby in his arms. It might not be a manly thing to talk about, but he looked forward to the day when he would be a dad. He snapped the box shut. Thanks, Dad. I was going to go shopping tomorrow, but now I don't have to. Dad chuckled. Just get that ring on her finger, don't mess this up. If I had a nickel for every time you told me that, Caleb teased as he shoved his felt hat down on his head. Dad smiled in a sad but pleased way. Bringing in a new daughter, sister, and wife was going to change life on the ranch, for all of them. He had no doubt they'd make it work. He snuck out the door while Dad went back to strategizing over how to find Snowflake. At least she was out of Yellowstone now, hopefully, the news coverage would die down without any more sightings. He wandered into Dunder's stall. How do you feel about a real sleigh ride today, old man? Dunder perked up, his mouth full of oats that dribbled to the floor in surprise. Caleb pulled out the ring and showed the reindeer. I have an important question to ask Faith, and I'd like a smooth ride. The reindeer huffed as if all this romance was beneath him. But he sauntered past Caleb, clearly pleased to be chosen to be part of this momentous occasion. Rudy bellowed from his stall, clearly upset that he wasn't asked along. Caleb went over and rubbed his nose. I'm sorry. But you're not trained on the sled yet. I promise we'll start working with it right after New Year. Rudy frowned but conceded to Dunder's abilities. We'll get you to the North Pole yet, Caleb promised. He had no trouble making the offer, considering Rudy's progress. Once he'd pacified Rudy's ego Caleb made short work of harnessing Dunder to the flying sleigh, gathering the bricks and blanket, and checking his pocket at least twenty times to make sure he hadn't dropped the ring. They pulled out of the barn, the sunlight gleaming off the runners. This sleigh was built lighter than the others, made of pine instead of maple or cedar. It was painted light blue to blend in with the sky but had the family crest across the back. He picked up the reins, threading them through his gloves. Let's keep it on the ground so we can cut through town, okay? Dunder nodded, and Caleb flicked the reins. His heart surged forward as the reindeer leaned into the harness and they sped across the snow, it called for faith as if she were its missing half. In a way, she was, because he didn't think his heart truly beat unless she was in his arms. The urge to fly over town was almost too much to fight. Thankfully, Dunder had a fast clip going and they were able to make good time. Caleb couldn't wait one more minute to hold faith. Chapter 37 Faith stared at the overstuffed stockings hung by the chimney with care. There was no way Dad had time or the ability to get to the store and purchase all these goodies. Santa had stopped here. She giggled. The real and true Santa. Reaching out, she brushed her fingers over the fur. How crazy was it that she knew Santa was real now, and when she was twelve she'd stopped believing. What a fool she'd been. Besides the stuffed stockings, there were gifts under the tree and a special note to Dad from Santa. The envelope was sealed, and though she was itching with curiosity, she didn't dare open it. She and Caleb had pulled in late last night. 
Then they'd had a long kiss. Goodbye. Before he'd driven back to the ranch and she'd come inside. By then, Dad had been asleep, probably helped by a painkiller, because he'd slept through her banging her suitcase through the door and rolling it down the hallway. Tiptoeing, she put a box of cereal, a quart of milk, and two bowls and spoons on a cookie tray and headed for his room. It wasn't a big Christmas breakfast, but the cereal had oats, which were supposed to be heart healthy. Besides, they were going to the Nicolases for an early dinner that night, so she didn't want to load up on breakfast. Walking into Dad's room was like walking through a shroud of sadness. He must have been really upset when he'd gone to sleep last night for the feeling to linger this long. She set the tray on his dresser. Wanting to banish the darkness, she threw the curtains open and let the blinding sun bounce off the fresh snow and into the room. Dad grumbled, throwing his arm over his face. Gah! Merry Christmas! Faith bounced on the end of his bed, careful not to jostle him. Faith? His arm fell away, and his eyes filled with tears. My sweet girl! He reached for her, and she moved quickly into his welcoming hug. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for everything. I do believe in you. You're a better veterinarian than I am, Anne. Dad. Faith stopped his apologizing. It's okay. I'm here. It's okay. Dad cried harder. I thought I'd lost you. He wiped his plaid pajama sleeve over his face, sopping up the moisture. Faith retrieved a tissue from the nightstand and handed it to him. Then, she grabbed three more and handed those over too. It's the surgery. He tried to explain away his tears. It made me all emotional. He blew his nose, sounding like a foghorn. Leaning back against his pillows, he let out a sigh. I am sorry. Faith patted his leg under the blankets. I know. Me too. I let the past color my future with you, just like I said I wouldn't. Dad shook his head. I should have talked to you about moving, respected the fact that you're a grown woman with a life outside of Sleigh Bell country. A good life that you've worked hard to build. I didn't have a right to assume you'd give all that up for me. She smiled fondly. That's what family does. They sacrifice for one another. Are we a family? he asked, his eyes full of hope. Faith took his hand. I'd like to be. Tell me why. Well. She adjusted her position so she wasn't falling off the side of the bed. I like who I am here. I like that you don't play games, you're just you, and that frees me up to be just me. I enjoy our time comparing notes as colloques, and I appreciate that you see me as an equal in that area. But really, I love you, Dad, and I want us to be a part of each other's lives. If that means I move out here, then I'm okay with that. I'll move to Grafton with you. I thought about it last night. I could work in your clinic and come out here for long weekends to help with the reindeer. She was shaking her head before he finished talking. That won't work for me. Why not? She took a deep breath. Because I'm selling my half of the clinic to my partner and because I'm in love with Caleb. A smile as bright as the Christmas star lit up Dad's face. My little girl's in love. She laughed. He's coming out this morning to take me on a sleigh ride, so we'd better get some breakfast. They ate cereal and decided to wait until later to open presents. Dad said he didn't need anything under the tree because he'd gotten the best gift of all. 
she had to agree. Knock, knock. Caleb stepped into the room. Faith yelped, glancing down at her pajamas. What are you doing in here? Her hair was pulled back in a messy bun, and she didn't have a swipe of makeup on her face. Dunder was a little excited to be out of the barn and got me here in record time. Faith stood and set her half-empty bowl on the cookie sheet on the dresser. I'm not ready. Caleb laughed and kissed her temple. You look good enough to nibble, he said just for her as he nipped at her ear. She shivered with delight. How about you get ready and I help your dad get settled in the front room? Faith gave him a grateful look. She wasn't sure how much help dad needed getting ready, and she definitely wasn't sure how ready she was to help him put on pants. Thank you. She pecked a kiss to his cheek and hurried out. It didn't take her long to put on sleigh-riding clothes. Basically, she layered on as much as she could and still bend her joints. Her hair was buried under a stocking cap, so she made sure to take extra time with her makeup. When she was done, she went out to find Dad looking dapper in a pair of khaki pants and a plain navy blue button-up shirt. His hair was combed, and his face shone as if freshly scrubbed. He and Caleb were talking low. Discussing Christmas secrets? She put her hands on her hips. Caleb got to his feet and grinned. Not secrets, surprises. Her back softened. I like surprises. You're in for a doozy, then, Dad laughed from his chair. You two get going. I want to watch a movie. He picked up the remote, and the opening credits for It's a Wonderful Life filled the screen. Faith went over and kissed his head. I'll see you in a bit, and we'll open those presents. I can't wait to see what Santa brought this year. Dad smiled up at her in response. She and Caleb stepped outside. Dunder, she cried, and she ran across the snow to rub his neck. Merry Christmas, you handsome beast. He wiggled his eyebrows back at her. She laughed and hugged him. I'm so glad you're better. We all are. Caleb rubbed between Dunder's antlers. A thought hit Faith like a freight train. Will he go back to the North Pole now? That's where he came from, isn't it? Caleb took her hand and led her back to the sleigh. It's up to the Kringles. If you give him a clean bill of health, he could very well head back up north. Her lip pouted out. I don't want him to go. Dunder turned and glared at her. Stomping his back foot, he made the ground shake beneath them. Whoa, that sounded like... Thunder, Caleb finished. She ginned. So that's where he got his name. Yep, and I think Dunder wants to go back. Caleb helped her arrange the blanket over their laps. Being one of Santa's reindeer is a big deal to reindeer. They're kind of prideful about it. He whispered the last part. You'd damage his ego if you tried to keep him here. She rolled her eyes. In that case, fine. I'll consider signing off on him. Caleb flicked the reins and pulled hard to the right to get Dunder to line up so he faced the open fields and the woods beyond. They moved at a steady, slow pace. Faith wrapped her arm through his and snuggled into his side. You know, someone told me that a sleigh ride means something to your family. Is that true? Caleb's grin was full of sexy mischief. She gasped at the sight of it, her blood heating. It does. And I want to show you why. Okay. She waited for him to explain. 
You ready, Dunder, he called. Dunder gave another stomp. All righty, then. On, Dunder, he called. Faith's stomach dropped out as the sleigh lifted off the ground and they cleared the treetops. Caleb, she squealed. Caleb's laughter echoed into the sky. Dunder joined him, and then Faith couldn't help herself and laughed too. This is crazy, she said into the wind. Surprisingly, the air felt more like a light breeze than the pelting feeling of sticking her head out the window on the freeway. The sleigh was steady, not rocking back and forth or wobbling one bit. Dunder's gait was smooth, and she relaxed into the velvet-covered seat and enjoyed the view. They flew over the open range, where there wasn't another soul in sight. It's wonderful. Her heart surged with love, and she pressed a kiss to Caleb's cheek. Thank you for sharing this with me. The sleigh ride was more than a chance to show off Dunder's abilities. It was Caleb bringing her 100% into his magical world of flying reindeer. No more secrets. I love you, she blurted. Caleb turned slightly so he could see her face. Faith Saintsbury. He sounded so serious. Faith swallowed, not sure what he was going to say but feeling like it would be big and life-changing. Will you marry me? He pulled a small black box out of his coat pocket and opened it to reveal a beautiful Christmas ring. The image blurred as her eyes filled with happy tears. I'd love to. She threw her arms around him and kissed him with all the love flowing through her. Caleb moaned and took control of the kiss, stealing her breath and her heart in one swift move. Dunder jerked to the left, pulling them apart. Caleb moaned. I forgot what an old-fashioned guy he is. He chuckled as he put his arm around her and pulled her close to his side. Old-fashioned? Faith asked. Yeah, he doesn't like couples getting too cozy before the wedding. Her cheeks burned and she turned to glare at the reindeer. I can guard my own virtue, thank you very much. She then took Caleb's face in her hands and proceeded to kiss him until they were quite unable to catch their breath. When they broke apart, Dunder snorted and lifted his nose in the air. Caleb laughed. I don't think anyone has told him to mind his own business before. Faith grinned. It was totally worth it. Yes, it was, Caleb said low. Faith leaned back. I could get used to a Christmas sleigh ride, Wrangler. There's lots more where this came from. Caleb winked. Faith laughed. Merry Christmas, my future wife. Faith was shocked at how much had changed inside of her since meeting Caleb and his magical herd of reindeer. She'd come to Sleigh Bell Country scared and angry, without a drop of Christmas cheer, and now she was full of hope and love and believed in Santa Claus. For her, it was a miracle. She'd once heard a pastor say that God did big things that looked small to men. If anyone saw the smile on her face and the peace in her eyes, they'd think it was a small thing. But she knew it was a big thing to change her heart. Merry Christmas, my future husband. Merry Christmas. Epilogue The Day After Christmas in Northern Idaho Billy Edge Billy trudged home from the sledding hill, his head low and his spirits even lower. He'd hoped the new sleigh would help the other kids see that he was just like them, but they'd laughed and called to one another and ignored him like always. He hated it here. In his old school, he had lots of friends. He wouldn't be alone the day after Christmas, he'd be at Jeff's house, building whatever giant Lego set Santa brought him that year. Or he'd be in Cade's garage, 
fiddling with the scooter they almost got going. According to the YouTube videos, they only needed one more part. He hated his dad. If he had just stuck around a little longer, then Billy and Mom wouldn't have had to move to this tiny town. Sniffing loudly, he swiped at his face. He hated crying. He hated feeling like he was out of control and that no one cared. Mom did, but she was stressed all the time and not the same as she'd been before Dad had left. Neither of them were. A whimper reached his ears, pulling Billy up short. He glanced behind him, expecting to see Jordan, the biggest bully in class, mocking him for crying. But Jordan wasn't there, and his were the only footprints in the snow. He stepped, and the sound came again. This time he thought it came from the right. Leaving his sled, he stepped off the path and into the brush. There might be a rabbit caught in a trap, or a wolf. He stopped and pulled his arms up to his chest. Wolves were dangerous enough when they were healthy, but a wounded one would bite him just to protect itself. The sound came again, desperate and afraid. His little boy heart couldn't take it anymore, and he moved faster, pushing branches aside. He stumbled into a clearing and froze at the sight of a reindeer tangled up in a harness attached to a sleigh. A real, honest-to-goodness Santa sleigh. The reindeer met his eyes and pleaded for help. He held up his hands. It's okay. He didn't know why he wanted to speak to her, but he'd felt her tell him she needed help. I can get you out. She held still as he approached, tracking his movements. As he got closer, he noticed her leg was wrapped up in the leather. It was swollen and raw. Oh man! He fell to his knees and started pulling on the strap, looking for a way to loosen it. His eyes landed on a buckle, and he undid it. The reindeer cried out when freed, and she sagged, breathing heavily against the snow. Sorry, he apologized, and he worked with more thoughtfulness, making sure the rest of the harness unwound without jerking her. When he'd taken off everything but the harness around her face, he stepped back. Okay, can you get up? She drew in a breath and struggled to stand. After a painful attempt to put weight on her back foot, she fell over again. Billy went to her head and knelt down. He ached for her, hating the idea that she was going to die. Please don't leave me. His tears fell on her cheek, and she turned to watch him. I don't want you to die. Please get better. She nuzzled his knee, and he rubbed her neck. We have a barn. No one uses it but me. He wiped his cheeks. If we can get you there, I know you'll be safe. As if accenting his words, a wolf howled in the distance. I can't leave you here. Please, you have to walk. With a worried glance over the ridge where the wolf howled, the reindeer lifted off the ground. Billy got to his feet and rubbed his eyes. You're, you're floating. She lifted an eyebrow at him, asking him to rephrase that. He looked at the sleigh. Santa's sleigh. You're flying. She bobbed her head. Billy grinned. For the first time since he'd learned the meaning of the word divorce and they'd come to this podunk town, he felt happy. Come on. Let's get you home, and I'll find something for you to eat. Do you like carrots? Her eyes brightened. We have a bag in the fridge. He started off, thought better of just leaving her to fly behind him, and found a long strip of leather, which he tied under her chin. Don't want you floating away. He wasn't sure how this flying reindeer thing worked, but he'd figure it out. She came with him, her head moving slowly up and down as she limped through the air. He retrieved his sled, dragging it behind him. Do you have a name? 
he checked to see if she responded. She nodded. Hmm. I'm not sure how you're going to tell me. Can I call you Candy? She blew out her lips, making the raspberry sound. He laughed, the sound foreign after so many months of not hearing it. Dasher? Dancer? He went through all the reindeer names he knew before making it to the barn. But once they got there, it became more important to make a bed for the reindeer and get her settled than figuring out her name. He pulled open one of the stalls in the back. Will this work? She limped inside and inspected every corner before settling against the far wall. That doesn't look very comfortable. I'll be right back. He took off for the house, making sure to shut the barn door so she didn't wander out. He pulled the blanket off the back of the couch and gathered it against his chest. He was almost out the back door when his mom called, Whoa there, Speedy. Whatcha doing? Billy turned around and stared at his mom, a big debate happening inside of him. He could tell her a quick fib and be on his way. But when he really looked at her, he saw the worn-down slope of her shoulders and the circles under her eyes. He thought of how he'd laughed and felt happy around Santa's reindeer, and he wanted to see the light in his mother's eyes again. Can you keep a secret? he asked her. She cocked her head. I'm actually a pretty great secret keeper. Follow me. He motioned for her to follow. She took forever getting her snow boots on, but they finally made their way out to the barn. At the door, Billy put his finger over his lips. You have to be quiet, don't scream. Mom grabbed his shoulders. Billy Edge, please tell me you didn't trap a coyote in the barn. He shrugged off her hold. No, Mom. She's not dangerous, but she's hurt. Mom's forehead wrinkled. Before she could tell him he couldn't go inside, he pushed the door open wide enough for him and the blanket to fit and then squeezed through. Mom was right behind him, a hand on his shoulder, probably so she could yank him away from whatever was in there. Billy tried not to shrug her off, because he wanted her to say he could keep the reindeer. He made his way to the last stall, Mom creeping behind him like she was in a Scooby-Doo movie. Moms. He opened the door, half expecting the reindeer to have disappeared and left behind a pile of glitter. But she was there, looking at him with a lot of curiosity. I brought you a blanket. He walked in holding it out so she could sniff it. The reindeer turned and looked at mom, asking him, who is she? That's my mom, Mitzi. She's kind of nervous. I told her you wouldn't hurt us, though. He turned to face mom. It's one of Santa's reindeer. I found her in the woods with a sleigh. She's hurt. He pointed to her leg. Mom approached slowly. Can I look at it? She asked the reindeer. She blinked a yes. Billy hugged the blanket tight as Mom's hands moved over the leg. When it got to the spot where the leather had wrapped tight, the reindeer sucked in quickly. Mom yanked her hands back. Sorry. I know it's tender, but I need to check for a break. Billy watched in awe. How do you know what to do? Mom smiled, a real one with teeth and everything. I grew up on a farm, silly. We had to know all sorts of things about animals. Somehow, she looked younger when she talked about growing up in North Dakota. She used to tell him stories all the time about her horse Buttercup, but she hadn't in a long time. He missed those stories. Hold her harness for me, would you? I don't want her thrashing while I probe the bone. Billy did as he was told. Hold still now. Mom's good at fixing things. I had a cut once, right here. 
He pointed to his head. She used glue to put it back together, and you can't even see a scar because my hair covers it. Takin kept the reindeer's gaze on him and not on what mom was doing. Mom finished her exam and rocked back on her heels before sitting crisscross on the dirty floor. Billy bit his cheek to keep from saying something about getting dirty. If she wasn't worried, then he wasn't going to bring it up. I'm afraid you fractured your leg. The reindeer laid her head down as if the news was devastating. He patted her neck. We'll help you get better. Mom considered the two of them, like she was looking to see how a puzzle piece fit in a certain spot. We'll have to brace it, and she won't be able to walk for at least three weeks. Maybe it would be better if we called animal control and let them take care of her. Billy wrapped his arms around the animal's neck. No. I found her. I promised I'd help. Besides, she can fly. We can't let someone else take her. They'll sell her to the circus or something. She has to get back to Santa. Mom reached over his back and took his shoulders, pulling him into her for a hug and rocking like she had when he was little. Okay. Okay. She stoked his hair, and his frantic feelings of loss abetted. I'll make you a deal. We'll do what we can. If she doesn't show improvement in a week, we'll find someone who can do more than we can, okay? Sure. A week was forever. What are you going to call her? Mom asked. He shrugged. She has a name, but she won't tell me. Mom moved so she could see the reindeer's face. She reached out and traced the star on her forehead. Star? she asked. Wait. She moved her fingers over two smaller lines. It almost looks like a snowflake. The reindeer's eyes widened, and she nodded her head quickly. Mom laughed at her antics, the sound better than bells on Christmas. Billy's heart swelled. It worked. The magical reindeer could fix them, he just knew it. I think we'll call her Snowflake. Mom ran her hand down Snowflake's neck. I'll be back in a minute with some first aid supplies. She stood up. Snowflake nudged his leg. And carrots, he called after Mom. She likes carrots. Mom smiled, lifting both her hands as if she didn't know what to make of all this. Carrots it is. Billy listened as Mom left, and then he rubbed Snowflake's snowflake. Promise me you'll never go away, he begged. Even if Santa comes back for you. Snowflake touched her nose to his, and he felt the promise all the way to his snow boots. You're my best friend, Snowflake. He hugged her as tight as he dared. You'll always be my best friend. He kissed her cheek and took in the earthy smell of her fur. Nothing's going to tear us apart. We're going to have a lot of fun together. And I'll read you all my favorite books while you're getting better. Mom reappeared, and he clammed up, embarrassed that she might have heard him. You know, I used to talk to Buttercup all the time. Mom worked without looking at him. The embarrassment whisked away like smoke. What would you talk about? Everything. She laid a wooden ruler over Snowflake's leg and eyed it for size. I'd tell her about my day at school, my fight with your Aunt Barbara. Just about anything. She was a great listener. She set the ruler in place and began wrapping a bandage around the ruler and the leg. I'll bet Snowflake is a good listener too. Her ears are the perfect size for it. Snowflake flicked one ear in response. Billy met his mom's astonished gaze, and they laughed together. Once the wrapping was done, she pulled a long carrot out of her inside coat pocket. 
Go ahead, give this to her for being such a good patient. Billy held out the carrot. Snowflake sniffed the air around it before using her lips to draw it into her mouth and crunching loudly. Can we keep her, Mom? As much as Snowflake's promise to stay filled him up, Billy understood that there is a more powerful force in the universe, a mother's decree. Let's take it week by week, okay? Okay. He hugged her. Thanks, Mom. She ruffled his hair. Thanks for trusting me with your secret. Mitzi helped Billy get settled in the barn with the reindeer for an afternoon of storytelling and healing. She found herself chuckling as she stood at the kitchen sink to wash dishes and keep an eye on the barn. The reindeer was something special. She reminded her of the reindeer from Sleigh Bell Country, where she'd grown up. Man, it had been years since she'd thought of the reindeer and the wranglers. Forrest Nicholas. The name sent a shot of heat through her belly. She'd spent many hours telling Buttercup about the stupid things Forrest did in class. Looking back, she probably had a crush on the boy. He'd be a man now. Turning her thoughts back to her own barn, she contemplated where the reindeer had come from. They were too far from Reindeer Wrangler Ranch for it to be theirs. The harness indicated that she was domesticated, and her way of communicating showed she'd spent a lot of time with people. People who were looking for her, no doubt. Billy thought she was one of Santa's reindeer. Her heart ached for all that her son had lost over the last year. Saying no to helping the wounded animal wasn't even an option. If Mitzi could, she would have given him everything on his Christmas list and more. Between the sporadic child support checks and her minimum wage job, she was lucky to make ends meet, let alone spoil her son. She reflected on their time in the barn and the sound of laughter that filled the air. Maybe this was a good thing. Dad always said animals had a way of healing the soul. Billy seemed like his old self this afternoon. And she'd remembered what it felt like to let go of the clouds and let the sunshine through. Her sunshine. That was it. She'd allowed her ex's choices to overshadow her light. She threw the wet rag into the suds. No more. From now on, she was going to let her light out. And she'd start by dancing in the kitchen, like she used to do when all was right with her world. She turned on an Elvis Presley Christmas playlist and swung her hips to the uptempo beat. Her morning period was over. Today, December 26th, she was a new woman. Wiser. Stronger. And happier. When the song ended, she blew a kiss towards the barn. Thanks, Snowflake. You reminded me of the child I was. Which made all the difference in deciding what kind of woman she wanted to be. Heaven helped the man who tried to come between her and her reindeer. They were keeping Snowflake, and that was that. Find out what happens when Forrest Nicholas comes to town in a nutty Christmas reunion. You've been listening to One Tough Christmas Cookie A Reindeer Wrangler Ranch Christmas Romance Book Written by Lucy McConnell Welcome back from Reindeer Wrangler Ranch. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas excursion with the flying reindeer and all of the wonderful things that happen on the Reindeer Ranch. If you enjoyed the book, hit the like button. If you'd like to pick up a copy, head on over to Amazon and you can read it for free in Kindle Unlimited or I think it's $4.99 priced right now. So grab a copy of that one. You can also read the rest of the books in the series if you don't want to wait for me to upload them. But next week I will have the next book in the series up 
if you would like to get one of those adult coloring books for the holidays, either to use as a gift or whatever else, insert shameless promotion, um, they will be available on Amazon November 1st. So you can grab one of those there. Thank you. I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas now that we are starting into this holiday season. I'm so excited. And I will see you next time. Hit the like, the subscribe, all those wonderful buttons. And remember that you are very loved. See ya.